Ladies and gentlemen, the time now is 9 o'clock and we are ready to commence with our Civil Aviation National Aviation Conference 2021, which is themed Reigniting the Aviation Sector Beyond COVID-19. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the presence of the Minister of Transport, the Honorable Fikile Mbalula, uh, acknowledge the presence of the Chairman of the SACA Board and other board members, the Director of the ICAO, the ATB section of ICAO, and the Head of Account Management at IATA, responsible for South and East Africa, the DCA, Chief Executives and other Executives presence, present, Head of Departments, Deputy Director of Aviation Security and Facilitation at ICAO, brothers and sisters from other parts of our continent, and all of you. I know a number of people have already greeted me in the conference section. Good morning to you. And those that haven't, I greet you as well. My name is Luvuyo Kaike. I will be the Program Director today. So feel free to call me Program Director. Mr. Chairman, Monsieur le Président, you can even call me Luvuyo if that's too long for you. A number of people have also expressed excitement and looking forward to the conference today. So am I. I'm looking forward to an exciting program that we're going to have, as well as the excellent speakers that have been lined up for today. However, my excitement is mixed with other emotions such as happiness as well as nervousness. So if my data, my English runs out of data, please do understand and I will switch back to closer and you can ask someone else to interpret for you. On a serious note, ladies and gentlemen, this is the National Aviation Conference 2021. Our last one was in 2019. We had plans for one in 2020. However, it was not to be. COVID had other ideas. But there's no use uh, crying over spilt milk. Now we go on with the conference. The first thing we're going to do is to welcome you. And that responsibility does not fall on me. It falls on the Director of Civil Aviation, a lady that needs no introduction. Her name is Miss Poppy Koza. And now I will hand over to you, DCA, to welcome your guests. Recognizing Can I breathe? the presence of our Minister of Transport, uh, Minister Figile Mbalula. We thank you, Minister, for being present at this important event of the civil aviation. Um, as always, we are quite delighted uh, to hear from the Honorable Minister, and we certainly do look forward to the Minister's address uh, this morning. I also wish to welcome the Board of Directors from the South African Civil Aviation Authority, led by the chairman, Mr. Ernest Ekosa. I recognize the presence of the boards uh, and CEOs from state-owned uh, enterprises, notably Airports Company South Africa, uh, Air Traffic and Navigation Services, uh, and many other um, uh, uh, CEOs uh, here and present. The senior officials from the Department of Transport and government departments and state-owned entities uh, who are also in our midst. I also welcome the captains of the industry representing various aviation organizations. Allow me also to thank the various panel members uh, and presenters who have agreed to share their knowledge and insights on a variety of topics as lined up uh, today. Last and certainly not least, I wish to recognize the, the virtual participation of distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen. We most certainly look forward to your contribution and comments uh, today. In aviation terms, uh, the 2020-2021 financial year, which for our entity ended a week ago, will go into the history books as something that resembles a true turbulent flight. As the industry and the regulator, the outbreak of COVID-19 tested us uh, to the limit in many ways. Each one of us have a story to tell about this unusual era we find ourselves in. The sad news is that not all of us made it alive, 
both in terms of human lives as well as businesses. As at yesterday, we've seen the numbers uh, recorded in terms of the COVID-19 infections uh, to oh, just over 1.5 million confirmed cases since the 5th March 2020. And sadly, about 53,000 people lost their lives. It is in honor of those who wished to but did not make it that we are duty bound to make the best of this situation and the opportunity we have been given to still be here. The sheer number of attendees <coughs> in this conference, <coughs> I beg your pardon, attest to the fact that all of us in the South African aviation industry are determined to find solutions that will reignite this industry we all love. An industry that is a bedrock of socio-economic activities across the world. For me, this gathering signifies the mandatory pre-check before we take to the skies again for the next 12 months. Global trends are telling us that we must embrace ourselves for yet another bumpy ride as the third wave has started hitting many countries across the globe. Honorable Minister, as you can see from the program, as well as the caliber of those following this discussion virtually, this is a case of all hands on deck. We are ready to help steer this flight back to its rightful path and, and altitude. Your message this morning, Minister, is timely as many of us begin the new financial year with so much optimism and courage to make this industry work to its former glory. With that said, the industry confirms that this has been a horrid journey, but equally, if not more, we are signaling that we are ready to reignite the aviation industry. The structure and the caliber of the presenters and participants illustrate the determination required for the much needed takeoff. Program Director, please allow me to briefly paint a picture of the journey we traveled in the past 377 days since the first national lockdown. There are many challenges to narrate, but I will stick to just a few. As we all know, many governments across the globe announced the closure of their borders, including our own. The first casualties in that reality undoubtedly were aviation and other transport industries. Within a, a matter of days, many in this virtual room had to think on their feet and prepare for alternative ways of conducting our business. Needless to say, many businesses' wings were clipped, uh, or rather were clipped off for a considerable amount of time whilst the world grappled with the effective ways of managing the COVID-19 pandemic. As a regulatory authority, we rely heavily on physical inspections and surveillance audits to ensure compliance. Imagine waking up to the reality that you can no longer travel to different operators to ensure that there is absolute compliance. The big question becomes, how do you effectively ensure compliance? The phrase that says, fortune favors the bold comes to mind. However, in my view, it relates more to individuals than entities. In the past year, we also learned that the fortune favors those with foresight and indeed those that embrace change and are drawn to continuous innovation. Program director, one may call it luck. However, with regard as it, uh, uh, with regard uh, as, uh, as continuous improvement uh, um, in innovation, when the coronavirus struck, the Civil Aviation Authority had adopted a few years before a new way of auditing called performance-based uh, oversight that was delivered through the master oversight and surveillance plan. We are currently migrating to a risk-based oversight approach, which would be supported heavily by the state safety program developed only a few years ago. With a combination of these oversight methods at play, the regulator granted exemptions to aviation personnel and operators whilst closely monitoring and mitigating the risk to aviation safety and security. This process ensured that we were able to keep those businesses afloat who could still perform a limited number of their operations during the COVID-19 era, namely cargo operations, as well as repatriation and evacuation flights. Program Director, had the CAA not adopted this approach, by the time the government and our minister pronounced on transport directions to gradually reopen aviation activities, many personnel's licenses would have expired and to get them back on track would have indeed overwhelmed even the training and examination systems in the country. 
Very soon after this, the regulator had relied on desktop auditing for those operations where this was still feasible and had also encouraged training organizations for instances to, for instance, to undertake virtual learning in those fields where this may have been possible. It certainly did assist that South Africa, through the Civil Aviation Authority, chairs the regional collaborative uh, arrangement for the prevention and management of public health events in civil aviation, co commonly known as CAPSCAP program, which somehow made our state of readiness more proactive, swift, swift and responsive. Thanks to the state's foresight, we were able to revive systems which were already in place. We also extend our appreciation to the Minister of Transport for his forthrightness, who influenced the restoration of air travel, working together with the Department of Transport, the regulator, Airports Company South Africa, ATNS, and the entire industry to return air travel to business whilst maintaining the balance of saving lives and livelihoods. The swiftness in which we worked in collaboration with the industry saw our industry returning to operations in full capacity, both domestically and internationally. This is what happens when there is political will to see the industry growing and developing. Ladies and gentlemen, imagine going to sleep after a good day of trade with the cash register looking good from the day's sale and then waking up the next morning and the one after and the week after and so on with the next to zero income. The sad part about the whole thing is that having no clients does not mean you will receive or rather you will not receive the bill from the landlord. It also does not mean that your staff will willingly forgo their salaries. I am sure by now you get the picture as you most probably experienced the same. That is the kind of devastation COVID-19 caused to many of us. As the Civil Aviation Authority, we were not spared and we had to quickly adjust and adapt, but also look at sustainability models to ensure our survival for as long as we could with the reserves we had, we had built over years. This is a rare feat for agencies that operate with zero state funding and rely solely on revenue that is generated through the services offered to the users. The belt tightening attitude we had adopted had to become our lifeline. Again, program director, from a technology point of view, there was a lot of adjustment that we had to do. Our saving grace was that a few years back, the CAA had started the process of acquiring and implementing an electronic business system earmarked to move the organization from a paper-based company to an entity that uses technology to ensure efficiency and the adaptation of a client-centric culture. So when COVID-19 landed on our shores, as the authority, we were almost in the finishing line of a project intended to migrate the entire oversight function to a technologically uh, based uh, platform. So program director, since the lockdown was imposed on the country, the regulator has been accepting electronic license applications and we are improving these systems to ensure that our clients do not travel many kilometers to submit their applications uh, manually anymore. This flexibility, no doubt, was able to protect our clients and staff by encouraging and observing uh, health protocols as well as social distancing as far as possible. This investment, ladies and gentlemen, has enabled us to swiftly move to offering our services electronically. Without this investment, the regulator would be scrambling around the solutions at higher prices as a result of the demand. I am also pleased, Honourable Minister, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to indicate that in a few weeks from now, we will be launching another technology-driven initiative in the form of CAT licenses, replacing the old book type licenses. The team, of course, from the Civil Aviation Authority, is excited and cannot wait to launch this initiative, which is set to make South Africa one of the pioneers in this field. I have on a few occasions liked in our industry to a multi-crew environment. And in this industry, collaboration and collaboration and more collaboration is the nature of the game and the key to success. What could perhaps have gone unnoticed by the public and the passengers that are enjoying the opportunity to travel today, I do not know, is that under the guidance of the Minister of Transport, the regulator together with the industry and 
the uh, transport public entities worked almost around the clock to ensure that air travel does not come to a complete standstill. There were many deliberations, preparations and lobbying that was going on behind the scenes. Perhaps what they would remember, Honorable Minister, is that you were steadfast in building confidence in air travel and to, ex to the extent of explaining why 100% capacity was possible given the advanced technology in the aircraft systems. Through you, Minister, almost every second person knows exactly what the HEPA system is as you explained it in a colloquial uh, way, educating the public about the advances of technology in this space. Ask me today as uh, to who doesn't know what, a, what, what HEPA is. Chances as the, are that no one. So this era was a beautiful demonstration of what can be achieved if there is collaboration, a meeting of minds and a single purpose. So today's session is simply a continuation of that effort, working together to reignite the aviation industry to its former, former and better glory. Hence I said this, this industry is about collaboration, collaboration and more collaboration. While the minister and his team has ensured that the handbrake is released, we as the regulator and the aviation industry must make sure that the safety and security protocols are, are maintained to ensure that our sector successfully combats the spread of the virus throughout the air travel value chain. To this end, I must applaud the leadership of the various aviation organizations and operators for demonstrating commitment to upholding safety and security standards. Without this cooperation, the situation would have been much dire. The Civil Aviation Authority acknowledges the massive challenges brought about the pandemic, and similarly, the regulator is excited about the opportunities presented by the changing micro and macro environment. It is our belief that the, our resilience is built when we face challenges head on with much enthusiasm and optimism to overcome and achieve. First of all, the accident rate that we continue to witness in the recreational training and all sectors of general aviation is a cause of great concern. We must immediately ensure that the safety regime that has been applied successfully in the airline sector for over 30 years must be adopted in the general aviation sector. The Civil Aviation Authority's newly introduced general aviation safety strategy, if, if it is fully embraced by all concerned, it could in fact be the biggest contributor in reducing the carnage we have witnessed in the general aviation sector in the past few weeks. I therefore implore all of us to work towards achieving the much needed reduction in general aviation accidents. The minister and the department has issued the target by calling for the reduction of accident rate in this sector by 50% in the next five years. In terms of our sector's recovery, it is all in our hands. Ladies and gentlemen, the Civil Aviation Authority acknowledges the massive challenges brought about by this pandemic. This has, in fact, led to the regulator having a deeper reflective engagement, included uh, self-introspection as an organization on how the authority can deliver better on the regulator's mandate, taking into consideration all micro and macro factors affecting the businesses. It all starts with us as a regulator, and therefore it means we had to, among others, review all business processes and reduce inefficiencies, bureaucracy, and non-value adding processes. Focus on quicker turnaround times in terms of client services, put emphasis on improved safety management, the industry growth, greater voluntary compliance, regional cooperat cooperation participation, delivery on the interests and expectations of all st uh, stakeholders, just to name a few. The streamlining of all information and data in the organization in a manner centralized or in a centralized manner to support smarter business decisions and effective reporting mechanisms is another focus area. Trust is key to the entire industry's, industry's survival. Greater emphasis on conscious compliance instead of trying to conceal non-compliances is indeed crucial. This will ensure that no operator or license holder is left behind. Most importantly, all of us have a role to play in ensuring that we cap the spread of the virus. 
So as operators, we have to ensure a balance between commercial vi viability and the proper management of mitig mitigating factors against the spread of the pandemic. As I conclude, Program Director, allow me to conclude by reiterating that the role of air transportation is crucial in modern society, as air transport is interlinked, interdependent, and heavily reliant on the movement of people and goods from one corner of the world to another. If there was a doubt about the real impact of aviation on a country's economy, this is testimony that human survival does really depend on the transport industry. The sudden social and economic disruption brought about by COVID-19 pandemic serves as the most powerful and vivid reminder of the essential role of aviation to life as we know it on this planet. Granted, the path traveled over the past year has been beset with turbulences. A handful have had to shut down or are finding it difficult to return to service. Given the circumstances, we did well as the industry. And it is for this reason that we must, ev we must every now and then pause to acknowledge any successes, no matter how small, in the aviation environment. The Civil Aviation Authority as the regulator will continue to spearhead activities to ensure effective implementation of the Ministerial Air Transport Directions in order to ensure that the efficient and effective facilitation of passengers and cargo during the various levels of, of lockdown. The regulator will continue to play a significant role in ensuring that all operators continue to comply with the approved measures and standard operating procedures for the purpose of containing the spread of the, the COVID-19 virus. A successful aviation regulatory model is therefore a high priority towards securing the delivery of safety and security standards and recommended practices as defined by the International Civil Aviation Organization. We must also strive to contribute towards a civil aviation that is representative of the country's demographics through our own respective transformation plans. Most importantly, we will continue to work with ICAO, our shareholder, um, our ministry, and the industry to keep the Civil Aviation Authority's brand promise of keeping you safe in the sky. I wish to thank the board of directors for its collective foresight in guiding the organization successfully during this very challenging time. I also wish to take this opportunity to also thank the ministry and the Department of Transport for the support and guidance provided to the regulator and the aviation industry on an ongoing basis throughout an era characterized by consistently moving goalposts. I also wish to thank the aviation community for the strengthened collaboration we have witnessed during the pandemic. Program Director, I wish to also take this opportunity to thank the executive and the staff of the regulator for their resilience and drive in contributing to the success of the organization. The commitment to uphold the mandate of the Civil Aviation Authority did not go un uh, unnoticed. May you continue to uphold the mandate of the SACA once again. Thank you, Program Director, and may you have a fruitful discussion. God bless. <music>
coming back to the point of the, 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 the challenges that this A has highlighted, the pain that I'm sharing, uh, the pain that I'm feeling right now with regards to not, be able, to not being able to have human contact, to feel people, to touch people, to hug people, is not as painful as the pain we are feeling as the aviation industry. The ravages that have been done by COVID-19 to our industry have been immense and have, have been painful. Hence, I think the theme for this conference for this year is appropriate, saying reigniting the aviation sector beyond COVID-19. As you can see, I've been monitoring the comment section. Please uh, continue to keep them coming. At a later point, uh, once we start, we, we, once we finish the formality, the formal section of the program, you will be able to interact on the speeches and on the program by asking questions on those on those on that chat line, as well as talking to the speakers that will be in the chat line. So even though we're not together present in person but we can be together by exchanging comment in the chat line and making sure that we all engage. If you picked up from the DCA speech, one of the things that is important with this year's section is that, is, I mean, this year's conference is that we can only bring this industry together. So it is very important that all of us work together to bring the conference together. Thank you, DCA, for those introductory remarks. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I am going to invite to the podium uh, a man I call a man of many talents. Uh, sometimes he's a poet, he's a published author, and many other things which I don't have time today to share with you. But most importantly of those talents, he is the chairman of the SACA board. Of board. Uh, Mr. Ernest Corsa is the chairperson of the SACA board, and it is his responsibility today to introduce the Minister of Transport. Over to you, Chair. Thank you so much, Program Director uh, Luvuyo. Our um, Honorable Minister, uh, Minister Fikile Mbalula, my colleagues from the SACA board, Ms. Pumimpofu, uh, Chief Executive Officer from the Airports Company South Africa, Mr. Chris Zerhental, Chief Executive Officer, AASA, Ms. Zux Ramasia, Chief Executive Officer, Barsa, Dr. Sandy Lemalinga, Chief Operation Officer, ATNS, speakers and panelists, attendees from regions, uh, the Seychelles and Lesotho, CAA. Ladies and gentlemen, I rise to introduce our Minister of Transport uh, in the Republic of South Africa. Minister, let me start off by congratulating you uh, on your belated 50th birthday. The media was abuzz with sparkling and colorful pictures uh, about your, your celebration. Color, Honorable Minister, speaks and conveys more clearer messages than words. Sparkling colors at your celebration represented the versatility, hope, and faith in the future. We hope this is going to transcend to the aviation industry, which as we all know, and as the DCA so eloquently indicated earlier on, has been facing challenges. Congratulations um, again in absentia to the Deputy Minister, uh, whose birthday is tomorrow. Uh, congratulations to her on her 21st birthday in advance. We wish her many, many, many happy returns. To our guests, in particular those who are joining us from abroad, we have a very versatile Minister of Transport in this country, uh, whose life and role and impact is felt in three worlds, which are the worlds of politics, the social space, and his professional environment 
which environment brings all of us here today. In politics, our minister is a member of uh, the governing party's highest decision-making body, the NEC, and he continues to serve as its head of elections. He has served on this leadership structure for many years before being re-elected in December 2017. He has distinguished himself as an astute political leader in the various role he has played from his days as a student and in youth politics to national leadership roles in the ANC. As a member of the ANC's National Executive Committee, committee Honorable Minister assumed leadership responsibilities as head of mobilization, or organizing, and walking on the footsteps of distinguished leaders like Wilton Mkwai, who held this position before him. He also served as head of elections, leading to the ANC's campaign to a sixth term as a governing party of South Africa. The minister cut his political teeth at a tender age and served in many leadership roles, which include a leadership role in courses uh, in the early 80s. He was elected president of the Wuchawele Student Congress in 1986. In 1987, he was elected to the executive committee of the very vibrant South African Youth Congress and proceeded to serve as an area member of the United Democratic Front. When the ANC was unbanned in 1990, Minister Mbalula was called upon to serve as a member of the ANC National Pro Provincial Youth Committee. Under the capable leadership of Firebrand and very popular ANC leader Peter Mukaba. He joined a team of capable leaders to rebuild the ANC Youth League after many years in exile and in the underground. He served as ANC Youth League Regional Secretary from 1991 to 1994 and was thereafter elected ANC Youth League Provincial Secretary of the Free State Province from 1991 to 1994. He was subsequently elected onto the National Executive Committee of the ANC Youth League where he served as the Secretary for Political Education. At the 20th National Congress of the ANC Youth League in 1996, he was elected Secretary General. He was re-elected to the position at his 21st National Congress in Bloemfontein in 1998, and he continued to play this role until his election as the President of the ANC Youth League in 2004 in Johannesburg, Gauteng. Minister Mbalula served as both the Secretary General and President of the ANC Youth League, working on, the Nelson Man on uh, footsteps such as those of Nelson Mandela, as the only other leader who served on both these positions uh, in, in his political life. Now, in his other world, uh, in his social life, Minister Mbalula has got a following in the social media, which is way bigger than a membership of an average political party. If it was elsewhere in the world, you could have used that to form a political party. In his other world, um, in his professional life, uh, which brings all of us here together today, he has been Minister of Sports, he has been Minister of uh, the Police, and now he is Minister of Transport, which is one of the biggest departments in government, comprising of more than a dozen entities, affecting every facet of the economy in this country. Now there's one thing common about all the ministries that he has headed. Sports, police, transport. The common thing is movement. 
these uh, ministries that require energy and movement and versatility. And Minister Mbalula is a great political athlete. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you our very versatile and eloquent minister who is also a champion of transformation. Ladies and gentlemen, I present the Minister of Transport, Minister Balula. Thank you. So, I've muted. Uh, Program Director, Mr. Vuyo, uh, Chairperson of the so, SACA Board, Director of Civil Aviation, uh, Chief Executive Officers of State-Owned Entities, Speakers and Panel Members, Distinguished uh, Ladies and gentlemen, today marks a little more than a year since our president uh, Ramaphosa announced a nationwide lockdown. The virus was first reported in December 2019 and has since spread across the globe and affected every nation. While scientists have occasionally signaled possible outbreak of pandemics, I'm yet to come across anyone uh, who could confidently say they could predict the devastating impact of this COVID-19 pandemic. The negative impact of the pandemic has been felt worldwide and at all levels of society. Its effect became more apparent when countries across the globe took drastic risk mitigation decisions, such as the total closure of borders, travel restrictions, and many other measures. This resulted in dramatic uh, changes to our way of life as we knew it, and ushered in a new normal, which will persist for the foreseeable future. I have no doubt that very few would argue that the drastic measures we introduced to keep the spread of the pandemic were necessary to preserve human life. We have never been under any illusion about the strangle hold effect these risk mitigation measures had on the economy and disruption of society uh, activity. The aviation industry in particular bore the brunt of these measures and was impacted by the devastation of the uh, the most. Overnight, we saw a slump in passenger numbers as the normal flow of air traffic was brought to a complete standstill. This had a negative impact on air operations 
operations, airports, airlines, including other related services. This unfortunately meant that many jobs were lost. As we gather today to take stock, many more jobs in the sector are hanging by a threat. The theme for this conference, reigniting the aviation sector beyond COVID-19, cannot be more relevant as we look at ways in which we can kickstart the recovery of the aviation industry. This is an industry that serves as the bedrock of a significant portion of any country's socioeconomic activities. In one of its recent reports, ICAO had estimated that as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, international passenger traffic dropped by a dramatic 60% during the 2020 calendar year, with just 1.8 billion passengers using air transport compared to 4.5 billion in 2019. Locally, we have also been monitoring passenger numbers, which have decreased significantly when compared to previous years. At the beginning of March 2021, airports company South Africa reported that the number of departing passengers in 2020 fell by 65.8% compared to 2019 from 21.6 million to 74.4 million passengers. The decline in domestic departing passengers was 61.9% and the international departing passengers fell by 74.6%. Seats made available by airlines for destinations within South Africa and between the country and international destinations were 41% of the previous year levels. In 2021, seats published by airlines are at 74% of the 2019 uh, levels. This is the evidence of the serious economic impact to local and international operators. No one knows better than you that nothing is more costly than an aircraft that is parked in a hangar. Less traffic movement also means lower user fees for the likes of the South African Civil Aviation Authority. They are among some of the government agencies that have the mandate to ensure safety in our aviation operations, funded through a user pay model or a hybrid model that includes user fees. As government, we have a duty to ensure that these entities continue to provide the invaluable service they are mandated to provide to keep our skies safe. There is no doubt that although there had been extensive training in Africa and globally to ensure preparedness for a possible outbreak, the current global pandemic impact variants, global border shutdowns, and the duration of the state of disaster have overwhelmed most industries, including aviation. Despite the odds, we can not ignore the fact that Africa and South Africa did reasonably well in managing the pandemic. We can conclude that tragic as the episodes were, past experiences in managing outbreaks relating to pandemics such as Ebola served Africa well. The fact that our continent has had to deal with pandemics before meant that it had a head start in terms of the necessary stakeholder consultation for processes, communication, mobilizing of the necessary resources. Um, it is on that basis that the devastation of the COVID-19 pandemic on the African continent was less than predicted. While South Africa, unlike West Africa and other regions, has never experienced outbreaks of international concern of this magnitude. We have since 2007 invested in training both aviation and health personnel in key aspects critical to the management of pandemic outbreaks. 
In addition to hosting ICAO and World Health Organization conferences, local training workshops were held with academia, airlines, air ambulances, airports, air traffic navigation services, and other segments of the aviation industry. This resulted in good and essential preparation by the entire industry and downstream uh, value chain. I wish to commend the South African civil aviation industry for your cooperation during this state of disaster that continues without respite. Your determination to keep the aviation industry afloat is commendable and must be supported. Our experience has taught us that pandemics can only be contained through continuously remain on, remaining on high alert and keeping personnel informed on testing procedures through stimulation exercises. I therefore encourage you to seek ways that will ensure that the aviation industry stays ahead in terms of measures aimed at mitigating the spread of the coronavirus. As I indicated earlier, the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic has been felt far and wide. The economic consequences resulting from a disconnected African continent have been severe with the loss of millions of jobs and livelihoods in family-run enterprises and large corporations along the entire travel and tourism value chain and downstream uh, industries. This economic devastation is anticipated uh, to increase with an estimated 3.5 million job losses uh, predicted. That is more than half of the region's 6.2 million aviation-related employment and 400,000 more than the previous estimated estimate made by the International Air Transport Association, IATA. The above losses due to decreased passenger numbers and the travel restrictions have a far-reaching uh, impact on the every metric within the five biggest African uh, markets. As the current scenario appears, there is a silver lining on the horizon that will only be realized if we continue to collaborate and pull towards the same direction. There is no doubt that the aviation industry will eventually take off. However, when it does, the entire value chain must be ready to hit the ground running and take advantage of the opportunities of the new economy. This sentiment is echoed by IATA, which reports that the restart of travel in the second half of 2020 was slower than expected, driven in part by slow return to international flights. IATA further stated that the recovery of air travel depends on several factors, which include recovery of consumer confidence in travel. Notably, Africa's most ambitious initiative to boost continental integration came into effect on the 1st of January, 2021. The African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, which plans to expand regional trade by 54%, by cutting tariffs on 90% of goods traded across the continent to zero, has entered the implementation phase. For aviation, the African Trade Agreement, together with other continental initiatives, including the single African air transport market, will be a game changer in stimulating intra-Africa -Af trade once fully implemented. These complementary instruments are expected to stimulate demand for air travel and trade, unlock the poor connectivity issues on the continent. At the national level, uh, the Airlines Association of Southern Africa stated that airlines across the Southern African development community have reported a massive collective loss of about 4.08 billion. However, travel and tourism for leisure and business 
is the fastest uh, growing sector in the world. The National Development Plan allies tourism as one of South Africa's three priority industries. Around 69 million people visited Africa in 2018, which is 7% more than in 2017. However, according to the Department of Tourism in South Africa, to take full advantage of the opportunity offered by the tourism industry, certain inhibitors must first be removed. This includes finding speedy solutions with, uh, with which to unlock the economic levers responsible for jump-starting uh, the stalling economy. For the total, for the local aviation industry to expand and fulfill its potential, the government, the regulators and operators must collaborate. Program director, as we move on, we must rightfully acknowledge and accept the devastating aftermath of COVID-19. Similarly, we must also acknowledge that the same challenge has forced us to leapfrog and take full advantage of technology in aspects of socioeconomic uh, activities. If it was not, if it was not as a result of COVID-19, we will today be gathered somewhere at a conference venue with business cards on hand to exchange during tea breaks. However, that has changed. Thanks to technology, we are still able to convene and discuss pertinent issues. That suggests we need to dig deeper for technological opportunities that will enable the reignition of the aviation industry. I have no doubt that we will find solutions that are innovative and balanced to take care of regulatory requirements. Aviation must never be the scapegoat that will be blamed for this or any future pandemic uh, outbreak. We must remain vigilant and stay ahead of the curve in terms of technology uh, advancements. To drive the message home, allow me to remind everyone that two days ago, reports emerged in our media that Singapore will, as of next month, accept visitors who use a mobile travel pass containing a digital certificate for COVID-19 tests and vaccines. This makes Singapore one of the first countries to adopt this initiative. The article further pointed out that Singapore will accept the IATA mobile travel pass for pre-departure checks where travelers can get clearance to fly to and enter Singapore by showing smartphone application containing their data from accredited laboratories. This particular initiative was successfully tested by Singapore Airlines and more than 20 carriers, including Emirates, Qatar Airways and Malaysia Airlines are also testing the pass. We need to work together as an industry to ensure that we place South Africa on a new growth path by making use of opportunities presented by technology and ensure that South African carriers are listed amongst carriers on that list. Program di Director, let me use this opportunity to remind and appeal to all to be ready for the security audit that was supposed to have been conducted by ICAO on our country by now. Had COVID-19 not disrupted uh, the process. The nature of this audit is such that it is not only government that gets audited, but the industry as well. The state has been preparing for this audit for a number of years now, and I am confident that will do well. However, the same readiness is expected from the side of the operators. And as such, I urge airlines and airports who may be sampled in this audit to cooperate with the regulator in ensuring that we are all ready when the dates are announced. On the safety side, South Africa has grasped quite significantly from the audit conducted in 2017 under the leadership of the regulator. The country has since closed more than 98 findings out of the 109 raised by ICAO in 2017. I have no doubt that we are all hopeful that the restriction brought about by the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic will be a thing of the past in the near future. 
There are many challenges facing the aviation sector. Firstly, the sluggish growth in the passenger numbers remains a source of concern, as this has a direct knock on effect on the country's GDP. Another challenge related to global warming, evidenced by the rapidly changing global weather patterns and the need for aviation infrastructure to respond to this. I'm confident that together we will find suitable and innovative solutions that will ensure that aviation does not leave an unhealthy carbon uh, footprint. Moreover, we must be ready to assimilate air taxis and other remotely piloted um, aircraft systems into the current well-oiled, well-organized, well-managed conventional airspace. Very soon, airspaces across the globe will resemble nothing we have witnessed before. We must rise up and be equal to the challenge. Ladies and gentlemen, we must be reminded of the stark reality that aviation skills are in short supply across the world. In our case, we have seen many of our well-trained and experienced aviators being lured away from South Africa to jobs and opportunities in countries that are offering much better remuneration. The aftermath of the COVID-19 outbreak will only serve to intensify the competition for limited, scarce, and critical skills. It is critical, therefore, to plan ahead for such a reality, as this may compromise our country's sterling record in relation to upholding civil aviation safety and security. Another challenge that we must confront head on is the white elephant called transformation. Uh, to put it bluntly, the lack of transformation in the aviation industry. Using the 2021 financial year as an example, the picture revealed by aviation personnel statistics showed no meaningful progress in terms of the transformation of the aviation industry, particularly for previously disadvantaged uh, individuals. Africans, Colors, and Indians represent 11% of license holders while at 89%, the proportion of white license holders is still significantly higher. This is a scenario that needs to change. The statistics must reflect the racial demographics of the country. Among other things that must be prioritized is the demystification of the industry from being an exclusive haven that is the sole preserve for a particular class in our society. We must agree on transformation targets and introduce innovative measures to create access for young people who come from previously disadvantaged communities. Uh, this statement is an embarrassment because it sounds like a broken record, it's a repetition. From the time when we pronounced on this, uh, for the first time last year when we were minister of, we appointed Minister of Transport, today we should be reporting on progress lamentations and lamentations without putting checks and balances and measures uh, led by the board of uh, SACA and all our entities and give direction from the side of the ministry is meaningful, it's hollow, it's a repetition. So we've got to, to move with speed. We complain like we are not in power. We are in charge. We run this aviation sector. We are in charge. We need to give direction. Complaints and uh, lamentations are not going to assist in this regard. I'm certain uh, we all agree that 2020 um, will go down in history as a year that wrecked havoc and brought about unprecedented challenges for the aviation sector. These challenges created a climate that required collaboration between the civil aviation industry operators and associations under the leadership of SACA. This collaboration is a long way in assisting decision making. In conclusion, to the uh, Dr. Fabio, who hands over the reins to Mr. Juan Carlos Salazar on the 1st of August 2021. Dr. Lu, who has held the position 
for two consecutive terms since 2015 has done a sterling job. I have no doubt that Mr. Salaza will do the same during his term. Our support for Mr. Salaza will further deepen our ties of friendship with Colombia, and we wish him well in his new role. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish you all the best as you navigate these uncharted waters and assure you of my support in finding solutions that will ensure that the aviation industry does not only take off, but reaches the cruising levels we are accustomed to. I thank you and wish you robust and constructive discussions. I thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. I hope you've all enjoyed a nice cup of coffee. Uh, that is provided you've got some in your house. And now we are ready to continue with our program. Before we do that, let me thank the minister. Thank you, minister, for those remarks. You've really helped to focus us, to put us on the correct path, and ensure that uh, we deliberate fruitfully. And thank you for giving us your blessings. Now we know that this conference goes ahead with you in full support. At this point, uh, I'm made, I've been made aware that the Deputy Minister is also attending this conference. Thank you very much, Deputy Minister, for your attendance. Your commitment to, to aviation is appreciated. Before I introduce the next speaker, let me reiterate uh, that you, from this point onwards, you can pose your questions, you can put your comments on the chat section. I will be able to select some, depending on time, and pose them to the speaker afterwards. I would now like to invite the next speaker, who is Mr. Mohamed Rahma from Ikeo. Mr. Rahma is the director responsible for the Air Transport Bureau at Ikeo. Mr. Rahma, over to you, sir. Mr. Rahma, uh, it's over to you, sir. We're looking forward to your presentation this morning. Uh, Mr. Rahma is going to give us a global perspective of the COVID situation and how to go forward. Thank you, sir. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Program Director. I was unable to unmute myself because the host has not allowed me to unmute myself. Now I think you can hear me. So, uh, Honorable Minister Balula, Minister of Transport of Africa, Excellency Deputy Minister, uh, Chairman of the Board of uh, SACA, and uh, dear uh, colleague uh, Pobi Koza, Director of Civil Aviation, uh, Excellencies, friends, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good morning to all of you. It is a great pleasure for me to participate in this National Aviation Conference and to address this distinguished audience on the efforts being deployed for the recovery of the civil aviation sector with a special focus on safety and security. First, let me start with the economic impact of the pandemic on the civil aviation globally and in our continent, Africa. The latest ICAO economic impact analysis of COVID-19 on civil aviation reveals that the global seat capacity offered by airlines in 2020 closed out at 50% down from the level of 2019. The number of passengers fell by 60% compared to 2019. And this brings passenger traffic back to 2003 levels. Entering into 2021, virus resurgence and related shutdowns halted air travel recovery globally. February this year has marked another month of deterioration in traffic across all regions and domestic travel further weakened. Capacity offered in Africa in 2020 was reduced by 58% and passenger numbers dropped by 68%. International and domestic traffic declined by 70% and 63% respectively. When we talk about freight, the volume of freight carried by air declined uh, as the economic activity was reduced, but the number of all freight aircraft movements increased and some passengers aircraft were even converted to carry freight. Since July 2020, the all freighter aircraft activity in Africa is surpassing the 2019 activity, highlighting the critical role of cargo to carry pharmaceutical and medical equipments. 
The precipitous decline in air traffic has created severe liquidity strain to all aviation stakeholders, including but not limited to airlines, airports, air navigation service providers, and aerospace manufacturers, as well as all those throughout the value chain. According to our estimates in ICAO, the plunge in air traffic globally would translate into a drastic decline of airline gross operating revenue by almost 371 billion US dollars. And the loss in revenues of airports and ASBs would reach uh, 115 billion US dollars and 13 billion US dollars respectively. Traffic loss in Africa is estimated to have resulted in 14 billion US dollars lost in airlines operating revenues and respective 2.8 billion and uh, 0.6 billion loss in airports and NSB's revenue. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, you can see the impact of COVID-19 is enormous. This is the worst crisis ever in aviation history. Let me now give you an overview of ICAO work in response to the pandemic and to ensure the restart and the recovery of the civil aviation sector. I'm sincerely encouraged to see the determined efforts across industry and across the world uh, coming together collaboratively uh, to set and keep aviation on the path of restart and recovery. And in fact, this conference is a great example of this. And I can see and echo the words of His Excellency the Minister and Ms. Koza on the need to reignite the aviation industry working collaboratively together. You may be aware that the Council of ICAO has established in April last year the ICAO Council Aviation Recovery Task Force CART, which is aimed at providing political, practical, aligned guidance to governments and industry operators in order to restart the international air transport sector and to recover from the impacts of COVID-19 in a coordinated and a harmonized global manner. The CART has just successfully concluded the third phase on the 12th March last month with the publication of phase three high level cover document as well as the updated edition of the takeoff guidance document and the new updated manual on testing and cross-border management measures. It is through the implementation of CART recommendation we will facilitate the economic return of the aviation industry working collaboratively with our member states and i was honored to be the secretary of this task force the cart and i'm honored to say that cart work relentlessly on providing member states and the industry with principles and recommendations for the safe secure sustainable restart and recovery of the industry it is now also on the course to shed more clarity on the issues of validation of test results and certificates from the perspectives of the aviation industry. Dear colleagues, uh, if I'm speaking now about the safety issues and in addition to the work of the CART, ICAO has been assisting states in mitigating the impact on aviation safety since the onset of the pandemic. Initially, states were faced with the urgent need to temporarily depart from ICAO standards and to support states in managing elevations, ICAO developed COVID-19 contingency-related differences, what we call the CCRD. The CCRD was used to ensure that any associated safety risk of deviation from ICAO standards were adequate, adequately addressed. Such elevation of ICAO standards were established as interim measures to support continued operation. And as interim measures, these elevations cannot sustain safe operation indefinitely, and the return to normal operation or the new normal is now required. Consequently, we must move cautiously towards the new normal. ICAO is developing a planning tool and appropriate uh, to use for the recommencement of operation in line with the uh, requirements of the ICAO SARPs. This approach is based on a revised CART Phase 2 guidance, which calls for member states to put in place the necessary measures to mitigate the risks associated with prolonged regulatory elevations. Some issues of safety concerns include aviation professionals, such as pilots that, has, uh, that had an extension of the validity period of the pilot license 
and associated ratings. Many civil aviation authorities have approved uh, for a limited period alternative solutions to the traditional licensing and operational requirements. For the restart of the operation, states and operators must be confident that pilots and other aviation professionals are performing to the adequate performance standards, standards and to ensure safe and efficient operations. In order to ensure rapid, accurate and standardized information in support of the state's efforts to minimize the spread of the COVID-19 uh, virus by air transport and to protect the health of air travelers and aviation personnel, while maintaining the essential air transport operations, ICAO developed guidance and means to exchange safety information through the public COVID-19 safety operational measures website. Let me now speak briefly about vaccination and vaccination is a key element in efforts to overcome the public health crisis to enable the recovery of the, of the economies worldwide. States should be aware of the challenges that may slow the rollout of COVID-19 vaccines, especially those linked with the unprecedented volumes of vaccines to be transported worldwide on a timely basis, despite the reduced air connectivity. Specific areas related to the transport of vaccines on commercial aircrafts require attention and action by pharmaceutical manufacturers, operators and regulators. Amendments to the technical instructions for the safe transport of dangerous goods by air were made and approved by the ICAO Council to ensure that these vaccines will be safely accepted, handled and transported. To assist states uh, through the COVID-19 crisis, ICAO has developed five implementation packages. And this is ICAO latest initiatives, which bundles guidance, training, workshops, tools, and subject matter expert support related to various areas such as facilitation, safety risk management, aviation security, aerodromes restart, and public health corridors. These IPACs have been developed and are being rolled out in an expedited manner and there are global plans uh, that has been established for the deployment of these IPACs in all IKO regions, including Africa, of course. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, let me now move to the challenges caused by COVID-19 in the implementation of the aviation security regulations and IKO's works to, ad to address them. Given the impact of the pandemic, on air transport, some stakeholders may experience challenges in implementing certain requirements in Annex 17, which is the Annex dedicated for security. ICAO advises that any potential interim solutions deviating from Annex 17 should be clearly linked and motivated by operational aspects of the COVID-19 crisis. Therefore, in case of member states should not be in a position to implement certain SARPs, it should follow the ordinary procedures of filing a difference uh, by indicating the reasons and the planned duration of this difference. By design, the security processes between security staff and the traveling public creates, of course, a lot of challenges, especially for social and physical distancing. For example, proximity is inevitable when screening passengers and their belongings and physical searches of persons will be limited as much as practical during uh, this crisis. To those constraints can be added the limited space within the airports, which are normally capable of accommodating an efficient security screening checkpoints along with feeding queues. On the other hand, normalization of sanitary measures during travel have become widespread and aimed to protect the health and safety of airport staff, crew and passengers in a bid to reduce the spreading of COVID-19 among people and across borders. The role played by aviation security here is fundamental in establishing that new normal. To address some of the aforementioned challenges, ICAO coordinated the development of a guidance document called the ICAO Guidelines for Aviation Security Contingency Measures during the COVID-19 pandemic and these guidelines are designed to assist states and relevant stakeholders in complying with international security provisions and applying security best practices while meeting the requirements mandated by the health authorities. 
the document is uh, uh, recommended recommends temporary solutions uh, to the implementation uh, of security measures during these difficult times. Regarding the transport of vaccines and air cargo security, states are reminded of the ICAO provisions for securing special categories of cargo and mail. Pursuant to Annex 17, ICAO requires that uh, consignments must be transported through a secure supply chain from the point of origin and kept secure until they are loaded uh, onto the aircraft. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish to remind you that in these difficult times, as the uh, Honorable Minister has rightly said, we are all responsible. And as Ms. Bubikosa has highlighted, we need to work collaboratively together in order to reignite the aviation industry, which suffers a lot during the past year. This is the longest and the most critical crisis that the aviation industry has faced. Um, to this collaborative efforts, uh, ICAO is planning to have a high-level conference on COVID-19 to be held from the 12th to the 22nd of October in 2021. And we are planning to have this at a hybrid meeting. We hope by October we'll be able to travel and people who wants to attend physically, they can travel to Montreal to attend. But if the situation is not improving, we can still have a total virtual uh, conference uh, in October. Uh, the conference will be run in all ICAO official languages and it is intended to culminate on the political will and commitment of states uh, to reach a global consensus on the recovery and the resilience of the aviation sector while ensuring the safety and facilitation objectives for the coming years. Uh, the conference will have two main streams. Of course, we will have the plenary, which speaks about the COVID-19, the political commitment, the way forward, how to build better resilience, but then there will be two streams dedicated to facilitation and to aviation safety. Uh, so I would like you to join this conference, whether physically, if situations uh, allows, or even virtually uh, by tuning into the conference in October. It will be um, a, a global uh, discussion on how we move forward and how we really reignite the industry. Uh, before closing, I have the pleasure to record that ICAO has declared this year, 2021, as a year of security culture. And you will have the opportunity to hear uh, more about this uh, when uh, my colleague and my deputy director, uh, Sylvain Lefoyer, will be presenting to you the activities of ICAO during this year of uh, aviation, uh, the year of uh, security culture. Uh, I wish to thank you all for the invitation. And I'm really happy that uh, we can still come together even virtually. And we hope that the next conference will be able to visit the beautiful country of South Africa and feel the warmth of the people and see the colleagues and friends there. Thank you very much and over to you, uh, Program Director. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rahma. We look forward to welcoming you in South Africa in the near future. Thank you for sharing the global perspective as well as what IKEA is doing during time of difficulty. We appreciate the leadership provided by IKEA. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm looking through the comment section. I don't have any questions for Mr. Rahma. Therefore, I will say thank you very much, sir. Now I will move to the next speaker. The next speaker is Dr. Alex Stanku from Ayata. He is the head of account management South and East Africa. Mr. Stanku, over to you, sir. I hope that you can see and hear me well. Um, so, um, Honorable Minister, uh, esteemed colleagues from uh, South African Civil Aviation Authority, dear colleagues from aviation industry and beyond, uh, all protocol observed, good morning. It is an honor to be with you today and have the opportunity to provide you with an overview of what the future of aviation may look like beyond COVID-19 
a perspective on health mitigation measures, testing, vaccine, safe reopening of borders and the impact COVID-19 had on the economy at large. By way of setting the scene, I'd like to give you a glimpse of where we are today as of um, uh, April 2021. And I will start with the recent developments as we have all seen uh, the fears about the new variants that appear to be more infectious, uh, but not necessarily deadlier. We have a very different COVID situation and waves of infection in different countries. The vaccination program had started pretty much across the world with various differences, but overall we are seeing a slow uh, rollout. And uh, we have also noticed some concerns on vaccine efficacy versus the Brazilian, the South African and the UK variants. And more recently, and that's actually a bit more worrying, an increase in vaccine differentiation with the treatment of person having taken different vaccines. Now, the outcome of all of this is that we are seeing states imposing more border restrictions, closures, additional testing, and more hurdles for the crew. And of course, there is a, a need, uh, as these issues will need to be addressed in close partnership with <clears throat> governments. From an aviation industry perspective, IARA has already initiated an industry restart program that encompasses a wide range of activities and initiatives to bring international passenger operations back to life. Our 2021 activities will be built around three pillars. Um, the first one, safely reopening the borders, aims to achieve implementation and harmonization of uh, biosafety measures on the ground and in the air, and to convince governments that these measures sufficiently mitigate the risks of contagion and importation of COVID-19 cases to reopen borders and remove travel restrictions. The discussion has now shifted from risk elimination to risk mitigation. Governments need to accept that there is no risk-free environment when it comes to importing COVID-19 cases and should seek a balanced approach between public health objectives and socioeconomic objectives. The second pillar, safely uh, restarting the aviation system, assure that airlines uh, and their supply chain partners, I'm referring here to the airports, the air navigation service providers, the ground handlers, and so on and so forth, are ready to resume and maintain operations throughout the recovery in line with all safety and regulatory requirements, and that there is sufficient capacity to meet recovering demand. The lack of predictability of the evolution of the pandemic, how governments will respond to it and when and where passenger demand will resurface has made scheduling much more dynamic than normal, which requires additional flexibility in the supply chain and makes it even harder to balance capacity and demand. To address all these issues, IARA will continue to work with all governments for additional flexibilities, work with supply chain partners to address capacity and provide industry guidance on how to manage uh, operation during this pandemic. The third pillar, restore consumer confidence and restoring demand, looks to restore corporate and leisure travelers confidence that it is safe to travel and uh, that destinations are open for tourism and business. It also looks to stimulate uh, the consumer desire to travel by encouraging states to provide travel incentives and to keep the financial and administrative threshold to traveling as low as possible. However, with the appearance of new variants of COVID-19, many governments are further tightening travel restrictions. And between November 2020, where we started to see a bit of relaxation, to January and February of this year, a major drawback has uh, happened. There is an urgent need to reopen borders now in many parts of the world. And this is valid, especially outside African continent. As here, I would say we are pretty much ahead compared to other continents. We all need to understand that a vaccine rollout may take uh, anywhere between 12 and 24 months. There is an urgent need to reopen. Okay, um, so we, we all need to understand that vaccine rollout may take anywhere between 12 and 24 months. It actually recently started, uh, started in many parts of the world, including in South Africa. So waiting for a vaccine rollout is not an option. 
we need to ensure that the information on air travel environment is very safe. Uh, of course, through the implementation of highly effective biosafety measures. We also need to highlight that quarantine are costly to run and restrain, uh, rest, restrain travel. We need to understand that systematic testing can, can greatly reduce importation risk to very low levels. And last but not least, international travel is much safer than other activities which have already uh, resumed. So in practical terms, states should relook at reopening their borders safely by uh, assessing the overall impact of multi-layer mitigation, by balancing out the risk of benefits of reopening uh, relative to uh, in-country risk, by making um, use of most rapid tests available. And here we need to praise South African government for the implementation of the antigen testing upon arrival, should the passenger not hold a valid PCR test. And actually following recent studies, the efficacy of rapid tests is very similar to the uh, PCR test with a fraction of the costs. And as a, uh, as a matter of fact, African Union goes even further by recognizing that antigen testing is very efficient and can be used as an uh, alternative to PCR. The fourth point is for governments to make use of the actual data from trials to develop and refine protocols going forward. And finally, adopt a standardized approach to health credentials. For this, trust is critical for mutual recognition of test results and uh, vaccination certificates when population will be uh, vaccinated. And we've also heard from Honorable Minister um, um, referencing the ATA travel pass. Um, and I, I just want to give you a, a brief overview um, about uh, this four module solution that is based on our registry of health requirements. And this is powered by uh, Thematic, which is our database on entry and immigration regulations that enabling passengers to find accurate information on travel, testing, and eventually vaccine when available um, and their requirements for, for journey. Uh, the second module is actually uh, on registry of testing and vaccination centers, enabling passengers to find testing centers and labs uh, at their departure location, which meet uh, the standards for testing and vaccination requirements of their uh, final destination. It also, support, uh, it, it also supports a lab app, uh, enabling authorized labs and test centers to uh, securely send uh, test results or vaccination certificates to um, uh, passengers. And lastly, all this will ensure a contactless travel process, uh, enabling passengers to create a digital passport, to verify that their test and vaccination meet the regulation, and to share tests or vaccination certificates with the relevant authorities to facilitate travel. The trials are currently ongoing and uh, the airline app integration is scheduled to finalize um, at the end of uh, this quarter 2021. This slide is just to provide you with a high level uh, mapping of the processes behind the app and the integration with uh, the lab app, the COVID rules, the entry regulations, airlines and border control and so on and so forth. Moving on, and as previously mentioned, we all know by now that the pace of vaccine rollout will vary significantly country by country. Given that uh, given the likely timeline and trend for vaccine production and distribution, it is likely that testing regime and uh, vaccination will coexist during the rollout phase. Therefore, we need to ensure consistent uh, implementation of testing being the bridge solution and also critical for aviation industry survival. Second, the travel restriction should be relaxed once uh, vulnerable groups are vaccinated, as risk to population and health healthcare system will have greatly reduced at that point. And potentially, we can go even further by saying the testing quarantine requirements should no longer be applied. Third, the aviation workers should be prioritized for uh, access to vaccines, as we need to recognize the role of aviation in vaccine distribution and that the air crew and uh, other aviation workers are prioritized once, of course, health workers and vulnerable groups are vaccinated. And lastly, uh, the governments and industry need to work together on a blueprint for implementation, having a standardized approach to ensure an equivalent treatment of different vaccines, uh, 
and the mutual recognition and acceptance of uh, vaccination certificates. And the government should also generate a roadmap for managing the implementation period, including minimizing complexity during the period where testing and vaccination overlap. IATA has generated several scenarios depending on new variants and government policy response. But there is a risk that 2021 RPKs, what we refer to as revenue passenger kilometers, might only grow by 13% to an average of 38% year on year compared to uh, 2019 levels. Vaccine news are indeed positive, but the recovery will still take time and we may experience issues with vaccine implementation and with the impact of economic damage. So looking beyond 2021, we should not expect 2019 levels to be regained until around 2024. Focusing on African continent, the total RPKs fell by around 70% in 2020 compared to 2019 levels. It is, however, expected a 30% average growth rate per year between 2021 and 2025 period. Finally, um, while uh, we are seeing domestic travel to recover much faster, um, the long um, the long haul and, and zooming actually to, to South Africa, just wanted to uh, make reference to the total RPKs um, uh, decreasing by 73% in 2020 compared to uh, 2019 level. It is, however, expected uh, a 33% average growth per year over the next uh, over the next four years. And I'm getting to my um, a domestic travel now. Uh, while we are seeing that domestic travel indeed. Uh, uh, seems to recover much faster. Uh, the long haul uh, is, uh, is, is expected to recover last in South Africa. And this is due to some travel restriction outside Africa, a weaker business travel, uh, the health risk associated with the evolution of the virus and the slower vaccination of the, of the population. When we look to Africa um, as a continent, the its key markets are in the region, in the Middle East, and in Europe, as you can see on, on, on the slide. And uh, if we want to zoom in uh, on South Africa, uh, while domestic market will be uh, critical, as I previously mentioned, let's not forget that regional and international markets will play a key role too. The governments have and will play a crucial role in opening up the economies. As per uh, WHO, people have to work, trade has to resume, and governments uh, have to trade off the risk of traveler arriving and potentially starting another chain of transmission against the obvious benefit of allowing travel from a social and economic point of view. And this slide says it all with the potential of 87.7 million jobs that aviation industry is supporting and the 3.5 trillion US dollars in economic impact. But only, this is happening only in uh, and under normal circumstances pre COVID time. And in actual fact, uh, governments have already provided aid of almost 200 billion US dollars, ranging from direct aid, wage subsidies, loan guarantees, uh, easing corporate taxes, uh, tickets and fuel taxes, and, and so on and so forth. And I would um, further add that the combination of airlines uh, struggle for survival, the government assistance, and with strong uh, support and advocacy from international and regional associations, uh, pre prevented airline failures in 2020. As you can see from this slide, 2020 has not been very much different from prior years when it comes to airline bankruptcies. But the difficult period, as much as we all want to forget uh, 2020, is not behind us, but ahead of us. As the majority of the airlines have arrived at the bottom of their sack, with many governments being unable to further support. The challenge now is to make flying financially viable again. I would like to finish by a couple of key messages we'd like to re-emphasize to South African government. Uh, it goes without saying that uh, IATA is committed to continuing uh, the partnership with the government of South Africa as it combats COVID-19. Um, we have the operational knowledge and expertise that can be put to work. We have a global overview and, uh, um, and um, uh, knowledge about the government's policies uh, across the world. We have a massive data and experience on testing, 
quarantines, uh, vaccination and contact tracing. And last but not least, we've also established solid relationship with governments and international organizations such as WHO, ICAO, etc. Um, I also make again reference to uh, the IATA travel pass as we believe to, um, to have the best digital solution for the health status uh, verification. I am extremely uh, delighted about the reference of uh, Honorable Minister uh, regarding uh, the, the travel pass and, and here uh, I'm sure that we can continue our collaboration and we, we can count on South African government support and endorsement to partner with IATA on the travel pass to move it forward. And lastly, I believe we are all aligned on the fact that removing travel restriction is key to economic recovery, but we must also acknowledge this must be done safely and efficiently. I thank you again for this opportunity and I thank South African Civil Aviation Authority okay. for this deliberation that will restore the much needed confidence in the industry. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Stanku. We appreciate the work being done by IATA to ensure that the industry comes back to. We also appreciate the commitment you've made to continue working with the South African government to ensure that we bring the industry back to life. We, the message that I've got at this point from all the speakers is that we need to work together. That's the only way we can bring the industry forward. Now, Dr. Stanku is going to come back. We've looked at the global perspective. Now we need to look at the local perspective. He's got a panel of industry leaders who are going to talk to how we can bring this industry back. Uh, I suppose some of them are prophets and some of them have got the crystal ball. So we're looking forward to hearing from you, you Dr. Stanku. I will allow you to introduce your panel. One question as you do so, you and the panel can look at from Tembisa, is how can the aviation industry ensure prioritization of aviation essential workers for the vaccination program? Over to you, Dr. Stanku, and your esteemed panel. Dr. Stanku, um, you will start off by introducing each member of your panel, and then thereafter you may continue. So ladies and gentlemen, continue to pose in those questions, and they will be going through to do Dr. Stanku, and as they deliberate with his panel, they will be able to engage with your questions. Over to you, Dr. Stanku. Um, so, uh, as you rightfully mentioned, uh, I, I believe that now, and I believe, uh, and uh, indeed, it has been previously mentioned: uh, collaboration, collaboration, and further collaboration. And I, I think uh, the only um, element that we need to focus on is that we need to stay uh, together strong. Uh, the next panel discussion uh, will focus on what the aviation would look like. Um, focusing on South African uh, stakeholders. I'm pleased uh, that I'll be joined today by uh, a number of esteemed uh, members. Um, Mrs. Mpo um, Pumi Mpofu, um, you all know uh, her. She's the Chief Executive Officer, um, Airport Company of South Africa. We have Mr. Chris uh, Tswagenthal. Um, he is the Chief Executive Officer um, of uh, AZA. We have Mr. Uh, Kevin Story, um, Chief Operation Officer at uh, CASA. Uh, we have Mrs. Um, Zuk Ramasia, uh, Chief Executive Officer at Barza. And last but not least, Dr. Uh, Malinga Sandile, Chief Operation Officer uh, ATNS. Um, in a nutshell, uh, my dear colleagues, um, we started this year on a quite positive note. We embraced 
um, a bit of relaxation and started uh, to see the light at, at the end of the tunnel. Then we faced a return to lockdown and travel restrictions. Uh, definitely this yo-yo uh, situation has brought a lack of predictability in the evolution of the measures taken in, in this pandemic. We are seeing governments responding in different manners. I would say in an unaligned approach, we are going to bed with one set of travel requirements and waking up with an upside down world with restriction applied and uh, withdrawn from one day to the other. Now, this has brought enormous challenges in understanding the evolution of passenger demand, but also made scheduling much more dynamic than normal. And this requires greater flexibility in the whole supply chain. It goes without saying that vaccines will be a game changer, not only for the industry, but for the world and economy at large. However, we have also um, seen that this will take a lot of time uh, between 12 and 24 months. And just to add on this complexity, we are now seeing this differentiation in the treatment of persons having taken different type of vaccines. And this issue only started recently. And my last point, because uh, I just wanted to make a context is based on the current forecast, uh, does not look that we will uh, get anywhere near 2019 levels before 2024 at the earliest. So with this in mind, there is definitely the need more than ever for all of us to play our part together and reignite the aviation sector beyond COVID-19. And uh, let me start with the number of, of questions for our dear panelists today. I will quick kick off with my first question and I will turn to Chris uh, for this one uh, to provide us with a holistic pan-regional perspective. Mr. Twagenthal, in your view, what are the current issues the airlines are currently facing and how do you see the aviation getting back on track or some sort of normalcy? Chris, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Stanku, Alex, thank you very much. Um, from an industry perspective, as the speakers starting with the minister and with DCA have mentioned, as well as Mr. Mr. Rama, the industry is in crisis and includes South African, the South African airline industry. Um, we've seen numbers that have shown the losses that we're expecting throughout this year, uh, what, what that we saw in 2020, as well as the expectations for 2021. So I won't dwell on those numbers. They are a matter of record. So these, this, the lockdown effectively in March 2020 led to this uh, crisis across aviation, travel and tourism, um, with, this, with the scheduled commercial revenues dropping to zero. A cash crisis has hung over the industry from that date and is still present and will continue given that airline traffic, as you mentioned, will has, is, has no one returned anywhere near the pre-COVID-19 levels. So I'd just like to, I've got, and I'll be as brief as I can. There, there are probably a number of major issues confronting the airlines. And the first major one is one of survival. And during, because during 2020 and 2021, I do not believe that in South Africa or even in our region or for that matter around the world, there will be any airline that will show a profit. And so cash preservation will continue to be that, that, uh, that priority, which has been mentioned earlier. The second major issue confronting the airlines is positioning and preparing the airlines for a changed business model as we emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic amidst huge uncertainty, which you've referred to as well. Since the start of this pandemic, um, airlines have had to take extreme difficult decisions to reduce costs, including uh, employee reductions through many measures such as layoffs and unpaid, paid and unpaid leave, and also retrenchments. And this, of course, go, goes through the, the entire industry, not only the airlines, but our colleagues who I'm, I know will speak after me as well in, in the various industries. The third in major issue arises from the second, which is actually trying, which you alluded to in your introduction, predicting the recovery of the market and how to actually plan the schedules in, in respect of revenue projections and designing schedules and offering the effective aircraft utilization with amended schedules. It may be in this area, I believe, where the recovery or the success of an airline business may become evident. And just to give a sense of this aspect of what's happened in the domestic market, we had the reopening of the domestic aviation from June 2020, which led to the return of Seme, Ailing, Fly, Fly Safe, and Mango Airlines. And they were followed by Comair through their British Airways and Kalula flights in December 2020, as well as a new um, airline, Link Air, uh, Lift um, Airlines, which commenced operations as well. So domestic travel has gradually increased from May, uh, from May, which was at zero, until 54% of, of um, in, in December 2020 compared to December 20. 
And the, clearly, capacity has gone up quite significantly. But so one of the biggest problems that we've had to deal with is the unpredictable COVID-19 infection profile, which has changed to uh, obviously brought about changed curfew hours, amended operating hours and schedules, airport operating hours and um, airline schedules having to take place often at short notice and with obviously a, dis a disruption to passenger plans. So the question of the impact of the second wave and, and those restrictions, particularly end of Jan in December, beginning of January, has led to reduced numbers of passengers and therefore obviously the, the, the necessity in both the domestic side and even more so in the, in the international market where the numbers for, for, for uh, January and February were much lower than, than, De than December. And although I think um, March is showing a bit of an improvement, we still believe that, and we haven't seen those numbers as yet, but we believe they improved. But we believe that the forward booking profile for the airline industry is, is pretty flat for the next couple of months. A fourth major issue is to deal with the reality of more intense competition during especially periods of fluctuating demand. So the above developments, which I alluded to, have seen an increase in the total capacity from all domestic airlines, resulting in airlines having to amend schedules and even reduce flights in some cases, just to try and get some sort of a sensible load factor on their, on their, on their flights and obviously optimize cost. Of course, the, the, the very big negative is that you do will, will have aircraft sitting on the ground. And the fifth major issue, just I would just like to come in with, is confronting the industry is a search for new opportunities to generate new sources of revenue. And I think one of the big success, one of the bright sides of aviation during COVID-19 was the, actually the performance of the cargo business, where cargo operations were allowed to continue to, to, uh, to, to, to transport essential services and medical supplies around the continent and around the world. So although there was a dip in cargo, we see now that pre, um, cargo traffic is, international cargo traffic has actually reached uh, re return to pre-COVID-19 levels, which is, is good. So I think airlines are, have been looking at trying to convert some of their passenger aircraft into, into, um, into, into cargo cabins, if I can put it that way, and obviously do that. I think just to, in conclusion, uh, Alex, the South African aviation is open for business. And I think it's really to the credit of the government and also to the credit of the, of the entire aviation community that it is one of the few countries which have no restrictions on travel other than ensuring protocols and regulations for travel are there. And that the only restriction, which is actually a, a norm around the world is that you have a negative PCR test when you climb on an aircraft, either returning to South Africa or, or going out of South Africa. So I think that through disciplined observance of all these measures, we have to avoid the third wave, even though we talk about it. I'm still trying to be positive that there will be no third wave. And if, but it's unfortunate that, and you mentioned, that we need to try and get international travel back and going. So I would just like to see alignment of all measures. Um, and then obviously, we can talk further about uh, moving forward and positively in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate it. And uh, very relevant points. Um, now, let, let me just expand on what you uh, mentioned, as we have seen that governments across the world um, um, have provided aids of, uh, as I also mentioned earlier, uh, around 200 billion US dollars to the aviation uh, industry, ranging from uh, direct aid, wage subsidies, uh, loan guarantees, um, easing corporate taxes, uh, uh, tickets and fuel taxes, and so on and so forth. Um, as you mentioned, um, we also need to give, give credit uh, to the government of, of South Africa. Um, you are indeed correct by saying that South Africa is, is uh, open with minimal uh, measures uh, so far. Um, I'm certain, however, that uh, we may want to see some, uh, some areas where, where government can, can um, uh, act and uh, especially to go through this very important and very challenging year 2021. Uh, Ma'am Ramasia, a question for you, please, uh, as you have an overview of the airlines operating into South, uh, South Africa and their expectation and their challenges. From your perspective, how important is the government assistance in supporting aviation and what additional support would you like to see from the government uh, uh, in general uh, and from the government of South Africa in particular? Zooks, over to you, please. If you can unmute yourself.
you're still muted. I think if you go on your uh, picture, profile picture, you have a button uh, unmute that should be available. Yes, okay, I can unmute myself. Uh, it's because there's Perfect. a lot of feedback that I'm hearing, so I thought maybe the video, I must cancel it. Uh, uh, good morning, uh, everybody, and to, to the minister and the deputy minister. Um, your question. I, I have unmuted. Yes, we can hear you very well. Amzooks. Okay. Yeah. It was your question? Your question. I think if I had you, well, as I said, there was a lot of interference. Is that uh, yeah. the importance of government support in aviation? The importance correct? of government support and assistance in aviation, and what yeah, additional correct. support would you like to see from the governments in general, and in particular from the government of South of South Africa? Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for that, Dr. Stanku. And, um, you know, I think I would first like to paint a picture of the pre-COVID, uh, which was given by the Oxford Economics, whereby I think it, now it's common knowledge that uh, the aviation sector in South Africa, like the rest of the world, provides important economic benefits to the country by supporting uh, growth you. and facilitation. Uh, you. Um, you know, I think I would first like to Please go ahead, Zooks. So, as uh, as I already mentioned, that uh, in aviation, aviation and tourism are one of the major employers in South Africa with about 70,000 jobs directly in aviation, and 113,000 in supply chain, 48,000 were, were supported through employee spending, and 241,000 jobs in tourism, totaling in 472,000. So that translates to 100, 180 billion, which accounted to about 3.2% contribution to the GDP of South Africa. Of course, what I'm talking about is uh, pre-COVID uh, times, which actually is a preamble to say is, gov is the importance of government supporting aviation. Therefore, without any shade of doubt, aviation is significant tax contributor to the fiscal making it important to to attract government support yeah. mom we, we can hear you very well you can continue so the, the government is a critical success factor to, to a sustainable aviation ecosystem in South Africa. And that can be realized through government aid, which is increasingly important within COVID-19 context to ensure sectors ongoing sustainability, both in financial support and non-financial support. Okay, 
Okay. As we know, the government aid has been unevenly spread globally with very limited or no support in emerging and developing economic systems in South Africa. In South Africa, government support has been notably included in the swift return to the sky led by our Minister of Transport uh, through the captains of the industry, uh, ha uh, having worked through day and night to look at the biosafe so that you are able to open the sky. And recently, an end-to-end -end review of South African civil aviation policies have, have commenced, led by the Department of Transport Aviation Policy Review Committee, the APRC. The International Airline uh, Tactical Intervention led uh, that the meeting we had with the uh, Civil Aviation Authority, the Department of Transport, looking at the F foreign operators' permits. And it has been very, very uh, helpful to have that meeting, which was progressive, which led to DOT and SACA allowing the extended uh, FOPs for about one year. Whilst we are awaiting the outcome of, the, of our proposal to extend the FOPs, FOPs for a period of not less than three years, because that will help a lot than, than the current situation where we have to apply yearly. And it's very laborious, it takes a long time. And, uh, you know, between uh, ourselves, SACA and DOT, it's, uh, it's really not cost, cost effective time to spend on that. Whereas, whilst we want to ease the, the terms of, of business in South Africa, that FOP needs to really, really be looked at in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a broader way to ensure that airlines, uh, uh, international airlines are able to do business within the South African context. The airport slots rules that were temporarily suspended, it was a good initiative again by our government because that actually, because we are in a state of flux, nobody knew what was happening. And this intervention allowed airlines to come into a country based on the deployment of, 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 of their aircraft and, and, and looking at what is the challenges in their respective countries and marry them with the challenges in our country. One of the things that the Civil Aviation Authority has done, which is remarkable, and I think uh, the, uh, the, the DCA uh, talked to it, uh, to look at the validity of personal licenses and certification and they've, and they've extended them. So that process on its own, it's to show uh, working together to ensure that we remain in the sky and in a safely manner. And uh, I think those are the things that uh, come to mind immediately of the things that uh, the government uh, have done and uh, the importance of government ensuring that where there's ease of business and assisting the airlines to continue uh, the business. Thank you very much, Ma'am uh, Ramasia. Um, very uh, re relevant points. And um, uh, actually last month in March, 2021, we observed exactly one year since the first case of COVID-19 was uh, identified and recorded in South Africa. As a nation, and indeed the world at large, have seen events and scenes that are unknown and, and devastating. Uh, Dr. Malinga, uh, the ATNS oversees the air traffic control and management solutions for South Africa, but also represents 10% of the world airspace. So I take you have seen the decimation in traffic over the pandemic period. In your view, how do you see the airline surviving going forward? And on a more particular topic, what uh, are the ATNS uh, plans to further support the industry under the current circumstances? Doc Malinga. Thanks very much, Alex, uh, for the opportunity. Yes, uh, as ATNS, we see a very changed uh, aviation environment going forward, uh, one that's going to be very lean. Uh, that will require greater efficiency to survive and to proceed to offer the services that are required for aviation uh, nationally and globally. And as a company, we believe that we have a role to play to ensure that 
uh, is a reality that's realized. And there are four points that I believe that uh, we uh, need as, as an industry need to focus on in order for this to be achieved. And in each of these uh, four points, I believe that HNS has a direct role to play. And the first one I think is that of ensuring uh, in a general sense, financial sustainability for all parties. And here I'm talking about the passengers because it's very, very easy for us when we are struggling to, 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 to try and recoup as best as we can, as, as fast as we can, uh, the losses that we've suffered and that may uh, lead to high prices, which may not make this the system sustainable. And so we, we have to look at the passengers as well, look at affordability for them. We have to look at the industry, uh, the affordability and the sustainability of the industry. And here I'm talking about the regulator, I'm talking about the airports, I'm talking about um, ourselves as air traffic management uh, agencies, and I'm talking about the ancillary services, uh, whether it's uh, the, the catering services uh, and all sorts of other services. So there's got to be a, a, a broader look at how we can collectively be sustainable. When things are bad, it's difficult for one to achieve that because we tend to be self-centered and look at ourselves and say, what can I do to recover from my situation? But we, we need to realize that actually it needs the, the sustainability of us all for us to, 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 to really move forward. And then in this regard, I'll focus uh, under that uh, first point on what we as HNS will be doing to contribute to that uh, sustainability in a general sense. We are currently uh, reviewing our business model, uh, redesigning our organization, uh, looking at the, the size, uh, the shape, and the fit of an organization. How can we be more agile? How can we be more cost-effective and not be a burden to, uh, to the industry? We're looking at our cost structure. How can we optimize it, reduce the, uh, some of the fixed costs? Our cost structures has large uh, fixed uh, components, which when things happen, we can be agile to change. We are looking at diversifying our revenue. Uh, we have uh, regulated revenue and non-regulated revenue. And growing the non-regulated element of our revenue will be key in expanding to, to the African continent. We also are seeing a change in the, uh, I'll call it the configuration of the, the, the industry. We've seen uh, smaller aircrafts uh, rather than bigger ones flying more. And our permission structure is designed by, uh, is, is determined by mass. All right. What does that mean for us going forward? Does it mean that we need to review the permission structure and the determinants for thereof? Those are some of the things that we need to look at under the, the financial sustainability of the industry as a whole. And then as number two, I, I believe that there's got to be improved efficiency uh, in the business, in aviation, in the industry. And under that, I think there are a few things that we need to look at, and our contribution there too will be in optimizing the airspace and the procedures, therefore, um, that we are using. We have to improve uh, and, 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 and expedite the Houting Airspace Improvement Program, looking at improving the procedures as well as the airspace design so that the costs are minimized, the greater efficiency is realized. We have to, as an industry, collectively to realize efficiencies, to emphasize and to expedite our collaborative decision-making. CDM needs to be emphasized. We talk of it quite, uh, we, we talk of it. We really need to roll it out and implement as expeditiously as we can. Things like uh, the system-wide information management, need to move from being paper and, and be implemented in our businesses. We need to digitize as best as we can, automate as much as we can, and those are some of the things as HNS are embarking on in a big way uh, as we move forward. And the number under number three uh, we that we need to do to contribute to the efficiency and cost effectiveness of the industry and its sustainability is to roll out new technologies and innovations. That's what we 
That has been set back by COVID, but I think we need as best as we can within the affordability that we have at the moment, uh, while maintaining our cash flows, continue to roll out new technologies. And these include looking at digital and remote towers. We have a number of airports which have low traffic, uh, but require greater resources. And so if we can remote those, digitize those, and centralize how we control those, that will be one thing that uh, we need to do. We had already started a program that seeks to do that. We just need to expedite it. We have to look at artificial intelligence and data analytics in a big way to increase uh, the, 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 our flow uh, traffic management, the optimization of our routes, the, the analysis of what's happening, be it in safety in terms of or, or any decision making that can benefit from that. I think those are some of the things that we need to look at. We're also looking at space-based ADSP. At inception, it may be costly, but in the long run, uh, for the sustainability of the industry, I think these are some of the things that we need to look at. And last year's number four, as some of the contribution, ensuring safety will be key. The last thing that you need when everyone is struggling at this time is a disaster. And so we need, as we continue to roll out, to do the things that we need to do, we shouldn't cut corners. Uh, we should do what we need to do to ensure that safety is still uh, there in our business. And that's good and that's necessary for the sustainability of the industry. Those are the five point, uh, four points that one wanted to, to, to make and to contribute to the sustainability of the industry. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Um... My next question um, for uh, Ma'am Mpofu. Um, you are at the helm of a company that is uh, uh, operating nine critical airports across South Africa, but also have stakes in managing a number of airports outside the country. I recognize that you need to carefully manage the balance uh, stakeholder interest on top of your constant engagement with the government of South Africa being the main shareholder. AXA has seen and felt the impact of COVID-19 without a doubt. How do you see the evolution of airports and what are the development plans for AXA in the short, medium and long term? And on a more particular topic, what amendments, if any, are you seeking in the structure of charges, seeing that the airlines are now facing a liquidity crisis? Mamo Pofo. Thank you very much, Dr. Santo, for your question. Let me recognize the presence of the Minister and the Deputy Minister and all protocol observed. Despite the devastating effect of COVID in South Africa um, and worldwide, and in the context of the promise of reigniting the aviation industry through vaccines and other health protocol measures that have been clearly outlined this morning, AXA remains committed to the vision of being the most sought after partner in the world for the provision of sustainable airport management solutions by 2030. Our strategy is developed over the timeframes referred to in your question, short, medium to long term. And we have committed ourselves to the strategic pillars of running airports, developing airports, and growing our footprint. In these three timeframes, in the short term, I would indicate that we want to focus on running airports and running them efficiently, digitization, and improving and protecting our core business, exploring emerging businesses and transforming the company, but also to increase our revenue base as best as we can, yet planning, researching for a new direction which we will see realization of in the medium to long term. Central to this strategy has been a revised financial plan which has been based on the assumptions of the international predicted medium-term reduction to air traffic, uh, passenger traffic. But our immediate responses as AXA has been in the short term to cut significantly our operational expenditure to the tune of 1.2 billion and limiting our capital expenditure program to 810 million in the first year and then capping it at 1 billion for every year after until 2022, 23, 20, 24, 25. We've also had to look at 
as a result of this, the rescheduling of traffic responsive capital programs, uh, and yet maintain a nice balance with uh, retaining our license to operate. So our recovery and sustain plan over the next three, four, three to five years is also, uh, in addition to dealing with the CAPEX and, and, and OPEX, looked at diversification of our revenue streams in the non-aeronautical and commercial operations, digitization in order to promote operational efficiencies, monetization of our non-core investments, and importantly, research and planning for the growth strategies uh, that we aim to implement in the medium term. Marketing is a new endeavor, which I think the entire aviation industry has woken up to, and importantly, aggressive marketing for passenger growth, campaigns, promotion of accessibility of our airports, which is something we have not attended to yet, through promotion of modal integration and, and stimulation of growth of non-traveling airport users uh, from surrounding townships, particularly in the South African context. And we hope to contribute significantly to a modal shift for promotion of trade and the world's scope and cargo, um, which is going to grow our aeronautical business and a modal shift from road to air is one of the strategies we hope to contribute towards. Critical to our success is also the consultation of our stakeholders, as we indicated. We serve and participate importantly in ACI Africa and ACI World, and we have been interacting with them, our parliament rating agencies, investors, lenders, and stakeholders across South Africa, including the industry players which we've interacted with in order to formulate very clear plans for running airports efficiently, optimally, and innovatively in the first uh, period. We also believe the changes that were required to implement and lock opportunities with the participation of non-traditional airport investors who would help us to realize what is a collective dream of the recovery of the aviation sector. We'll also then be taking up uh, opportunities to manage, operate, maintain, and provide advisory services to the other South African domestic non-AXA airports, which require our support through advisory and technical services on a cost recovery basis. In the medium term, which is our 26 to 2030 period, we'll be building the emerging businesses, but we've identified very clear strategies for the medium term that are linked to contributing towards economic growth, optimizing our assets, and planning for new capacities and growth opportunities. And these include an AXA global strategy for growing the AXA footprint globally, regionally, and domestically, as I've spoken about the non-AXA airports, an aerotropolis strategy, which aims to promote the three golden triangle airports of Oartambo, Cape Town and King Shaka International in Durban as aerotropolis developments and the six regional airports of AXA as airport cities. That's our medium to long-term plan and we are currently doing work to facilitate the planning of this and the integration with partnerships and investments. Cargo strategy becomes a very critical uh, pillar of our growth strategy and important in that we aim to facilitate trade in South Africa and on the continent. The minister spoke eloquently about the opportunities presented to us by the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. We really believe the positioning of AXA airports, our airlines, as the center facilitator for trade in this context is really a no-brainer. E-commerce has grown and illustrated the opportunities it presents to all of us, logistics, and high value industries are all poised to be supported by our cargo strategy that we aim to implement in the medium term. Importantly, the minister referred to the important elements of transformation of the industry. And as such, one of the pillars is our training academy strategy, which aims to place the AXA Academy as a leader and preferred training provider uh, in the Southern African region, but more importantly, integrate with the other academies um, such as ATNS and other aviation academies into a very strong center for producing much needed aviation skills uh, on the continent. In time frame three, we look 
very specifically at an AXA that would at that point be implementing the Aerotropolis strategy, would be operating in other domestic non-AXA airports with an increased global footprint and playing a critical role in the continent around facilitating the Continental Free Trade Agreement, SATAM, and other important strategies of the African Union. And in doing so, we believe we can facilitate long-term economic growth, we can ensure and sustain aviation uh, growth, and we can position South Africa as the significant aviation provider uh, on the continent and retain our very important dominant role. With respect to the tariff structure, the current tariff structure is based on the user pay principle where we charge users of the airports facilities in accordance to the regulated framework, which includes landing fees, aircraft parking fees, and passenger service fees. In 2012, the industry went through a review, an independent review of the existing regulatory framework and the tariff arrangements, and that basically uh, concluded that there was no reason for changing the current structure. And therefore, as AXA, we're not looking to pursue charges, uh, changes to the current tariff structure based on the outcome of that very independent review that was conducted in 2012. Before COVID, we were planning to apply for tariff increases to the range of 35% uh, in 2021, 2022, which was largely informed by our additional capital expenditure program. The regulating committee, however, has taken a decision to run the current permission to the end and in full, where previously we would have applied for permission in the third year. And this means that AXA will continue, will only get an opportunity to amend the tariffs in the financial year 2023 to 2024 and can only increase tariffs by 3% in 2021 to 2022 and 3.6% in 2022 and 2023. Importantly, recognizing that this other muted um, increase in tariff structure is also aligned with the recognition of the challenges that are faced by the industry overall. This situation can only really be changed once traffic returns and all the predictions uh, led by yourselves and ACI and others indicate uh, returning to pre-2019 performance levels somewhere around 2024, uh, 25. So we're hopeful that the entire industry will be aligned. We would see much needed improvement in activities. We will see a growth in our revenue and importantly, the airlines will also see recovery as vaccine-led health recovery is witnessed uh, globally. Thank you very much for the opportunity to serve on your panel. I hand back over to you, Dr. Stark. Thank you, Thank you Ma'am uh, um, Interesting uh, and insightful presentation. So we've heard the uh, focus on di diversification, consultation, optimization, transformation, and uh, also when it comes to the more medium and long-term strategy and this aerotropolis uh, strategy um, and also expanding into the regional and international. Um, focus on cargo, focus on training academy. Uh, that's also extremely uh, um, interesting and integration with what are the existing um, uh, training academies um, in, in South Africa and in the region. And last but not least, um, I appreciate the comment on improved connectivity and, and focus on, on SATAM. Thank you very much. Um, my last and not least um, uh, question for uh, uh, Kevin. Your uh, association, uh, Commercial Aviation Association of Southern Africa, GAZA, it includes members such as uh, airport operators, uh, non-scheduled operators, business aircraft operators, flying uh, training organizations, uh, and so on and so forth. When we look to the non-scheduled airlines, which is a bit uh, a different uh, if we look if we look at it from a from a COVID perspective, how was this um, sector impacted by the COVID nineteen? And how do you see the non-scheduled operations evolving or going forward in the new normal? Kev? 
Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for that, uh, Dr. Alex Danku. Um, and uh, I think it's a very interesting question. Firstly, um, the impact to the non-scheduled operators and the training organizations and the AMOs, the, the repair, etc., everything that exists around the airlines, etc., was significantly impacted. Um, I can give you ideas that uh, we went down to 7 to 12 percent of the movements compared to the pre-COVID times. I can say on a positive note that we've moved up slightly to 15 percent of the pre-COVID uh, movements, etc., in this current month that's just passed. We're seeing a, a movement there. But we only envisage that we'll get to to similar areas as in pre-COVID in about three to four years' time. And you can see that uh, in our support of the, the authorities, uh, part of our fuel usage is used. There's a fee from our fuel usage that goes to support the CAA and ensure that the safety and all of that is in place. So you will see that that has been significantly down. There were some highlights, though, uh, the mining sector during that period and some new ideologies in cargo movement, small cargo movement, sort of kept it ticking over. But there was not one company that was not affected. I can give you figures of around about 30% retrenchments if we look at some of the smaller non-AXA airports with more possibly on the horizon. Uh, just depends if our, our numbers start moving in movements. Um, also, what we need to realize, and you spoke about government assistance, in the AXA airports, in some of the government uh, um, shareholder uh, companies, you found that there was a bit of assistance with bailouts, etc. In the in the private sector, we did not receive any of that. You will find our GA airports, such as Lanseria, received no such support. So it's been quite trying, quite testing. We've had to find innovative ways to do things. But that has also brought some positivity. Um, we've now got down to mean, very focused ways of doing business. We're looking at the digital information systems there. We're looking at focusing on the domestic tourism. You saw the numbers for the international side is, is significantly down. And obviously with our, our, um, our non-sheltered operators, we are fed by the airlines. So if there's no airlines, et cetera, and there's no tourism industry that is running, especially in the sub-Saharan uh, Africa, this significantly stops the number of movements that we have. So we need to focus on the domestic tourism. I think uh, there needs to be a lot more alignment in the SADC region between the various different um, responses to COVID so that the tourism industry can start moving as a unit uh, in all of those sub-Saharan African countries. So we can start to see those routes moving and the people uh, moving for those destinations. Obviously safely with various um, uh, COVID and, and vaccination programs, et cetera, that will most probably come in place. But please note at the same time during COVID, we didn't operate from our normal airports. We had to relocate. There was extra sanitation of aircrafts, all of those things. It brought extra costs to the industry. So those things had a, had a toll. But if we look going forward, um, a lot of uh, work has to be done on allowing quick, fluid uh, governmental inputs. We need to have a look at uh, utilizing some up-and-coming industries like RPAs, like providing for cargo movements with things that we previously didn't use. So the small movement of cargo around using air, but that would be an RPAS. That would mean interacting and coordinating with the AXA airports, with the other airports to make that all happen. I was interesting to hear the triangle of Eritropoli, where we also need to factor in there the GA airports. How are they going to work? How are they going to interlink in here? How are the RPAS cargo systems going to happen in there? The other important element was in COVID is that um, a lot of the leases for aircraft, et cetera, were, were given up. We sold off quite a lot of, of smaller aircraft to just survive during this time. That is going to have to re, be reinvested in. We're going to have to have capital expenditure. So the survival side hampers that. Uh, we do not have the funds to, to develop into those. We also need to look at the investors, looking at the numbers that are there three to four years till we get to the normal figures. Is that a good investment opportunity for some of the investors that we desperately need to invest in these aircraft, invest in these cargo operations, 
invest in the smaller airports. These are things that need to be looked at. When we talk about the flexibility for the government, um, when we're dealing with COVID testing, etc., in the non-scheduled operators, we go to small airstrips at uh, game parks, etc. That is what Africa is all about, moving people to these unique little destinations with our non-scheduled uh, operators. It's pretty difficult to get a COVID test or a PCR test, etc., in these areas. So we're going to come up, need to come up with unique ideologies of how that is going to happen. And that, I think, is, is where we're going to need the DOT, uh, the government structures to look at that to, with open minds, with a, an encompassing ideology in that. What I can say is during the COVID time, we saw a, a much closer partnership between the Civil Aviation Authority and the associations and with industry, making leeway and, and getting that going. So that was the positive thing that we saw there. We did see inconsistent governmental uh, sides to this from the DOT, where there could have been possibly information shared at hubs, at, uh, at um, telephonic uh, work areas where, where we could get central information. It was quite often frustrating to get that, that link. And if we move into SADC, there was nothing really in line as a unified approach. So I think we've learned a lot here. We can, can work forward on that. I think uh, embracing the technology is critical. The focusing on small cargo, uh, unique um, offerings for the domestic market, I think that's where we need to go. And um, I think uh, the lessons learned here will stead us or sit us instead for other epidemics, I think that that will come in future and other challenges that will come in future. So I think um, while we've taken a serious toll here, I think it's not all bleak, doom and gloom, but I think. Um, we're going to take a while to get back there. I think that's my points for today. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. And yeah, indeed interesting to hear that um, the non-scheduled aviation uh, has uh, also suffered and had its toll following the COVID-19. Um, interesting points regarding uh, focusing on uh, small uh, cargo going forward and uh, technology trying to find new ways on how uh, we can evolve the non-scheduled operations. Um, and uh, I believe you, you have been uh, well heard regarding those uh, secondary uh, or smaller locations, airports, where probably the focus was not uh, up to the expectations. Um, it's okay. I'm uh, now Mining the, the time, I see that we have uh, probably another five uh, minutes uh, or a little bit over five minutes. So I would like to know if uh, we have any questions from the audience. I do have a, a, a summary uh, or a closing remark question uh, for everybody, maybe a one, two minute. But let me just uh, check uh, with the uh, host if uh, we have any questions that we need to put forward for the panelists. Otherwise, we can just summarize our discussions. I don't see any anything on the on the chat, so um, I take uh, no questions. Okay, so use the opportunity if we are to summarize in in one two minutes um because we are now on the uh on the future of of aviation um a quick round table on how do you see the aviation five years from now once levels have improved and hopefully exceeded uh previous uh, level we were used to back in 2019 um and, and what 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 will be uh, the new the new normal and maybe let's let me start in a different uh, order and if we can take no more than one or two minutes max uh, ma'am and pofu thank you we are very optimistic about what the future holds. covid has taught us very important lessons about diversifying the aviation offering and integrating into the economy much more closely than we have before. Our dependencies on the tourism sector, on the economic, and particularly I want to emphasize trade facilitation, is something that 
would all go well for the aviation industry to embed itself very clearly as a driver in the economy, in the country, the region, and globally, uh, very directly linked to promoting economic opportunities and being central to being the key facilitator of global economic recovery. I think that new normal poses a challenge on those of us who are in the industry to quite clearly diversify our offerings, uh, use technology and digitization to the maximum, uh, employ artificial intelligence and other fourth industrial revolution measures to jumpstart the industry into a trajectory that we possibly not occupied, which we should rightfully take. So the new normal is going to be one that is driven by health and vaccinations and recovery and passenger journey articulation to the highest level we've ever experienced. But we've proved we are able as this aviation sector to respond to that challenge. What we really need to do is to open up uh, the sector so that we are much more integrated with other sectors and play the important role in economic growth. Thank you, Mamon Pofu. Uh, Dr. Malinga, your closing remarks. Thanks. Yes, uh, I think for us, we see a very different uh, environment and uh, industry. And key for its success will be a redefined skill set that's uh, more adept to digital uh, uh, environments, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, greater automation. And so in the next few years, I think for us, it's to look at how we reskill our people, make them future ready, and, and make them more adaptable and more agile uh, to adjust to any environment that we face. As it, as it was mentioned earlier on, pandemics and other disasters will come. And I think it's our resilience and our ability to adapt and change as quickly as we can that will make us sustainable uh, into the future. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Um, Kevin? Thank you. Um, I think our focus will be specifically on the domestic tourist sector. I think um, COVID will also bring in focusing on the new customers that have come onto the market due to the lack of the airline av availability. There'll be a lot of focus on that. I think there'll be a lot of diversity going into the four IR technologies and especially the diversification into the drone area. If we call that the RPAS sector. I think South Africa has to focus on that significantly and very, very quickly because that is a, a growth sector that will happen. And it also aligns immediately with transformation ideologies because uh, the pilots here, it comes from a different training background. So I think that is where we're going to focus. I think it's going to streamline our operations to be very efficient, very um, mean, if we can call it that. But uh, it will bring very good competitive uh, workings in the in the industry. So I think that's where our focus will be. I think it's going to be tough, um, but I see better partnerships and I see a better offering to the traveling public by the time we get to three to four years from now. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Appreciate it. Uh, Ma'am Zooks. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stanku. So uh, I think uh, the road ahead, you know, uh, is going to be a uh, hard, uh, riddled with uncertainties, but we are going to recover. And uh, I think uh, the, the, the way we can recover is that we will remain optimistic, basically, that and resolute that uh, with the appropriate uh, public health responses by the governments globally, we are able to recover this unprecedented period of our lives. And, uh, you know, uh, for us to go to the pre-COVID-19 uh, uh, period of 2019 and, and so on levels, uh, working collaboratively is going to be very important in this industry. As partners, as governments, as airlines, as everybody who's, you know, the ecosystem of the airline, we all have to arrive at innovative uh, solutions 
to deal with uh, the situation that we are in, the, the current crisis. You know, even though this roadmap may be unclear at present, we believe that a revolutionary transformation uh, based on a number of critical uh, factors such as um, a structurally adapting our business model and changes in order to adapt to the new normal that is inevitable. We need to embed uh, uh, the health protocols as part of our, of our vision culture, culture and uh, uh, relate into the biosafety and security. And we need to invent ways to respond to new market dynamics and be more customer solution orientated. And we also need to strengthen airline alliances together with co-sharing practices. And uh, you know, it, it all talks about collaboration and collaboration. And we need to effectively respond to strengthening border and port health controls and capabilities for, for us to achieve these common industry objectives. And, uh, and we need to, together to be able to accelerate not only our recovery as aviation, but the entire South African economy is resting on our shoulders to work together to ensure that uh, we recover and we are synchronized, we are facing the same way forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mam Ramasia, for this insightful word. And last but not least, uh, uh, Mr. Zwagenthal, please, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Um, yeah, I, you, you posed the question five years from now. I'm assuming five years from now, we're going to be, have gone through the uh, pandemic and we are really on the, on the full way to survival, I, I think, and, and, and full recovery. Um, I think the scenario will be a different industry at the moment. I think through that journey, we're going to probably have casualties, unfortunately. Um, I hopefully we minimize those casualties and if we have casualties, we have, have, have restarts or we have consolidation and we just make sure that, uh, that we're able to continue operating. I think this makes the importance of, um, of, of collaboration a lot more important because we need to be aware of each other's, the realities of what's going on in our respective um, industries, our respective sectors, as well as in the countries around us so that we can step in and, and assist where, where possible and respond to those realities. I think one of those areas is, uh, for example, let's take SATAM and African continental free trade area, is that that implementation is actually quite critical. We've got a very long journey on the whole liberalization aspect of Africa, mm -hmm. but SATAM now, is it'll probably be a slightly different type of an implementation because we're going to have a re- we're going to have a different type of environment and different industry to actually liberalize. And, and I think that that is something that we've really got to take stock of and, and move. So we're closer together between government, public and private in terms of inclusivity, making decisions. I think we've got to acknowledge that we haven't always achieved all the goals in the past and we need to get together a lot more to ensure that we determine what is best for the future and obviously to make this recovery, which is so essential, a lot more sustainable for us all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate that. And um, that brings us to, to the end. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, to you all, to all the panelists and esteemed colleagues. I trust we managed to give the audience uh, an overview uh, of the future of aviation and the ways we can reignite uh, the industry, the aviation industry that has been uh, greatly affected uh, um, following the COVID pandemic. Thank you. Um, host, over to you. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Stanku. Dr. Stanku. I've got a few questions, Dr. Stanku, if you and your panel don't mind, and if you can answer them within a few minutes. One is how do we overcome the ban that has been placed by other countries in South Africa? To that, you can link a question that says, how do we boost passenger confidence? And secondly, the move to ADSB, how do we balance that against the cost. Thirdly, how are we going to keep the skills? I think Dr. Malinga, if I'm not mistaken, did talk to do that, which is reskilling of people. And lastly, how is AXA having any ambitions of going into renewable energy? 
And I think there's also a question for AXA. The Ms. Mbofi has spoken about cargo. Are they intending to, to go into that cargo operation space or are they intending to support the industry? Thank you, Dr. Stanko, if you can answer those briefly and then from there we'll go to a break. Of, uh, of the panelists and I'll start with the first one in order to boost passenger confidence. Um, Chris, maybe you can provide an, an insight on, on that aspect. And this is also related to what has happened across the world with many restrictions imposed on South Africa. And as I mentioned, I believe that here on African continent, we are quite well ahead. Now, uh, the, the, the issue and, and the work now is how we make it open uh, outside. Chris? Thank you, Alex. I think um, this has been a big challenge and obviously the big, um, I think one of the big things to boost confidence is to ensure that we actually have a consistent approach across across the states and across governments. Because obviously, I think that if, if you were to listen, as I said, with the way that South Africa is open, if you left it to South Africa and our model had been implemented around the world and confidence levels for people to be able to travel would have been a lot more. Um, the biggest problem, of course, is, as, as other states have, have, uh, have stopped travel, that has made people very, very nervous about, am I going to get a refund on my, on my ticket? What's going to happen with my, my land facilities, especially when it happens at short notice? So I think the big thing is that we really got to find, get that alignment, which I, my understanding through the initiatives of ICAO and, and, and IATA, there was the, the ICAO cart came into, into, into effect. But it's really not been implemented to the extent that we would like it. And I, I, one understands that the, the politicians have got internal requirements and they feel internal priorities but they do, that what's happening in particularly in the in international uh, foreign states is that they are they are disrupting the the confidence and the ability for people to to um to uh, to to carry on and i think your 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 presentation showed that the fact is you cannot aim for zero infections we've got to make sure we what's happening now for example if we can keep our levels at this point where we are in south africa and maybe go into um if it goes slightly up, but we mustn't get into that third that third wave. If we can do that, then the South African model, which was even acknowledged internationally on, on one of the international stations, uh, CNN made a, a comment to say, South Africa's got it right, even though they went through the second wave and they went through the variant. So um, that, that, that's my comment for now. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. And now, um, while staying with this question, when it comes to the costs, obviously all these new normal um, and new regulations will increase uh, the cost of, of travel. Um, so, um, Ma'am uh, Ramasia, maybe just a, a few comments on how we look to balance uh, to balance the cost. I believe a lot has been said in, in, in terms of looking at diversification, optimization and innovation, but maybe uh, some, some insights from your side um, and from the airlines operating in in South Africa? Actually, uh, right now, um, for airlines, it's more costly. And the people who are benefiting are, are passengers. Because if you look at it, uh, the capacity is more than the demand. So uh, then it remains uh, uh, as to what the first question that you ask about what, uh, the government, how can it assess the airlines or the aviation sector? to ensure that they remain afloat. So I think throughout uh, today, what we're speaking about is a collaboration within uh, the aviation industry as well as, as the government. So a lot uh, of incentives are expected from the government, basically. We know that they're they looking at many other things in the country to ensure that the economy is boosted. But I think now we know that aviation is one of, 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 of uh, contributors to the tax or of the GDP. So it is really important, uh, like I've mentioned at the beginning, that we, we, the government helps both on the aeronautical and the non-aeronautical to ensure that we remain afloat and for the airlines and the aviation. But right now, the, the, who, who is benefiting is the customer. And I think it's important that everybody should benefit, not only one, uh, what it's good for the passenger, but it must also be good for continuity for the aviation industry on its own to be assisted. And one of the things that uh, I think uh, the question that has been asked, 
I think that we need to respond to is the confidence of, of the customers to, 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 to come back and fly. Because it's very imp important. Because if you look the world, the the, the max vaccination is not a a single a silver bullet. Yes, it is there. But what is important is that there's a lot that has been done to put in place uh, measures to ensure that um, uh, traveling uh, by air is safe. So whilst max vaccination is something that is spoken about, yes, it is another, but it cannot be uh, regarded as a single. Uh, 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 way of, 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 of curing the situation that we're in. So we need to, what we're having in place, I think on its own is adequate. And as, as Chris already mentioned, I think on CNN, it was mentioned how in South Africa, the things that we are putting in place that are not expensive because the important thing, we need to look at, at measures that we are putting in place that they're not going to be expensive and going to, uh, they're, they're not going to be achievable for everybody. So that's, that's very important. Uh, for all of us to look at that. Thanks, Doctor. Thank you, thank you, Zox. Much appreciated. And then maybe the same question for Kev, just quickly, um, in terms of the balancing the the, the cost from a non-scheduled operation perspective. Um, how do you see this uh, uh, going forward? What what improvements or evolution in the non-scheduled uh, flights? I think what we have to look at uh, balancing costs, um, if. We, if we look at the procurement of stuff uh, and we look at probably lessening of some of the, um, the the demands on different types of solutions with vaccines, with different types of sanitization, I think that will get cheaper. But if we look at different types of testings or reasonable testings that can be done at various areas, that will bring that down and rolling that out into other areas where people now have to go to certain laboratories, et cetera. They pay a significant amount of money for the tests. So if we can bring that down, I think that will be significantly uh, helpful. I think what is, needs to be focused on is a, a communal marketing that um, it, it's a central push from every segment of the industry that We've got reasonable measures in place. We've got safe measures in place that it's not difficult to do these, get these tests, et cetera, that it's easy for everybody to find the information that they need when they're going to be traveling here. If that all can be done in a very simple portal that is, is easily accessible, then people will see it's quite easy to come here. And as the numbers grow, then your costs can be covered. I think it's a numbers game. If we can get the numbers up and the faith that it's not a dangerous destination in sub-Saharan Africa, that the ease of movement is, is not difficult, then I think um, the numbers will grow. Then the costs are not as big a factor as we are currently worried about now. With the low numbers, the, the, the costs are there. So I think we have to focus on what can we do to make it simple and easy and, and safe for the people, but in a reasonable way. That could be my answer. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Malinga, um, ATNS has one of the most prestigious aviation training academies. So um, I believe um, th this question regarding how we can maintain, not only maintain the skill, but I would say I would go even forward, actually prepare the world for the future of aviation. How do you see this um, in, in, in your plans and going forward? Yes, uh, look, I mean, as I said, the skills that are required for uh, aviation of the future are very much different from what we are currently uh, having. And so we're looking at, uh, a, there's a program that we're undertaking as ATNS to look at our product offering, changing uh, the, the content as well as the delivery mo 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 modules uh, and the modes of delivery. And so we're going to virtualize our training in a big way and increase the reach that we have uh, currently whereby all the training is physical. We are looking at the content itself, uh, looking at new things that need to be taught. We are discussing the other day on cybersecurity as an example, which is a big area that we need to, to look at that we hadn't looked at in the past. We are looking at different platforms. We're looking at AI as well to look at uh, better decision making, fast decision making and training on that. And so it, it will take a, a lot of uh, changes in how we do things and the modes in which we do our training to actually achieve this. Thank you. 
Thank you, doctor. And uh, I believe um, the last question uh, was intended for, for AXA. A um, couple of points here, the integration, a very interesting point going forward, the integration of renewable energy um, in, uh, in AXA uh, strategy and also uh, more details on the, on the cargo side and uh, the, the focus on the cargo. How will this be uh, added to uh, AXA strategy? Uh, Ma'am Ampofu, please. Thank you very much for that opportunity. Let me just indicate um, that AXA is quite an ambitious uh, program, environmental management program in reducing uh, environmental impact overall. We are ACI carbon accredited and our levels in our various airports um, are quite impressive with uh, level two and level three at, uh, at least three of our airports which have been achieved and importantly our annual target of achieving the level two reduction certificate for ACI um, remains something that we, we work very closely to. Importantly, as part of overall um, reduction of environmental impact, we have a program that is aimed at uh, introducing and reducing uh, our dependency on, on the carbon footprint specific uh, renewable energy program that looks at facilitating uh, our own development of energy sources at airports over uh, the medium term. And this particular uh, renewable energy project that we are running at AXA will probably be implemented uh, over the next five years. Our aim in doing so is to reduce our own carbon footprint, but importantly, uh, ensure that we are contributing uh, meaningfully towards uh, the environmental impact minimization and the overall uh, environmental program of uh, the ACI. In the ACI context, we've also contributed meaningfully towards the uh, Towards Zero uh, program that would uh, ensure countries are committing themselves to renewable energy and reduction of carbon footprint uh, through the ACI accreditation, but more importantly, through our own initiatives. So all of these look at various measures we take in our operations of converting our energy sources to more renewable ones. One, one of the good examples, for instance, is solar panels at, at airports and the shift from uh, grid energy to solar panels across our airport infrastructure. And we are also looking at uh, other sources of renewable energy in the environment. The question about cargo relates to specifically whether we aim to uh, facilitate cargo or participate in cargo. I think in the short to medium term, our identification of cargo as an important aeronautical business to be grown is, is borne out by the facts of what COVID has shown us in the growth of e-commerce and what COVID has found with this growth of e-commerce and cargo is that our facilities for cargo are not the best. So the first thing that Axel would be doing is focusing on uh, establishing cargo facilities that are uh, world-class to facilitate the industry playing an important role, but also for AXA to also play a role within the cargo value chain of providing facilities, of running efficient systems, of ensuring uh, that the operators can actually uh, benefit maximally with efficient cargo operations that meet the demand that is clearly demonstrated and is, is going to emerge. With the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, I think we would want to be able to shift the country uh, to a much higher performance level uh, in order to take advantage of the opportunities that it, it presents. So firstly for us, it's cargo facilities across the board, and we hope we'll also be able to work uh, with the non-AXA airports around really looking at a cargo network for South Africa, how it operates, both for international export and import, but also for internal export and import so that we prove uh, economic benefits inside the country with the other non-AXA airports and ensuring we all, we all really have a cargo strategy that works but that uplifts the economy and the aviation sector. Thanks. Thank you, Ma'am Mpofu. Again, thank you very much, dear panelists. I hope we've uh, answered the question. A round of applause and uh, give the floor back uh, to the host. Thank you.
Thank, thank you, Dr. Skanku. You certainly have answered the questions. Uh, I also want to thank your esteemed panel for ensuring that the questions were clearly answered. Ladies and gentlemen, now we're going to a break. However, because I wanted your answers questioned, we ran over time a little bit. Now we have reduced the leg stretch from 15 to 10 minutes. So please be back in 10 minutes time. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, we're back. Uh, we hope you've managed to stand up and have a stretch and we are ready to sit down with us again. Um, I want to thank you for your interaction on the chat section. Uh, Mr. Morey, your questions are noted. Uh, I'm trying, we're trying to get them to the IKO rep to see if we can get some answers. Uh, remember now, we've got this time difference. He's probably about to wake up now at six at, in a few minutes, maybe at six or at seven. But as soon as we get the answers, we'll provide. Ladies and gentlemen, now we move on with our program. We're going to have a presentation by Dr. Groom. Uh, Dr. Groom is the let me just get Dr. Groom's is the head of is the head for the Division of Public Health Surveillance and Response at the N NICD. Here we're going to hear about lessons learned and preparing for the future. Dr. Groom, over to you. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Michelle Groom. I'm head of the Division of Public Health Surveillance and Response at the National Institute for Communicable Diseases. And it gives me great pleasure to talk to you today and just to really give you an update on where we've come from in terms of the um, COVID pandemic um, in South Africa and just looking forward to what we might expect over the coming months. So this is the outline of the talk today. I'll give you a global update on the COVID-19 situation in the rest of the world. Then look at what has been happening in South Africa, looking at case incidents, um, testing, hospitalizations, a little bit on the strains that we've, we've seen and the new variants. And then think a little bit of the third wave, whether we'll be having a third wave, when this might occur, and then look at vaccination and the potential that vaccination can have. So, COVID-19 was really initially detected in December of 2019 and slowly has been increasing over time um, across the world. Um, and we've seen um, most countries now um, experiencing increasing cases. Um, and so we can see there was a slight dip towards the end um, of last year, the beginning of, of this year. And then the cases have been slowly increasing again. And in terms of death, we're re close to 3 million deaths um, in terms of global deaths. So if we look at the different um, regions, we can see by far the Americas and Europe um, have the, the largest amount of, of testing. If we look, Africa is really not contributing much. Um, that's kind of in the right near the bottom um, in the blue. And I think this is really not indicative of the number of, of um, infections that Africa is seeing. Um, we, it's really more indicative of, of the lack of testing in most of Africa. South Africa um, is really in, leading in terms of the number of testing uh, of tests that have been conducted. I've just singled out a few countries um, in the last um, kind of uh, showing the trends over the last couple of months um, in terms of India, which has seen a resurgence at the moment. They had a a big first wave and now we're seeing this resurgence in terms of an increasing number of um, infections again. France has recently put in um, some more uh, restrictions in terms of trying to curb their um, infections um, and countries like Turkey and Poland are also seeing kind of new waves of infections in the last couple of weeks. So if we look at the cases in South Africa, um, really the total number of laboratory confirmed cases is, is just over one and a half million. This was as um, of the 6th of April. And you can see we really had um, two distinct waves of infection. That first wave peaking in, in kind of July last year. We then had um, settling in the number of cases with decreased cases. And then once again, towards the end of November, this increase in the number of cases which exceeded um, the first wave. Um, and you can see we have now come down off that first wave um, and really seen um, back into kind of very low numbers um, that we're seeing. You can see that um, slightly more um, cases in the private um, as opposed to the public. But once again, this may be an indication of, of access to testing um, and testing available to, to the different sectors. Um, this is really looking at incidents. So the previous slide was absolute numbers. So with incidents, we're taking the populations into account. And so obviously we know that Gauteng and Western Cape, Eastern Cape are the larger provinces. And if we look at the incidents, um, we're taking that population size into account. 
And you can see for most of the provinces, um, on the left is the, is the weekly incidence. You can see that most provinces had a much bigger um, second wave, um, but there were provinces like Free State, which actually had a smaller second wave compared to the first wave. And on the right, you can see the cumulative incidence. So with the Cape, so that means their total incidence over time, you can see the Western Cape is highest there with Mpumalanga and Limpopo um, with a much lower incidence. But once again, this may just be an indication of the testing and the amount of testing that was done rather than um, that Limpopo and Mpumalanga didn't have as big um, of the case incidence. Um, if we look at age and uh, sex distribution of the cases, so in the top left we can have a look at the total numbers um, and you can see that there seems to be more females um, that are um, affected than males, although this can also be related to those that are, are coming forward for testing. And if you look at the bottom, um, you can have a look at the cumulative um, risk, which is the, the incidence. So this is per population. And so you can see there's the sharp increase, very low incidence in those under kind of in the 10 to 14 year of, age, year of age age group, and then slowly increasing from 15 all the way up to um, 50 years of age. And from there, we're getting relatively high incidence um, across those higher age groups. Um, on the right, you can have a look at the weekly incidence in age group. And you can see in that second wave, we really had kind of very high um, second peak in the older age groups. So that's the, the kind of blue and red lines there where we saw a very big um, peak in those over the age of 50. Looking at the testing, I think we've done really well. We've, we've conducted a lot of testing. Our testing capacity has increased, as you can see at the top, a lot more testing in the second wave compared to the first wave. And even between kind of in the post wave period now, the testing is, is higher than it was um, between the first and second wave. We initially started out mainly with um, PCR testing. And then from October last year, um, the rapid antigen tests um, have also been introduced. Um, and so you can see the testing incidence at the bottom with um, very heightened testing during that peak um, of, the, of the second wave and our testing rates have stabilized now, but still um, higher than it was really between um, the first and second waves. So this is looking at hospitalizations to give an indication. So this is more severe disease um, and you can see a lot more hospitalizations in both the public and private sector um, in the second wave. And if you look um, by province, so this is total numbers. So remember, you, you will have more hospitalizations in the bigger provinces, but you can see provinces like um, KZN um, and the Western Cape had a very much higher hospitalizations um, in that second wave. And if we look at deaths, um, so this is uh, reported through our DATCOF system which is monitoring hospitalizations at all public and private hospitals. So these are in hospital deaths only. Once again, you can see much larger um, number of deaths in the second wave compared um, to the first wave. And once again, kind of KZN um, seeing the, the bulk of those um, deaths in the second wave compared to the first wave. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, the variant. So this is a virus and you can get um, a, a different number of variants. Um, and so what we, I'm sure you've all heard about kind of the South African variant, or we prefer to, cause, um, to call it the B1351. And you can see in October last year on the right, um, which was just prior to the, the onset of the second wave, most, the majority of, of um, COVID-19 infections were caused by other variants. So it was the original variant. There were quite a lot of different variants in circulation in the first couple of months um, of the pandemic. And then you can see slowly the new variant, which was the B1351 in the green, um, slowly in November, making up about 60% of the infections. By December, it was 90% of the infections and almost 95% in January. And at the moment, it really is the predominant um, uh, variant which is circulating in South Africa at the moment. And I think quite interesting that um, the mutations that we're seeing in this variant, so that means the places where the virus has actually had the changes, um, is in a part which is on that spike 
um, on the spike of the virus. And this is actually where the mutations um, of other variants like the one from the UK and the one from Brazil have all had changes in that area. And I think it really is showing the virus is quite crafty in terms of trying to make changes in the parts um, of the virus that we're making an immune response to. And so it's possible that we might not be able to um, fight off the new variants as well, but I'll deal a little bit more about that later. Um, I just wanted to kind of now that we've really had a look at epi epidemiologically what's happened over the first and second waves, and now that we're kind of well past the second wave, looking at how we would want to try and detect and respond to any clusters or any future waves. And so the South African COVID-19 modeling consortium has um, put together various resurgence indicators and metrics that we are um, able to have a look at on a daily basis to be able to pick up these clusters. At the NICD, we're also conducting, um, obviously, we maintain the line list, which is the, the listing of all the positive cases. Um, and we also have all the, all the labs send us um, their test results. Um, so we're able to have a look at um, looking at different reporting um, in terms of testing as well as in case numbers. Um, and from the modeling consortium, we're able to look at these resurgence indicators. Um, and so this will be able to tell us which districts and which provinces are seen an increased number number of cases um, and there are various metrics like upticks so we look um, for an increase districts that have an increase um, in case numbers for five days in a row um, and you can see so this is from this week um, where it's showing everything's blue um, usually if there's an uptick it would appear in orange um, and so you're able to have a look at, at whether there are any clusters in any of the districts in South Africa and so this is really just an example on the right and um, these are all the districts in the provinces in South Africa and you can see recently in the Northern Cape we've had quite a few clusters which means that they've gone into response mode which is is kind of the pink um, coloration Free State has also had a few, um, whereas kind of right at the top with Eastern Cape has been, hasn't had any um, clusters or increased case incidents over the last couple of weeks. So I think with this, we're really able to pick up any cases and clusters relatively early. We are alert the um, our provincial epidemiologists who work together with the Department of Health and the districts and sub-districts um, to try and increase testing in those areas um, to try and continue the clusters and so I just wanted to give you an example of that one in the in the northern cape that we've just had so you can see these are all the different types of data that we're able to use um, at the top left we are looking at our at the incidents you can see that they had that very big um, peak in their second wave, but we've had a very um, kind of a smaller peak recently in the last couple of weeks, which was driven mainly by clusters in several of the schools in the Namakwa district. And if you look on the right, that's the, the distribution by age. And you can see in the purple is, is really this kind of peak in the 15 to 19 year age group in the last couple of weeks, which was driven by the school clusters. And so we have information in terms of the number testing positive. We can look, have a look at hospitalizations um, over time to see whether hospitalizations are increased. Um, and those, um, those colored bars at the bottom are really showing us upticks and alert response. Um, so these are the types of metrics we can have a look at in order to, up, um, to detect these clusters so that we can rapidly respond and bring them under control. And so this is a very good example of how this was detected, how the response was put in place and how those numbers have now dropped um, and that they're no longer um, seeing those clusters in that area. So really just to move on to what we think can be the potential drivers of a third wave. I think everyone wants to know exactly when we're getting the third wave and how big the third wave will be. And I think the, real, the answer is, is it depends and we don't have a firm and fixed answer. So one of the things that may contribute to a third wave is in terms of behavior change. Um, so if people are mixing more, if there's more contacts, potentially that can lead to a resurgence. Maybe people don't adhere to the non-pharmaceutical interventions and social distancing. We've had um, the recent Easter period. Um, there's a couple of public holidays coming up. There may have been some large social and religious gatherings that can all play a part in terms of driving um, cases um, up. 
Um, but if we're looking more at behavior change, this is likely to be concentrated probably in subpopulations which didn't have a lot of infection during the first and second waves. Um, and so we're likely to see a, a slow increase. We're likely to see clusters like we saw in the Northern Cape. If there is a large um, kind of social gathering where you've seen a lot of cases, if you have active tracing and tracing of the contacts and isolation, you'll be able to bring those clusters under control. Seasonality is, a, is another potential driver with lots of other respiratory viruses. We see that the winter months tend to increase infection like influenza. We usually see from May to August. And this is really because people might be more susceptible. They might have other infections. It's cold, so people want to stay indoors. They don't want to open their windows. And so there's more chance of the viruses spreading. Um, and it's possible that, you know, as the pandemic unfolds um, and, and more and more people can become immune, that, that really SARS-CoV-2 will become a seasonal virus just like flu. Um, but at this stage, we're likely, um, with the coming of winter, we may be seeing um, increased infections once again in the sub populations that weren't really affected in the first and second waves um, amongst those maybe pockets that aren't immune um, and so a lot of this is also driven and links in with the behavior where people might be much less likely to do things outdoors. The other thing that can drive a third wave is um, obviously the mutation of the virus. So if we have a new variant that, you know, really is able to escape our immune system and cause reinfection, so that means that even though we've had an infection before, um, that the new variant would be able to cause infection again and that our immune system wouldn't be able to deal with it. This could actually be the one scenario which can lead to large and rapid resurgences. And that was really what we saw with the second wave because that was in the middle of summer so seasonality wasn't an issue um, and it was really the new variant that drove a lot of the the second wave and and that we saw such a big um, and quick second wave if the variant is really just more transmissible we might not see such a, a big increase or a big um, surge in infections because you'd still have lots of people that had been exposed to to the older variants and would have immunity and so if they also have immunity to any new variant, you would still see these kind of resurgences in populations um, that were spared in the first and second wave, um, rather than seeing this big kind of um, third wave as we saw with the second wave. But it's really difficult to predict what the virus is going to do. And so at the moment, we're, we've got surveillance where we're able to have a look at how, um, you know, we, we test uh, the samples from the clusters to make sure um, we can detect any new variant early. And then you're able to, to test that against um, people's um, blood and to check whether they would be immune to the new variant. The other thing that might drive a third wave is waning immunity. So this is more a long-term um, driver of infection. We don't know how long the immunity to COVID-19 lasts. Um, with other coronaviruses, we know that, you know, the immunity doesn't have, you know, you don't have lifelong immunity like some of the other viruses like measles. So it may be that with time, people's immunity will wane and you may have um, kind of increasing case numbers again. So really just to look at what our best approach to controlling the pandemic is, and this is really through vaccination and it's the way that we've controlled so many other diseases like measles and polio has been through vaccination. And what we're really trying to do with vaccines is to help our bodies develop immunity to the virus without us actually getting ill. And we, there's, very, there's lots of different types of, of um, vaccines against COVID-19. There's actually, I think, more than 200 vaccines in the pipeline. Several have gone into kind of phase three clinical trials and some have been licensed um, for use. Um, and what we really want to do is produce antibodies and these memory cells, which will be able to remember long afterwards um, how to fight that virus if it ex is exposed to it in the future. But it does take a few weeks after vaccination for the body to produce these antibodies. And we can look at some of the short term um, benefits. So right now, by vaccinating healthcare workers, we're trying to decrease severe disease in those at risk. OK, so you want to vaccinate healthcare workers, you want to vaccinate the elderly, those that have other conditions like diabetes, obesity, hypertension, who seem to be at higher risk. And so you're protecting individuals. 
But in the long term, we want to be able to protect the communities. And, and this is where herd immunity comes into play, where if, if you have enough immune people, they will be able to protect those that are not yet immune. Um, just a quick note on a couple of the different vaccines. I'm sure you have seen in the media that you have the message RNA vaccines, where actually you're taking in some of the virus, um, viral material and the DNA into our cells, and that we're able to make that protein, and then the body sees that protein and will make antibodies. There are some protein subunit vaccines where there's kind of harmless pieces of the vaccine, which also our immune system sees and mounts an immune response. And then there are vector vaccines. So this really means we're taking a different virus, latching on a little bit of the, of the SARS-CoV-2 virus onto that. Um, and then it's taken into our cells and once again produces the protein. So in all of these, you're producing a protein, which our body is going to see as foreign, and then it mounts an immune response. These are the vaccines really just to, as I said, there are many in the pipelines and there are several others. I'm not going to mention all of them here, but I think at the moment, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is, is a viral vector vaccine. And this is a single dose. It's shown to be effective, effective against the variant that's circulating in the mo at the moment, can be stored in the fridge and has, is, actually has the potential to be manufactured in South Africa. And currently, this is what has been used to vaccinate healthcare workers as part of the Sazonke study. So this is actually a, a, a phase three study. Um, uh, so it's not yet registered, this vaccine in um, South Africa. So it's registered for use for, for um, actually under this this open label study where they'll be giving uh, 500,000 doses to healthcare workers. And then this vaccine, we will secure additional doses once the vaccine's license to roll out into the national program. We'll also be securing doses of the Pfizer vaccine. This is two doses, which is given three weeks apart and needs to be stored at minus 70 degrees. Um, so you can really see that there are, um, there may be kind of implementational issues. It's much easier to give a single dose vaccine because you don't have to have everyone come back for another dose. Because you can imagine if you vaccinate 100,000 people in three weeks time, those people will be coming back for their second dose. So it does limit the amount of vaccines of people that you can vaccinate within a given time. Also, the storage conditions, it's much easier to store, to have a vaccine that can be stored in the refrigerator rather than one that needs to be stored um, kind of as at, at minus 70 degrees because there aren't a lot of those big freezers available. So I just wanted to give a note on the AstraZeneca vaccine. So this was the vaccine that was brought into the country in February. Um, and soon after that, we uh, saw the results of the study that it was not effective against mild disease um, and that it wasn't as effective against the variant. And so the decision was made not, not to use the vaccine. There's also been some adverse events reported in Europe, which are being investigated. Um, and so at this stage, we won't be going ahead with using this vaccine. Really just quickly on the vaccine rollout, this is what um, the planned rollout is to first go into healthcare workers, which is currently underway, then moving into those at highest risk, and then in phase three, um, going to the rest of the population. And everyone will be required to register via this electronic uh, vaccine um, data system. Um, which is shown there. And eventually, although now we are vaccinating in health facilities, eventually once we get to um, vaccinating in the routine um, vaccination programs, you'll be able to vaccinate potentially at community halls, at schools, and vaccine will be easily accessible. So really just to wrap up, we've learned many lessons um, and made a lot of progress since the start of the pandemic. Um, Really, COVID-19 is not going away. We'll be continuing to see the circulating eventually. You know, it will be part of our, our respiratory viruses that we see every year. Presently, what we're seeing is a lot of small clusters. Overall numbers are low and the clusters seem to pop up and um, there's a good response and these numbers are brought under control. There is the potential of the third wave. We've discussed the various drivers and the different scenarios and really we can't give a fixed date for when this will happen. And really that vaccination is going to be the way to control this pandemic, but it will take time to reach herd immunity where we need to vaccinate at least kind of 60 to 70% of the, of the population. And so in the interim, 
What we have left is really adherence to social distancing, wearing of masks and other non-pharmaceutical interventions, um, hand washing, hygiene, and this is really the way to, to really limit the impact of further waves um, until we can vaccinate enough of our population. Thanks very much and just to acknowledge the team and everyone um, and I'm happy to take any questions. <music>
um, as mentioned, as mentioned, we are now going to talk the year of security culture, uh, having thanked Dr. Groom for her presentation, which was very informative. The year of security culture will be spoken to by Mr. Sylvain Lefoyer, the Deputy Director responsible for aviation security and facilitation at ICAO. Mr. Lefoyer, it's over to you to talk to us about 2021, the year of security culture. I can hear you, sir. Hear you, sir. Perfect. Thank you very much. So if you allow me, I will share my screen and go to the presentation. Okay. Here it is. So, um, thank you very much. Good afternoon uh, to everybody. Uh, I know it's the afternoon in South Africa. It's uh, still the early morning in Montreal. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, change a little bit the topic from this morning session that were uh, oriented on the COVID and the aftermath of uh, COVID-19. Uh, we intend to present here the, the initiative that was launched by states during the last assembly of uh, ICAO uh, to dedicate a year on security culture, specifically uh, in aviation. So I will go down the slides. You have already been presented, so I will skip this one. Uh, uh, just a few words on ICAO. Even if my director, Mr. Mohamed Hama, already spoke this morning, uh, he was speaking about uh, uh, COVID-19. I will just recap here uh, in a few words what ICAO is. Uh, it's a United Nations specialized agency created in 1947 after the signature of the Chicago Convention in 1944. A uh, strong of 193 member states. Uh, this is organized with an assembly, a meeting every three years, uh, a council, permanent council, in which South Africa is represented. 36 uh, member states only in the council. Uh, the council meets three times a year in order to uh, decide on new standards, recommended practices, and guide the organization. And this council is supported by the Air Navigation Commission, dealing with safety issues, and some committees, uh, in particular the Air Transport Committee and the Unlawful Interference Committee, dealing with aviation security. And all these uh, entities are supported by the Secretariat in which I am. ICAO is issuing legal instruments, conventions, protocols, resolutions, but also standards and recommended practices. So these standards are mandatory for states to apply and are addressed to states. In addition, ICAO is auditing the way states are implementing these standards and providing assistance, training and capacity building to states to help them implement these standards. Today, two annexes. Annexes are documents that gather standards by theme or domain. Uh, two of them are dedicated on Facilitation, Annex 9. Uh, you've heard a lot about facilitation in health issues this morning, but facilitation also cover, covers border management, including border security. And there is also Annex 17, Annex 17 dedicated to specifically aviation security, so protecting aviation against acts of unlawful interference. In aviation security, there are a couple of documents supporting states. The standards are grouped in the Annex 17. Uh, the audit program, in order to assess how states are implementing the, the standards. And an assistance and capacity building program. There is also the, uh, you, you can see on the, on the slide, the uh, aviation security manual. This is, uh, or the guidance we provide for states to understand how they can implement the different standards in aviation security. Uh, in addition to this uh, manual and all the documents I've already presented, there is the Global Aviation Security Plan. Global Aviation Security Plan is a 
toolkit to help states identify what they have to do, how they can do it, and how they can prioritize uh, their action in order to improve the way they implement aviation security. This global aviation security plan uh, is uh, built on five pillars, five priority objectives. One of them being develop security culture and human capability. And that's precisely what I'm talking about today. Secret, what is security culture? Security culture is culture. Uh, a set of norms, beliefs, values, attitudes, and assumptions that are inherent in the daily operation of an organization and are reflected by the actions and behaviors of all entities and personnel within the organization. All personnel meaning from the C-level, so chief executive officers, leaders, down to the field personnel. Everybody has to be involved. There is a, a long history in aviation of safety culture. We try to build on this experience and this uh, use of security, safety culture in order to develop the same in, secu in security. Security is uh, all, most of the time seen as a constraint in the aviation world. But we want to try, we want to change this this uh, perception and to make security the part of the DNA of the aviation uh, community at the same level as safety. So the year of security culture decided by the assembly in 2019 was supposed to be in 2020. But uh, as you've heard this morning, 2020 was pretty busy with COVID-19 and uh, the ITO Council uh, approved the postponement of this year of security culture to 2021. So there was an official launch of this year of security culture during the Aviation Security Global Symposium uh, in December 2020. So the objectives of this uh, initiative are to encourage the aviation industry to think and act in a security conscious manner at the same level as it is done in safety, to raise security awareness in aviation operations, achieving balance of safety, security, facilitation, and the passenger experience. The idea is not to um, increase the burden on the passengers, but to, to make sure that even the passengers is acting in a security conscious manner. So the motto of this Initiative is security is everyone's responsibility. Security is not only in the hands of the security personnel in the airports, of the authorities, security is in the hands of everyone. So what does HiKeo do to support this initiative? Actually, we, we have launched, uh, produced a lot of material that are accessible on the the ITO Security Culture website. There are, uh, this is a communication campaign, actually. We have uh, produced articles, uh, we have a lot of guidance, toolkits, videos, and, and the videos are not only coming from ITO. We are sharing initiatives that are conducted by states and international, other international organizations and our partners, ACI and, and IATA. And, and these videos are accessible on our website. So you can have videos coming from China, from uh, every part of the world, where they showcase how, what is security culture in their country, in their airports, and how they implement it. Uh, there is a, there are training, training material, uh, security culture workshop. We have a lot of uh, shareable resources where you can, that you can find on the website and you can customize your signature block in your emails, uh, PowerPoint and uh, things like that in, in order to promote this year of security culture. So global, global efforts are not only from IKEA. Uh, we are leading this campaign from headquarters. We are relaying this campaign with the regional offices that are supporting states in the seven ITO regions. And we are, as I said already, promoting and highlighting initiatives that are done by entities, uh, private entities, airports, airlines, and uh, states. 
and we are gathering all this material on our website. So, what are the practical tools that we are proposing for states to consider and to, to implement uh, should they wish to do something on security culture? Actually, uh, we, we propose high level endorsement of policies and procedures in order to uh, explain uh, in each entity what security culture means. And, and when I say security culture, it's Globally speaking, uh, we are not limited to physical aviation security in the airports. We are also referring to cyber security. Cyber security is uh, raising a uh, concern in uh, aviation and we, we want to address this. And say cyber security culture is even more important than security culture because uh, cyber, the threats can come from everywhere and everybody can do his part in order to protect the global, uh, the global sector from, from this field. And we also talk about border security. So aviation security, cyber security, border security. In each of these areas, security culture is very important to, to address. And to, uh, so I, I will not go through the all points of this slide because you can, you can read it and I will ask the, the organizer to, to share my presentation with you. Uh, I just invite you to go uh, to the IQ website. We have a dedicated page on the year of security culture where you will find all the materials. You will find a lot of very practical tools and uh, elements to support your uh, actions in security culture raising. And you will also have this a very, very interesting uh, video. We, we have a, a, a video channel, uh, IQ TV, uh, where you can uh, watch a lot of very interesting videos where states or an airline showcase what does uh, security culture mean, how they implement it, how, what are the initiatives they, they take in order to develop this security culture. So, Thank you. I hope I was not too, uh, too fast. Uh, I know that uh, you, you've been uh, uh, over uh, the, the time that was uh, allocated this morning because there was a lot of interesting discussion, questions and answers. So thank you for listening to me. Now I will uh, hand over the floor to uh, your friend Guyo. Uh, I think he may have something to, to tell you about. Uh, security culture in South Africa. So I will now stop sharing my screen. Back to you, Lugoyo. Thank you. Okay. Just want to make sure that I'm on. Mr. Lefoyer, we really appreciated that presentation. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we wanted to hear from I was going to say the horse's mouth, but Sylvain is my friend, so I won't say that. We wanted to hear it directly from Ikeo. This is what we're going to be promoting and pushing this year, the year of security culture. I see I've got a comment here from Kau, uh, Aviation Safety and AFSAF begins on the ground where secure operation why is AFSEC viewed as a constraint and not an assurance tool that provides safety? Why is the constraint dogma perpetuated? Thank you, Kao. I think that's a question we all need to be asking ourselves if we still view security that way. And as uh, Sylvain pointed out, it's everybody's business. And we will be doing initiatives throughout the year where we will be promoting security culture. And then uh, we will share those immediately after the conference in the days and weeks to come. And we expect everybody to participate. We expect, as Sylvain said, you to share what initiatives are you doing in your organization and or entity to promote security culture. As Mr. Morris says, that it is, a, it is not a constraint, 
but it is an assurance tool. So, Sylvana, thank you very much for sharing that with us. And we are looking forward to the initiatives that we will be doing as South Africa. And we will be posting some on the IK website as well as we continue to promote security culture this year in 2021 and going forward. Ladies and gentlemen, seeing that I don't have any other questions on the chat line, uh, we will break now for lunch. And I think because it's 13.01, let's be back at 13.30. So I've reduced your lunch by one minute. Uh, to 13.30 and then we can start again with our problem, uh, sorry, program. Enjoy your lunch. Thank you.
and you would have noted that in the goodness of my heart I gave you the full 30 minutes so I hope you enjoyed your lunch and if you're not finished feel free to bring your food into the conference room it's okay I'm a bit easy today now we move from a subject close to my heart and a subject not so close we're going to talk about accidents and incidents and to do that I'm going to invite Mr. Peter Mashaba the gentleman responsible, not for accidents and incidents, but for their investigation. Mr. Mashaba is going to focus on the causal factors. Over to you, Mr. Mashaba, sir. Uh, good afternoon, uh, aviation uh, colleagues and friends. Uh, allow me, my name is Peter Mashaba, as per the program director. Uh, thank you, program director, for uh, bringing me into this uh, space. Uh, firstly, let me acknowledge the Minister of Transport and the Deputy Minister of Transport, uh, the Director of Civil Aviation, and the CEOs of various entities, and aviation colleagues and friends, and all protocols observed. Uh, this is going to be the flight path in the next 30 minutes that we have. I'm not going to go through the flight path, but this is just the indication in terms of where we're going to make our tents and where we're going to reduce our altitude and up to where we're going to land. Uh, a lot has been said, I'm not going to repeat in terms of uh, the COVID, the impact of it. Now we're going to also look in terms of how did the COVID impact in terms of aircraft accident. We know that during the COVID restrictions, this led to uh, flying activities being restricted. As a result, there was less activity uh, during the current financial year that ended in the 31st of March, 2020. Before we get into the statistics, uh, the focus of today is that let's focus on the causal factors of accidents. Now, the first picture indicated that this accident occurred as a result of hard landing due to loss of control. The pilot lost the control of the helicopter. As a result, that's what happened to the helicopter. The second one we can see is a runway incursion. Again, it's one of the top 10, it's among the top 10 causal factors. We can see that should this have happened in a busy runway, this could have been a very serious accident that could have happened at that specific airport. But lucky enough, this happened in an airport whereby when the aircraft veered to the left, then it ended up in the bush. The third one, improper maintenance servicing. This resulted in the damage of the aircraft uh, engine in the turbine uh, blades area. And this was as a result of uh, improper maintenance. Again, the fourth uh, causal factor, uh, failing to, to maintain a flying speed as a result, the aircraft stalled. As you can see, this happened on a training flight. And I think it's important to indicate that in one financial year, we had three similar uh, accidents whereby the aircraft entered into a stall and entered into a spiral dive, which resulted all three of them in a fatal accident. Uh, last but not the least, a fuel-related causal factor. Again, the crew forgot uh, the cross feed on one to feed both engines from one engine, which was a right-hand engine. As a result, the fuel on the right-hand engine ran out, and that led to the accident that we see on the screen. Now, that was to give a picture in terms of what happens when these causal factors, what is the result? What happened to the uh, aircraft? As you will see, some of those accidents resulted in a fatal accident, which result in fatalities. Now, let's focus on the statistics. Now, if we look at a three-year comparison of accidents between 2018-19 to 2021, three-year comparison of these three financial years, we can see that uh, if we look at the month of April, the, there was nothing that happened in the month of April. Then we can see in the month of May, 
the, we begin to have accident that's happening. The green refers to the current financial year that ended the 31st of March 2021, so that you can follow me. Then we can see accident increasing in the month of June. Now, let's look back in April. In April, there were no accidents that happened. A simple reason to that is that there was no flying activity due to the restrictions of the lockdown. Now, that tells us that if aircraft are not flying, we'll have zero accidents. But that's not a desired outcome of taking the high number of accidents. As the DCA indicated, that we will need to require to put measures in place. As we know, aviation play a major role in terms of the life of the people. Now, we start seeing a jump in the month of June and again in the month of August. As the lockdown restrictions were being relaxed, there was now more activities that's happening and that is reflected in terms of the number of accidents, how they have increased from the month of May we look in the month of July and the month of August. Again, we see the very same thing appearing again in the month of January and the month of March, where we've got a high number of accidents. Now, in a nutshell, if we look at the three comparison of these three financial year, the accident numbers have reduced by 4%. However, before we say we have done a great job in reducing the number of accident. Let's look at the accident rate. Now, the accident rate gives us a different picture. The accident rate says if we take 10,000 hours of operation in 2019 and 10,000 hours of operation in 2020-2021 uh, financial year, where now we put the same barometer to measure this accident rate, it says in 2019-20, we had, we had an estimate of having two accidents in 10,000 hours of operation. However, in the current financial year, we had 14.8 possibility of accident for the same number of hours. Now, what does that tell us? It says that we had less aircraft operation, but we still had a high number even though the number compared to the previous financial year is still less, but if we look at the number of uh, activity and the hours operated, our accident rate is very high, which is of a concern. If we look at now the number of fatal accidents, although the number, the number of accidents have reduced, now let's look at the number of fatal accidents. Number of fatal accidents increased by 23%. Again, a call for concern, because fatal accident talk to people have lost lives. So we had an increase of 23% when we look at the number of fatal accidents. Again, if we had to compare the number of fatalities in these three financial years, previous three financial years, including 2020 and 2021, you will see that the number of fatalities has increased by 21%. And we all know that the, num the, the number of fatalities is driven by the number of people that have been carried on board the aircraft that is involved in an accident. Unfortunately, one of the major contributors into this 21% is an accident that we had in KZN, the Netcare helicopter whereby we had five souls on board, and unfortunately, we lost all five souls on board. Now, aircrafts operate in different categories. There's training flights, there's airline uh, operation, there's commercial, there's general aviation, there's non-type certificated aircraft operating. Now, we need to summarize that to see during the 2020-21 financial year, if we look at the breakdown of accident recorded, indicates that 34% were attributed to non-type certificated aircraft. Now, uh, aviation training organization contributed 24%. And in general aviation, we had uh, uh, 13% and in agricultural operation. However, I want to invite you to a further analysis whereby we compare 2019-20 financial year and 2020-21 financial year. If we look at the further analysis, we compare the two financial years, we'll see that agricultural operation increased by 18%. 
Now, there were three categories that went down, which was aviation training organization that went down by 15%, and general aviation operating uh, flight rules went down by 16%, and operation of non-type certificated aircraft went down by 14%. Now, let's look at where in terms of this aircraft operating category, these fatal accidents happen. We can see that an increase in the number of fatal accidents were recorded or were noted in the ag agricultural uh, and general aviation and a training uh, organization. Those are the three main categories that dominate the areas whereby we experience fatal accidents. Again, it's an of interest to look at where in the province, which provinces are all these accidents happening. Again, uh, we can see that Houteng uh, province top in terms of the 30%, it contributes 30% in terms of where these accidents happen in terms of the provinces. And of course, followed by uh, Mpumalanga, uh, Free State, uh, etc., KZN, and, and Limpopo. Uh, of interest as well is to look at at what stage of a flight these accidents happen, uh, which we refer to what phase of a flight these accidents happen. Now, the slides before us indicate that most accidents happened in, during landing and happened during uh, in flight. Now, that is one area uh, which also uh, is quite important to mention that we had a recent accident, although the aircraft was operated under the military. The accident happened during landing. Now, this picture confirms that most of the accidents occur when the aircraft is prepared or is being uh, prepared to come and land. In, when we started this presentation, we started with uh, the top 10 causal factors with the pictures that indicate that. Now, this is to give you a bigger picture of where those things come from. We can see, if we look at the bottom here, the most contributory contr uh, uh, causal factor is a loss of directional or log 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 longitudinal control uh, on takeoff. When the aircraft is prepared to take off, uh, the pilot loses direction and therefore results in an accident or an incident. Again, we can see what comes again top, fuel starvation. That it's again come on top as one of the main contributory or causal factors of the accident. Again, we see that collision with object on the ground. It also contributes into that. And lastly, loss of control, whereby the, the aircraft was flying, the, the, the pilot was flying, all of a sudden something happens that lead to the pilot losing the control of the aircraft, which as a result, results in an accident. Now, we also further analyze to look at the people that operate this aircraft that were involved in an accident. What type of the license have they been issued? Now, most accident pilots were the holders of commercial pilot license, which we refer to as a CPL and which contributed 33%, followed by private pilot license, which we refer to as a PPL, which contributed 30% out of all the accidents that happened in the financial year 2020-21. Now, if we look at the comparison of serious incidents, now these are the occurrences that happen that give you an indication that if something is not being done, uh, we've got an accident waiting. Now, it's very important also that we focus in terms of uh, what's happening in terms of the serious incident. Now, if you look in terms of the serious incident, you look at the three past financial years, you can see that we have a 45% decline in the financial year 2020-21 if we compare it to the previous financial year. Once again, among others, the lockdown regulations or during the COVID time, further contributed as 
we know up to today that there are certain airlines that have not returned into operation as such. And as most of serious incidents happen at the airline environment. Now, if you look at the serious incident per operation in the last three financial years, we can see that uh, most accident, uh, serious incident, uh, serious incident came from the aviation training organization and followed by general aviation. And of course, thirdly, air transport, whereby we've got large aircraft. Now, this slides in terms of now the serious incident top 10 causal factors. You can see it paints a similar picture, and I would not like to spend much time on it. You can see the main contributor, again, once again, loss of directional control on takeoff or during landing. And therefore, I would like to move to the next slide. Now, let's look at the incidents. When incidents happen per operation category, comparison in the three financial years. Most incidents, of course, happen in an, in an airline environment. Uh, normally in the general aviation, when you've got an incident, it results most of the time in an accident. We can see that airline operations contributed 46% of all the incidents that were recorded, followed by uh, private operations, where this is category we refer to as general aviation, which contributed 37%. And of course, we've got 8% and 9%, uh, which respectively come from commercial operations and training operations. Now, incident uh, events, where these incidents happen, we can see that if we look at the breakdown events of these categories, where these incidents happen, uh, you will see that the majority of this is environmental, environmental relating to a uh, best strike, weather, interference with the aircraft, where people uh, use laser to blind the pilots flying, so that is what is referred to as environmental. Of course, followed by operational and technical uh, defect. Now, what are the common causes of this incident? We can see that the majority of uh, what you call uh, the contributory factors in terms of uh, top 10 incidents, it's not adhering, unlawful interference, not adhering, disregard, uh, as you can see here, the majority of it is disregard of the safe standard I mean, operating procedures. Of course, followed by weather contributing into that, and we've got a bad strike, uh, which is also part of uh, weather. Now, let's get to the next slide, which then reflects on the drones. This is a new technology uh, that we have to embrace into the aviation industry. Now, once again, we can see that if we look at the three-year comparison, for the current financial year, we recorded 13 events of drone involvement uh, in terms of where there was a drone close to an aircraft operation. And if we look at comparing that with the previous financial year, where we had 65 events that were recorded, once again, there was less activity in the financial year 2020-21. I spoke about laser activities. We can see again in financial year 2021, if we look at, we recorded 40 laser activities compared to 196 laser activities in the financial year 2019-20. Once again, it's because lasers are being used to point the aircraft uh, as they operate. If there's less aircraft or no aircraft operating, there's no laser to point to. Now, investigation is good to establish uh, what caused the accident. But what is more important that follows that is that have we learned something that we can use to prevent the accident happen? And that is what we call safety recommendations. Now, this is to give a snapshot in terms of uh, what safety recommendations have been issued and how many accident, I mean, safety recommendations have been issued. Of importance, safety recommendations are issued not to apportion a blame or liability, but it's a means or one of the tools that is being used to prevent 
future accidents from happening. We can see that in this current financial year, uh, if we look at, we had 263 accidents and 138 uh, uh, serious incidents recorded. And as a result of that, we issued 62 safety recommendations pertaining to, uh, pertaining to the investigations conducted in terms of their CAIO requirements and XTT. Furthermore, 30 safety messages have been used. Now, what we refer to 30 safety messages? Now, safety message refers to that there is enough controls in place to prevent an accident happen. And therefore, the safety message is to reiterate that to the flying public, that if the crew or the maintenance personnel have followed what already exists, this accident or serious incident could have been prevented. And hence we refer to that as a safety message, to reiterate already what exists to prevent an accident from happening. Now, this is the addressee in terms of how we have issued the safety recommendations. Now, we can see that most safety recommendations have been recommended to the State Civil Aviation Authority. Uh, among others is to relook into the, in terms of the regulations. Among others is to look into the training program that they expect aviation training schools to comply to. And you can see that some safety recommendations have been issued to the aircraft operators, some have been issued to aircraft maintenance organizations, some have been issued to the aircraft uh, manufacturers, uh, as you can see on, on the screen. And that should bring me to the end of the presentation. I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mashaba. Thank you, Mr. Mashaba, for that presentation. And we learned a lot about what are the causal factors of incidents and accidents. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you'll agree with me, we've discovered the new weatherman. So if you've got contacts in the TV arena, please let us know. We will not be taking questions for Mr. Mashaba at this point in time, but after the next presentation, we'll be should be given by Mr. Dilange. We will then take questions for Mr. Mashaba because the two are related and are linked. Mr. Dilange will be talking about the general aviation strategy addressing the underlying factors in accident causation. Over to you, Mr. Dilange. Thank you, Program Director. Good afternoon, Minister of Transport. Uh, Chairperson of the Board of the Civil Aviation Authority, the DCA, international colleagues, colleagues from the CAA, leaders and uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's quite sobering having listened to the presentation from AIID and uh, the large number of accidents that we are experiencing in general aviation. We need to come up with a concerted effort in order to address these and the general aviation safety strategy is that effort. This is a long-term plan that we hope to implement that will reduce the number of accidents and make our skies safer, while at the same time also develop our industry. Searching for these answers sometimes lead us to some introspection. And finding these two quotes probably illustrates the level and the depth of what we need to do when we consider honest and truthful search for solutions. Most accidents originate in actions committed by reasonable, rational individuals who were acting to achieve an assigned task in what they perceive to be a responsible and professional manner. Ponder about that for a moment. Nobody plans to make an accident. And another one, it is too easy to read accidents reports and to quickly blame the pilot. We must remember that flying is complex and there are few solid bright lines of right or wrong. As investigators and managers, we should strive to understand and improve the systems and as pilots not dismiss accidents and incident reports as bad apples or weak sticks, 
but have an open mind and resolve to make our own personal safety systems better. I think that paints the picture for w this presentation today. We will be looking at the establishment of the General Aviation Safety Strategy, the establishment of the focus groups, progress made so far with the implementation, issuing of the first edition of the Skywatch uh, publication and the implementation of the outputs for year two, which started now in April 2021. Membership of the focus groups and uh, of course then conclusion. How do we use the little time we have most effectively to demonstrate the contents of the strategy? I've selected a couple of quotes out of the strategy document and would like to just present them as a brief overview. Reducing the number of GA accidents is a national, regional and international imperative with due consideration of the sovereignty of other ICAO contracting states as South African aircraft operate and become involved in accidents in other regions, sometimes with high fatalities per accident. Another quote, incorporating the CFAP and Ghazi additional internal and external consultations. The CFAP was a program that we used to run a couple of years ago, which was called the Cross-Functional Accident Reduction Program. And the Ghazi is the General Aviation Safety Initiative. And all of these items were brought into the development together with further consultation, both internally and externally. That has led us to the multifaceted, multidisciplinary and integrated effort that would be vital for us to achieve in getting our accident uh, statistics down. Only an all-out sustained and concerted effort supported with the necessary resources and buy-in from all stakeholders would ensure the sustained success. And then most importantly, stakeholders would cooperate in all the required areas under the CAA guidance and leadership. And this was in fact something that came from the industry to say, guys, we will participate. We will do what we need to do, but we need somebody to walk in front to carry the flag and to make this possible. And I think perhaps the last uh, important quote here would be to identify and address the underlying precipitating factors that lead to GA accidents. Here we're not necessarily just looking at the causal factors, but we're looking at what has led to these accidents developing. What has gone on behind the scenes? Why has, has the system failed? The best way to implement this rather complex strategy was to break up the 20 deliverables, the 20 outputs that the, uh, that the document concludes with into seven focus areas or focus groups. These focus groups all plug into a central working group and that working group will take care of coordination and reporting up to the, uh, the executive and the board. So the first one of these focus groups is strength monitoring and the research. These guys are looking at trend predictions and taking data and converting it into information and converting that into messages that we will then take to the industry in order to save lives. Dedicated research will have to be done into the underlying factors, the so-called etiologies of aircraft accidents to determine exactly what led to the pilot doing what he did or the maintenance personnel not doing what they were supposed to do that eventually culminated in an accident. Another focus group is the safety outreach focus group. Being here with you today is an example of the work of the safety focus, uh, the safety focus group outreach. They're also looking at a dedicated publication. We'll talk about that in a moment. And that publication will carry messages that uh, transports the message of safety and the progress that is being made with the program. The gas must be highly visible to the public and the aviation participants alike. And a distinct identity must be cultivated in order for us to buy into this program. The message of commitment to safety and the reduction of accidents must be clear. A biannual National Aviation Accident Reduction Week is being planned and this is a function where we hope to get as many participants around on the same venue on a weekend and talk about safety related matters, talk about progress, technology and everything that binds us together in this environment. 
Then we have a devolution of powers, a recently established focus group that will create a framework for the devolution of powers. What is this? The CAA is looking at expanding its footprint in the industry to have more eyes and ears that will be able to plug into the authority and carry the safety message. It may be necessary to revise the regulatory framework in order for us to be able to rely on these uh, experts plugging into the system. It will no doubt have an impact on the community responsibility. You cannot simply just take a piece of sky and go and have your fun and not be responsible about how you do this. The CAA can also at the same time not be everywhere at the same time. So this is uh, an, a, an initiative to be able to create a framework where we can, we can devolve those powers. When we're looking at RPAS, drones has become a discussion topic of note. There's more and more of this technology is developing at a rapid pace. And these guys are flying in the airspace normally used only by general aviation. We've had a number of reports of near misses uh, in the last couple of months, even around Johannesburg. How do we make sure that we separate and know about these drones being in, in the general aviation airspace? We need to reduce the threat that these drones may be posing to general aviation. This focus group will be uh, launched in 20, uh, 2023 and uh, they will then commence with their work. Developing general aviation. Here we need to develop a plan and implement it for growth and safety. This initiative actually springs from the uh, national civil aviation policy that speaks to the development of re recreational and general aviation. It specifically mentions adventure flying, the positive development of pilots and technical staff. That also means training in every area. Administrative support to industry with regard to service delivery. All of this will create the framework for us to develop aviation on a sustainable basis. Medical support. It might look like a very short focus group function, but in, in fact quite a complex one. Develop and implement a system of support to dames, designated aviation medical examiners and pilots alike. To give that support and make sure that the integrity is in place for purposes of um, the, the certification issued by these dames. The, the integrity of the system needs to be kept in place and at the same time we need to make sure that we have a larger access for pilots for all their purposes that relate to medical. Then the last focus group that we share here is the GARS, the General Aviation Accident Reduction Seminars. Probably one of the key elements of the successful implementation of the strategy is the GARS. The development and the implementation of accident redu reduction seminars. Read this together with the development of educational guidance material. How do we bring this to the attention of all the pilots, young and, and old, that they need to be cognizant of the elements, that they need to understand their own limitations on a frequent basis? We read that with establishing a competent and suitable GAS presenter team. We need to get, we need to get feet out, presenters out there, well-known names and individuals that can take this message forward. Oversee and monitor the GAS. Obviously, we need to make sure that the, the content is delivered in, in, a, in a consistent fashion uh, to all of the people out there. And then also, as far as training is concerned, we need to look at the revision of perhaps the IR syllabus. There may be others. And this focus group will focus their attention on the development of this particular area. So once these focus groups, and as they get along with their work, and as they make their various progress, they plug, as I said earlier, into this work group that coordinate all of this and translates this into reports that is escalated up to the executive. Perhaps we can just spend a moment and look at what has been implemented thus far. In October last year, We've implemented the reporting structure, the GARP, and the work group was established. In December, the issuing of the gas update was the first publication that was issued. Just to bring the industry up to date, many of you may have seen that. In January of this year, we established the safety outreach focus group. This is already 
the result of the work done by this outreach group. February, they established the Trend Monitoring Focus Group. They're already in the process of getting the data together. In March 2021, the devolution of our power focus group. This is just a late, as late as last month. Here's a picture of the Skywatch that was uh, published now in March, the first edition, and we hope to do this every second month. The next one is due in May. So the implementation plan for the remainder of this year, or year two in terms of the implementation plan, is to establish the focus group for the continued support of safety presentations, development of growth for GA, the focus group for GA accident reduction, the seminars as we've just discussed, including the educational guidance material, and then the focus group for the RPAS, the drone focus group, will be established in this year. Membership of the focus group, we're incredibly privileged to have fantastic people on this focus group. People from all over South Africa that now contribute because of technology has made it possible for us to have magnificent participation. We we'll also have a large number of CAA staff that participate in these focus groups. And of course, the first order of all meetings would be to lay down the ground rules, to accept the terms of uh, reference, as well as uh, appoint the secretariat and do the planning from there. Now, further participation, uh, I think, is in incredibly important. This is not a closed process. Anyone is still welcome to join us. We have the forms, the nomination forms available. You can contact durante at ca.co.za to submit any further nomination forms. And we really implore people to participate and to share their ideas and visions as we take this pro program forward. I think perhaps in conclusion, it needs to be said that this strategy is a concerted effort to bring about improved safety in general aviation. The success and implementation of this plan relies on everybody. And it relies on your continued commitment. With that, Program Director, I thank you. Nothing to do. We would like to render him redundant. Now, I've got a few questions for the two gentlemen that just gave the two presentations. Uh, I've got four. Mr. Dilanga, I know you were talking to general aviation, but maybe you can help us with the first question. What is the SACAR doing to ensure state-owned airlines are operating safely? Uh, Mr. Mashaba, are serious incidents based only on reports by pilots, or do they include also ATC reports and other reports and other sources? And then one you can both look into. Um, would you agree that the quest remains to establish why these causal, causal factors continue to fill the statistics at all cost? And if you can take those for now, I've got others that I'll put you through now. Thank you, Program Director. Um, I think the first question is a, a broadly asked question uh, relating to state-owned airlines. Uh, the Civil Aviation Authority has a very rigorous and uh, comprehensive master oversight and surveillance plan in place. And the uh, cool. Flight Operation Department uh, has all the duties and all the wherewithal in place to deal with all the oversight related issues and I can assure you uh, they will leave no stern unturned uh, to ensure uh, safety not only for state-owned airlines but for all airlines and for all commercial operators um, within uh, the South African approval context. Thank you. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Program Director. Uh, I'll first attempt to respond to the first question asked whether the serious incident report are only from operators. Maybe let me give the categories where we receive uh, this report. We receive reports from operators, airliners, aircraft owners, aircraft operators. 
It might be a, a, an individual person owning an aeroplane where they experience a serious incident. They are obligated in terms of the Civil Aviation Regulations Part 12 to report such an occurrence to Accident Investigation Division. Uh, also, we do receive uh, serious incidents from air traffic navigation services because some of these things happen in flight whereby the pilot will report to the air traffic navigation services in terms of some of the challenges they are experiencing while they are in flight. So we use various methods of receiving uh, these notifications of accidents, serious incidents. Some of them come even from the public where they observe an aircraft that uh, is involved in a serious incident whereby the pilot is incapacitated, whereby we get a report that there's an aircraft we see alongside the road or next to the, uh, what you call, a residential area. Uh, call the CAA, look into that in terms of what happened. So we, we do receive this report from various sources, and we look into that, although some of them is a duplication, uh, but we do look into that to ensure that we get a maximum reporting of this serious incident. In terms of the second question, that why do we have these causal factors uh, repeating itself year in, year out? Uh, I think it's quite important that uh, there's a, a, a serious, serious approach that is required in terms of the mind shift, in terms of how we view uh, compliance with the regulations. Uh, I think it's important that, especially for the uh, uh, flying public or the flying crew, if I may put it that way, that compliance with the regulation is not to satisfy the regulator, but is to keep those that are on board safe and to keep those that are being on the ground safe because these aircraft, sometimes they, uh, they crash into the houses, they crash into the residential areas, uh, they crash in all sorts of terrains. As you can see, uh, Program Director, that on the presentation we, uh, we, we just presented, we did indicate that although loss of controls and all that, but the, when we further analyze, we see that the main contributor to these causal factors is disregard of the standard safe operating procedures. Having said that, it also calls on the review of the existing uh, regulations or this safe standard of operating to see that are they applicable so that they can dovetail in terms of what can be done to prevent uh, uh, the accident and to less burden the procedures or actions that need to be done by the crew whereby the crew end up not adhering to such requirement. Thank you. Um. If, if I could, Mr. Program Director, also add to that last question. Uh, the purpose of the General Aviation Safety Strategy is exactly to look at why people don't comply. What is the reason why there's a deviation from the standard operating procedures or the general air rules? Uh, so we're trying to get a, a, a feel for the underlying reasons and the criminogenesis or so other etiologies of accident causation. We're trying to drill down into what exactly makes the pilot or the flight engineer or the maintenance engineer do what they do or didn't do what they were supposed to do. So that is the reason why we have these various focus groups set up to drill down exactly into those underlying reasons. Is it a matter of regulation? Is it a matter of enforcement? Is it a matter of compliance? So all of these matters are forming the basis of the general aviation safety strategy. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, that, I believe that answers. What I take out from what you're saying is the importance of continuing to work together. Everybody needs to do something. And secondly, to continue to interrogate those uh, uh, causal factors to ensure that we come to the correct solutions. Now, another uh, comment here says, I believe the express requirement within the ATM operational concept calling for all aircraft, including UAVs, to be known to the system is critical. You can take that, or maybe it's going to go into Subash's panel, but uh, Neil, you can 
see if you or Mr. Mashaba, you can see if you want to talk to that. And then there's a follow up to the question asked earlier about uh, state owned airlines. It says, are all applications and renewals up to date? I'm not sure, Neil, if you are able to answer that on the spot. And then the last question is, uh, please contact uh, Neil. This is just a comment. Please contact the UAV working group under the ATM CNS implementation committee to prevent duplication. Maybe that also goes to, uh, if Neil, you don't want to talk to it, I'm sure Subash can talk to that. If you can just give me that and then you can do your final comments, gentlemen. Within the same airspace and in the same uh, operational environment, there's bound to be some conflict and that conflict needs to be managed and there's stringent processes and rules in place for that purpose. So what the RPAS focus group will be focusing on is basically how to prevent uh, serious incidents or accidents and how to prevent the uh, conflict of the same use of airspace. So that uh, focus group hasn't uh, kicked off fine. quite as yet uh, and definitely will be forming uh, further uh, basis for discussion. Uh, so keep, keep this space, uh, keep your eyes peeled. We will definitely be dealing with a number of those issues. Um, on the question on whether all applications are up to date for the various airlines is obviously not something I can respond to at this time. We will need a little bit more detail on what applications are being referred to and I'm sure uh, those can be addressed. Uh, thank you, thank you Mr. Uh, program Director. Yeah, uh, Program Director, just to add a, 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 just a two words to what Neil said. Yes, I think it's quite important to ensure that uh, these ARPAs are registered purely because uh, as they interfere uh, with aircraft operation, uh, we need to be able to locate uh, who is the owner of the drone uh, uh, that nearly caused uh, an incident. But not only for that, it's quite important to ensure that these drones can be traced who is the owner of that. And uh, I'll leave it at that, uh, Program Director. Thank you. as well as for uh, answering the questions that were presented to you. And I think some of the questions have already led us into the next discussion that we're going to have. Now we're going to have a panel discussion. The panel discussion will be facilitated by Mr. Subash Devkaran, who is the Manager of General Aviation Organizations. And the topic that uh, Mr. Devkaran and the panel that he will introduce shortly is leveraging technology to remain relevant post-COVID-19. Mr. Dev Karan, over to you, sir. Thank you, Program Director, and uh, much appreciated to bring in this very, very relevant and important topic, which I'm certain our viewers will enjoy, certainly I will. And that is indeed leveraging technology to remain relevant post-COVID-19 and I must say that personally, personally, uh, absolutely uh, enthused by CAA already looking at remaining relevant post-COVID-19 even though we're still in the midst of this pandemic and I think every successful business and every successful industry would need to look into this. So looking further into unpacking what remaining relevant actually means. We have two presenters. Uh, the first is Mr. Chris Berger from the CSIR, and he'll be talking to us about leveraging technology to remain relevant post COVID-19. So fellow aviators, uh, beloved South Africans, we now will look at this presentation uh, and I hand over to Mr. Chris Berger. <music> Hello, I'm Chris Berger. I'm a senior researcher with the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, uh, Science Council of the South African government. I focus mostly on information and communications technology, but I've also had a foot in the aviation industry for about 30 years. I fly 
various categories of aircraft and I was also intimately involved in policy development for several new technologies. I'm going to start with a wide view talking about aviation trends and then possibly a little about the influence of COVID-19. I'll talk about industry and individual challenges and then I'll talk about ways of addressing those challenges. I'll start with the aviation industry as a whole. This is a continuing development that has been going on for more than a century and continues to develop incredibly rapidly. One example of a, an issue that is really playing a major role in aviation right now is the env environmental impact of aviation. There's a program called Corsia. Uh, I think it's called Carbon Offset and Reduction System for International Aviation, if I'm not mistaken. And it's an initiative to reduce the carbon footprint of aviation. It's now coming into play and international operators are being required to report their usage of aviation fuel. In due course, it will lead to quotas and the reduction of emissions. AFGAS is a major issue in general aviation because AFGAS will eventually be discontinued because of its lead content. Biofuels are increasingly coming into use, uh, mainly fuels produced from plants that will replace uh, fossil fuel based alternatives. And then there's a lot of work going on in efficiency. The picture on the right is the X57 Maxwell, which is a an electrically powered aircraft, but as you can see, it has uh, about a dozen engines, most of which are involved in improving the airflow over the wing rather than actually propelling the aircraft. So there's a lot of work going on to reduce the environmental impact of aviation. Uh, unmanned aircraft are playing an increasing role. They have major advantages in terms of cost. Uh, they also improve payload on small aircraft specifically. There are also retarding factors and I would say that the most important single one is the lack of customer acceptance. How many of you would be prepared to get into a passenger aircraft that's piloted by a computer right now? The state of affairs is that we have regulations in South Africa. The industry seems to feel that the regulations are uh, unnecessarily strict and they report a lot of progress being hampered by that fact. The Civil Aviation Authority itself feels that it is simply exercising its uh, mandate to regulate the safety of operations. There are significant rollouts in Africa including the one pictured on the right on the lower right which is a medicine delivery system that's active in places like Rwanda and Ghana. I might just mention that most current unmanned aircraft are remotely piloted, but there's also an increasing move towards autonomous aircraft where no pilot will be involved at all. And that will definitely happen in the long term. Urban mobility is going to become an increasing issue. Uber is planning to run a taxi hailing service, an airborne service pictured on the upper right by 2023. That's two years from now. Supersonic transport is an issue that's going to have an influence in aviation. The Arian AS2 is expected to come into service in 2024, about three years from now. That particular aircraft is a supersonic business jet, but it's a matter of time before passenger aircraft follow suit. COVID has had a tremendous impact on the development of aviation. So against the background of fast evolving technology that I've already described, we have to understand that uh, aviation was extremely affected by COVID-19. This graph from IATA shows airline traffic as a function of uh, time. And you can see that there was a precipitous drop in 2020 caused by COVID-19. Their best estimates at uh, recovery are shown on this graph. The yellow area indicates quite a, a an amount of variability um, and it's expected that we will only return to 2019 levels by about 2023 or possibly as late as 2027. So the aviation industry is definitely in for a rougher ride than it would already have been with the uh, development of technology. 
as a direct result of the pandemic, many airlines have either gone out of business or retrenched or furloughed some of their staff. There's a lot more competition for available jobs. So with about 700 airline pilots unemployed in South Africa right now, every job that becomes available is subject to significant competition and uh, junior entry level pilots are in for a rough ride. There's also increased pressure for cost reduction, which may lead to uh, new ways of doing things that are less labor intensive. Post pandemic, uh, there could be a very slow recovery and there could in fact be a permanent change in travel habits. We already see that a lot of meetings are taking, online, uh, taking place online as you're experiencing right now. So it may even be that the uh, airline industry will not recover to pre-pandemic levels for, uh, for a very long time indeed. There are challenges to the individual that stem from the industry challenges. Firstly, the obsolescence of current skills. Um, old jobs will, will be reduced to some extent. Pilot jobs may be reduced. New jobs will be created. There will be a significant need for planning and oversight personnel that are not currently needed because of manned aircraft operations. And it's up to the individual to be able to make that transition. The, the individual needs to remain relevant, to develop skills that are relevant to a, a far more technological future, and needs to take account of the amount of development that can take place within an individual career. I was privileged to in, be involved in the retraining of some of the flight engineers that were made redundant by the change from the 747-300 to 400, when a flight engineer was no longer required. Um, some of the flight engineers made it, made the transition successfully and are now pilots uh, operating for various airlines, but some were actually unable to make the transition and ended up high and dry without significant prospects of employment. The solutions from an individual point of view obviously revolve around learning. One needs to learn new tricks and one needs to learn new approaches and new ways of approaching things. I would like to point out a distinction that exists between education and training. The term training refers to uh, the approach that's traditionally taken in the aviation environment. And it's not inappropriate because uh, if effectively most of the role players in the aviation industry require vocational training. Training develops some knowledge, but it also develops skills through repetitive exercise and through exposure to a lot of different scenarios. Um, this technique works successfully for pilots and for air traffic controllers and for ground personnel and for operational personnel. But a different approach is that of education, where you learn a, a wide base of theoretical knowledge and you then learn the ability to retrain yourself and that's extremely useful in a fast changing environment. Uh, the aviation environment has changed almost unrecognizably in the 118 years or so since the Wright brothers did their thing and during a single pilot's career things went from piston engined aeroplanes making four stops to Europe to non-stop flights all the way to the USA within the career of a single pilot. So it's necessary for every aviation person to be continuously learning. Remote learning has become a significant issue in the very recent past. And most universities and colleges are now experimenting to it with, uh, with it to some extent. There's a tremendous variety of online content available. In fact, I think one can learn the entire theoretical basis that one needs to function in aviation from YouTube for free. And some Ivy League universities also have free content available from which can, one can learn almost anything. Um, it's also possible to interact with mentors using things like Zoom and Teams, much like you are uh, doing right now in this conference, like we're all doing. So I think um, there are changes both to the industry and to the individual, but I think they're manageable and I think we have access to the technologies to make it happen. That concludes my presentation, but we will be 
answering questions in the panel discussion and I'd be delighted to entertain any queries. Was Mr. SIR, uh, Mr. Berger, thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, we look forward to unpacking a lot further uh, some details around these uh, emerging trends as well as leveraging technology. So just to everyone who's participating, please feel free to use the chat box to enter your questions and your comments for Mr. Berger and I'll be sure to, to pose them uh, to Mr. Berg as well as Mr. Keith Malejo. So next up, we do have a, a very exciting presentation. It's by Mr. Keith Malejo from the South African Civil Aviation Authority, and he'll be telling us uh, about some of the developments as it relates to ARPES, which is the, uh, I wouldn't say latest trend, but certainly one which is the most rapidly growing in recent years. So over to you, Mr. Malejo. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good day. First of all, thank you for making the time and joining us for this National Aviation Conference 2021. My name is Keith Malejo. I am a testing standards officer at the South African Civil Aviation Authority. I will be speaking on uh, leveraging technology to remain relevant post COVID-19. And um, my presentation will go a little something like this. I will be speaking on leveraging technology to remain relevant post COVID-19. And my presentation is a fairly short one. I will be looking at three parts of technology. That is the component that I've termed, um, a self-termed uh, uh, name of, of RPS or UAS or drones. And then I'll be moving over to infrastructure, uh, which is the UTM, unmanned traffic management. And then go into the bigger picture, which is the advanced air mobility or urban air mobility. And then I'll look at the effort required. Um, so the first part is about uh, our pairs, which is the components. As you can see in this picture, it's, um, our pairs, you can do quite a lot with our pairs, but you also have to think about the risk that are also entailed within the system itself um, and the good also. So with our pairs, we can stop fires, do my survey, do a bit of farming, deliver packages, and also help out in the health services. The numbers around our pairs uh, go to, goes to say that uh, um, the drone market is estimated to be 127 billion US dollars across a myriad of industries. And on, on a macroeconomic scale, um, it could create more than 100,000 jobs. And that is just on a macroeconomic scale. We haven't went into the finer details of it. Um, in the recent World Economic Forum Africa 2019 hosted in Cape Town, Timothy Ruta said um, he compared um, mobile, mobile phones uh, adoption to, to drones um, in a sense where he actually compared a phone moving from being analog to digital and how simpler systems became and how it was very easy for people in rural areas to actually communicate using cell phones. Um, and then went on to talk about innovations around phones, cell phones itself to be specific, mobile financing, pay as you go and so forth. He then, then compared this to drones uh, where he says, uh, drones actually could have the same effect. And uh, to that extent, I'll be talking about that the effects that uh, drones are bringing into the world. <clears throat> um, just in South Africa in 2018, the impact of, of drones onto our economy was 10.7 billion rands across all industries. And this was indirect and direct. And uh, from that, we got taxes of about 4.3 billion rands. And this is in 2018. Um, expect, uh, I have to credit uh, Dr. Rudolf Porter for that. Um, this was his work. Um, and, and then we, 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 we didn't need to start thinking about uh, 
what can we do further on if in 2018, these were the numbers that were predicted. Where can we use these drones? We can use these drones across uh, many industries and they're not limited to the ones uh, broadcasted or shared on the screen right now. Um, we can use them in border patrol sector, media sector, firefighting, um, in the health services sector, sexual rescue sector, and so forth. We can use these drones. So from there, how do we then create value from these drones? I, I, I then, uh, with, with the working group that I've worked with previously in my many um, uh, our pairs engagement, we created this value chain where we actually build up the value chain to create value out of drones. Uh, and it starts from design and development, goes to assembly and production, drone applications, piloting operations, and then maintenance and insurance. Design and development will be your, your, your academics, uh, your, your research, your innovators, where they actually start to design products, prototype, and come up with, with nice drones uh, for us to use. And then the assembly, uh, which is in the forefront of um, our economy uh, recovery from COVID-19, um, it would be manufacturing of these drones, software developers will then come in, assembly and testing of these systems. And then the applications that previously mentioned can use them in mining, health, military, logistics, and so forth. And then we'll then have to look at the human aspect of it, who will be flying these drones, it will be us humans. And we'll then have to get pilots to actually fly these drones, create operators. And this is just on a micro um, economic uh, base, not on a macroeconomic base. And then from there on, we'll move on to maintenance and insurance, uh, where we actually maintain and insure these drones for third party insurances and so forth. Um, and uh, at the base of everything, at the base of it all is the regulatory framework. So with that being said, you start to think how much money or how much of an impact can these drones um, impact our economy? Uh, and, and that is just a question to ponder upon. Moving on, where will all of these activities take place? <clears throat> Think about cars. When cars were designed, um, they were designed, and now we're moving on to be designing uh, smart cars and so forth. Sorry about that. We're talking about designing cars and, 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 and smart cars and so forth. And what they did with cars, they had to create roads yeah, and, and manufacture roads for these cars to actually operate on. Now think about drones. We're talking about creating all of, these, all of these wonderful drones and so forth, are we creating an infrastructure for them? And this is uh, where my next topic actually leads me to, the UTM. The UTM is the infrastructure. A UTM is no official um, definition in the ICAO um, uh, status uh, or, or definitions. Um, it is just used for convenience at the ICAO UTM framework where they actually um, define UTM as a specific aspect of air traffic management that is used to manage um, UAS operations safely, economically, and efficiently. So a UTM then goes to parallel with what we know as the ATM, air traffic management uh, system, which is a system that manages uh, air traffic for conventional or meant aircraft at present. A UTM would then come in to actually do the same, but for IPS and at a much lower level. And this is where UTM comes in. The UTM market uh, uh, has a compounded annual growth rate or is estimated to have a compounded annual growth rate of about 1 billion 960 million US dollars in by 2025. Gaps, issues, and challenges within the whole setup that, that brought uh, the UTM. So these gaps were literally taken from an ATM and then translated to a UTM. If we were then to look at a UTM, we'd then have to adjust to these gaps. Uh, for example, the interface between a UTM and an ATM, um, data recording, similarly that we get in an ATM. The issues would then be um, the, the system reliability and safety, a spectrum of reliability or thereof, uh, which is a very contagious um, 
topic at the moment, even network providers finding it hard um, with the spectrum allocation. And then the challenges would be detect and avoid, um, which is DAA capabilities uh, where we actually, um, we're literally using uh, the same technologies from manned aircraft to drones. And in manned aircraft, we'd call this an ACAS, but in drones, we'll call it a detect and avoid system. And a lot of work is being done um, at the, with the detect and avoid at an IKEA level, uh, IPS panel. Services we can get from UTM are as follows. We can get separation services, flight planning services, AIS, mapping services, and so forth as broadcasted on the screen. So a UTM system very chain, similar to an RPS very chain that I created in the previous uh, part, is that you'll have a drone coming into the country. Once it gets into the country, it gets to be uh, standardized according to standards such as SABS, CAA, and so forth, and other entities that are interested in the system. And once the, the standards are met, it gets to be registered on a mainframe. Uh, which sources to government and all interested parties, government departments such as your SAPs, your safety and security cluster, your CAAs, your DTIs, your Department of Justice, and so on. And then it, could, it would then go to suppliers, uh, your retail outlets, which will also have a registry system saying we're taking in 100 drones this month, we sold 50, and we've registered these are the people that wrote, uh, sorry, that bought the drones, uh, similar to a RECA system. And with that, we can then track them. Um, and then from there on, uh, people can go fly. The reason why you create such a value chain is that we want to create accountability at the end of the day, um, because remember of the risk that drones actually possess. Uh, one can simply say they evade one's privacy, they can fly over national key points, and we might not, not know who's flying it. So this system literally creates that accountability and curbs out all of that. <clears throat> And this is a much more expanded and explained uh, UTM value chain. It's still the same. From the manufacturer, we put in control measures, we register, goes to suppliers, and then you can fly safely. The last one that I get into is the bigger picture, which is advanced air mobility or urban air mobility. Uh, the terms are used interchangeably by um, the forefathers of, 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 of the whole uh, concept which is NASA. So think about it. Here you have your component, which is a drone that the little girl is pointing at and is flying very low in an airspace, that is your UTM. And everything is happening all around in, in this one single ecosystem, which is the bigger picture. And this is advanced air mobility. So for me, advanced air mobility is literally the culmination of everything. When you talk about advanced air mobility, I prefer advanced air mobility as opposed to urban air mobility, because I feel like urban air mobility is limiting the rural areas that we also have to consider. It, it literally ties in with what the president um, sees with his uh, smart cities uh, concept and so forth. So AAM is a culmination of everything. It's our pairs. We're talking about electric propelled uh, VTOL, which is a vertical takeoff. And vertical takeoff and landing, um, air taxis, green energy, drone deliveries, UTF manufacturing. Um, for, for a much lesser definition, I'd, I'd then just um, read from the National Business Aviation Association, which then describes the AAM as, as a, an ecosystem that consist of EV tools that are propelled with batteries or hybrid electric systems or potentially uh, hydrogen fuel cells uh, where we can actually order uh, food um, and then it gets delivered with this uh, beautiful drone. Um, if you think about it, uh, there's no way you can hop onto a 747 and fly from Midland to Cape Canton Park. But with the future, with AAM, you can literally hop onto this EV tool from Soweto to OR and you're at the airport with, with no traffic and so forth. But then remember, it must also be safe. And that's where the UTM comes in. And that is the whole concept of an AAM. So what sort of efforts are required for us to actually achieve this goal? Um, I always 
coined the three seats, um, collaboration, cooperation, and co-creating. Co-creating is very vital. If I, as the CAA, come up with the regulation, uh, and then CSIR must come up with the system, uh, um, the ANSPs must then provide the framework for UTM and so forth. That is literally co-creating this AAM. We have to find some sort of cooperation. We have to have cooperation out of certain agreements in between the departments and say that, that, that for me, that is cooperation. And collaboration will then us, will then be us working together and seeing this big uh, picture together, seeing one, 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 one picture together, one page together. And for me personally, that's what is required. So how do we then achieve that? We go through broader stakeholder uh, consultations, industry consultations, uh, then we draft up a strategy, implement, and then we monitor our, our implementation. And lastly, what then the CAA needs to do, we have to craft up lean and agile regulations that can adapt to any environment and situation, be COVID, be whatever promote aviation advancement, creation of dialogue platforms around such technologies, encourage innovation and technology management thereof. And then we'll get to what we're aiming for. And for me, ladies and gentlemen, that is it. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Mr. Malejo. That certainly was a very, very, very detailed and uh, informative presentation. So we are now joined by our two guests, uh, Mr. Chris Berger, uh, as well as Mr. Keith Malejo. Gentlemen, it's a pleasure for, uh, to have you both here. Uh, Mr. Malejo, I'd like to start with the first comment which we have from our floor, which is from Mr. Arthur Bradshaw. Okay. And the comment reads as follows, which is UTM, what you describe as urban traffic management, if I've got that correct. Unmanned. Unmanned traffic management. Yes, Thank you, Mr. Malejo. Mr. Bradshaw says <coughs> unmanned traffic management is not a parallel activity to ATM as it is a requirement that RPAs are incorporated into the ATM system. So this is a comment. But perhaps you'd like to elaborate a bit more on that. Uh, would you agree with such? Uh, thanks, Subash, first of all. To a certain extent, I would agree with uh, Mr. Bradshaw. Uh, but what my presentation then tried to do was to literally um, draw parallels between a UTM and an ATM. Because at the moment now, what then ICO is also doing, when we set up our standards and everything uh, for for aviation internationally is that we literally draw from, from what is already in the system. Um, I'll give you an example um, for detect and avoid. Uh, we're taking our, our lead or guidance from the already established uh, ACAS uh, uh, standards. So, so that's why then I then bring it back to ATM and UTM. We can, we can literally mirror the two and extract. Obviously the context would be different uh, because of, of the complexities and so forth. Thank you, Mr. Malejo. And uh, Mr. Berger, more than two decades at the CSIR as a researcher, I'm sure you've uh, covered a lot of research in this particular area. Uh, I'd like to ask you a little bit about automation of air traffic as well as flight management. Where are we heading, especially in regard to remaining relevant and leveraging this technology post COVID-19. So again, automation of air traffic and, and flight management. Where are things right now and where are we actually going with this? Automation is a trend in most industries and obviously the aviation industry is no exception. I'd say in flight management, automation contributes to perhaps three uh, three issues that need to be addressed. The first is workload. Uh, you will notice that the crew of airliners has gone from seven to six to five to four to three to two over the last 70 years or so. I don't think you need tea leaves or a crystal ball to predict that it's 
probably going to continue and maybe go to two, uh, to one and, and then maybe to zero. It'll take time, but it's certainly the trend. So for the moment, workload is certainly something that needs to be addressed. Flight accuracy or flight path accuracy is another issue that needs to be addressed and that facilitates increased density in traffic. And then also um, environmental issues, the reduced fuel consumption that's facilitated by optimal flight profiles that are perhaps too complex and precise to be hand flown. From the air traffic management point of view, increasingly we're moving towards uh, what's called RNP, required navigation performance, where traffic has to adhere to very precise flight paths, both laterally and vertically and, and also in time, temporarily. Um, and all of these degrees of accuracy contribute to being able to uh, get as close as possible to the minimum legal separation, which in turn facilitates uh, much better traffic flow and, and more density. And then even in maintenance, automation is playing a significant role. Um, the move is eventually towards maintaining a virtual copy of every component in every aircraft and subjecting that virtual component to simulation after every mission by, by retrieving a recording of the mission itself from the aircraft and then trying to predict when that particular component is due to fail. So the idea is to more or less subject a virtual copy of the component to the same wear and tear that the real copy is subjected to and then to try and predict when that component needs replacement or whether it can continue in service. So I would say those are three examples of automation, um, but electronic information systems have con constantly surprised us and I anticipate that applications that we haven't even <coughs> thought about are going to pop up as well. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Berger. So the next the next question I have is also from Mr. Arthur Bradshaw, and he asks, where is the industry at the moment in the development of sense and avo avoid? So I know this is a, a very key aspect in integrating ARPES into manned aviation. Uh, so for this reason, I'd ask you, Mr. Malero, if you can assist us with this. Mr. Bradshaw fur further adds that this is a major key for furthering the development and implementation of RPES activity. So where are we, Mr. Malejo, on sense and avoid? Where is the industry on this particular technical matter? Yeah, um, it's, it's Mr. Brecho is very right. It's a good question too, I must say. Um, so, so at IK level, we're talking about detect and avoid. It's essentially the same thing, sense of avoid and, and avoid. Um, the standards, are still underway. We're looking at the year 2024 uh, for them to be ready at IQ level. Um, at the CAA, nothing is stopping us from actually starting to to look into setting up regulations such as that. And um, Mr. Bertrand might not be privy to this, but the the RPES uh, representative, the industry representative, are uh, quite aware of the work that has been done behind closed doors. Um, we are actually putting uh, forward uh, regulation proposal, proposals which will actually talk uh, to sense and avoid. Um, obviously we can't say uh, this is a product that you, you, you must have on, on board an RPS or, or a UAS, but um, a regulation will then say look into equipment such as this and this is what we advise that you guys have. Thank you. Mr. Berger, would you like to add on to that? Yes, I would. I spent the better part of a decade beating my head against the brick wall pursuing a PhD in exactly that <laughs> topic. And um, there are some exciting developments. One of them is uh, something that's in an advanced stage of development uh, at the CSIR, which is called passive radar. And what it basically does is to use existing radio signals like television broadcast signals, cell phone signals and FM broadcasting. Uh, that reflects off various objects to form a comprehensive picture of everything that's in the air. And it appears feasible to build a complete air picture which can then be uplinked into uh, unmanned and manned aircraft to uh, create a complete situation awareness. Uh, it's still in the early stages and of course there are certification requirements around safety of life systems. 
that will have to be addressed, but I'm optimistic that there are approaches that will eventually lead to a comparable level of safety that we currently have uh, with pilots peering out of windshields. Fantastic. So there you have it, uh, a very appropriate answer to the question. And um, so one of the key questions we see a lot on, uh, on, on the internet, we see a lot on computers and on, on advertising, uh, and this is uh, RPS deliveries or drone deliveries as it's called. So gentlemen, please tell us, when will RPS deliveries be a reality in South Africa? I'll go first, all right. Um, so, so we're gonna have to build up some sort of context to your question and uh, perhaps bring in some history. Um, and excuse me mentioning a few companies that are actually in the forefront of this. Zipline uh, started in Rwanda in the year 2016, 2017 to actually start to deliver uh, blood uh, samples and so forth. Um, it then moved down to the year 2018 when Uber made a very bold statement saying by 2021 it will be ready. Um, it was so confident that they actually advertised uh, a vacancy for operation man, uh, manager for such. In 2019, UPS and Amazon started their trials. Uh, this was obviously propelled and supported by the FAA, uh, taking out a regulation saying any drone uh, that weighs 250 grams and above, uh, they would be required to have remote ID. In 2020, uh, Wing and Google then said they will be ready. Um, and then NASA then came back all together and said by 2028, they will have uh, what we call urban air mobility, advanced air mobility. Obviously, this then <coughs> incorporates your drone deliveries and air taxis. So, so what I'm basically trying to do with, with me giving some, some history to the question is that we need to understand that there were lots of uh, hands in, in building this, uh, meaning it was a conglomerated effort. Um, so, so in South Africa, what we then need to do is we need to start looking at collaborating, uh, as the DCA said uh, in a speech, um, not only in, at the CAA, but in South Africa per se. We need to start look at, looking at collaborating, uh, cooperating, and co-creating. Um, so once we have that in place and we have all the, the stakeholders involved, that is private and the government, uh, then we can start setting up strategies towards uh, us having uh, drone deliveries or, or advanced air, air mobility. Um, so once we have the strategy, then we can set up regulations that actually enable such behavior. Once we have these regulations, then we can start implementing our, our bigger picture. Once that is done, then we... If the <laughs> implementation is done, then we start to, to monitor the implementation and, and we, we, we continuously monitor for, for continuous improvement and so forth. So, so uh, my answer is neither here or there. There isn't, I can't put a time frame to it, unfortunately, but I'm just showing you how long it has taken all of these big companies and yet today there isn't an established um, uh, delivery service by drones. So, so there's quite a bit of work we need to do as South Africa, and I believe it can be done and achieved. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Maleo. What, what uh, I think is certainly appreciated is it is a very <coughs> complex, uh, complex area, and, and, and that comes out quite clear. Um, but what uh, is substantially uh, important is collaboration, as you've rightly mentioned, and yes. that is, uh, it's, it's so reassuring to, to note that you've used that term in taking the industry forward, and, and we sincerely thank you for that. So as much as RPS uh, is part of these new technologies uh, remaining relevant post-COVID-19, it's not the only specific technology. Um, we've also seen other adaptations, <coughs> Mr. Berger, um, such as learning now moving largely towards virtual learning. So Mr. Berger, I'd like to ask you on the subject of virtual learning. Is virtual learning effective in aviation? Aviation was in fact at the forefront of virtual learning in the form of simulation. So let me 
tackle your question in two sections. The first is the theoretical background that someone needs to function in aviation. And the second is in simulation for training uh, skills. In theory learning, I think there's been a, a significant acceleration towards virtual learning in the sense that most colleges and universities were suddenly forced about a year ago to learn some new tricks. And I think most of them have mastered that to a large extent. There are obvious issues around invigilation of examinations and that sort of thing. And also specifically, I would think kinesthetic learners, in other words, learners that are dependent on feeling, touching and feeling things, uh, are probably disadvantaged by virtual learning to some extent. But there's certainly a plethora of choices available in the form of online content. Uh, many of the Ivy League universities in the US, for example, are offering many of their courses completely free of charge. And the business model is that you can write an exam and get accreditation for that subject for which you pay, but you don't actually pay for doing the course. So nothing prevents someone from learning everything that an MIT student is learning. The second aspect is simulation and with the increasing transition to digital technologies, simulation has become extremely accessible. When I learned to do instrument flying uh, 40 years ago, we were using a thing called an ATC 610, which was a very crude analog computer and which had very rudimentary simulation capabilities and absolutely no visual capability. There was just a landscape pointed on, uh, painted on a screen with, you know, grassy fields and, and blue sky with some clouds. Um, but the actual simulation itself was not very realistic. Nevertheless, we managed to learn the procedures and the skills that we needed to fly without incurring the cost of of the aircraft and burning lots of fuel and, and indeed uh, ma minimizing risk. So simulation is a very powerful tool and the simulators that you can build nowadays by downloading something off the internet and buying a 150 rand joystick uh, is actually a, a, a leaps and bounds better than the simulation capability that I used to learn to fly. Um, the same is true in air traffic control. When I became an air traffic controller, we were uh, using a simulator that had a little white light running that on a black wall that simulated the movement of traffic. Nowadays, you actually get very realistic radar and tower simulators that even uh, simulate speech from the pilots, so you don't need a cohort of people to sit there and man the simulator. Um, and then from a maintenance point of view, I was intrigued the other day to see that one of the commercial international uh, training providers is now actually offering virtual reality training for mechanics. So the one I saw was a specific engine that I've flown extensively, a jet engine from Honeywell, and technicians were being trained with virtual reality glasses and they were standing there trying to get in behind this fuel pump um, just like you would on a real engine except that you have the capability to do that anytime, any place without actually running a risk of damaging a real engine. Mm -hmm. So I would say that uh, simulation is a very exciting and, and very capable addition to our existing uh, array of, of training techniques. And so I would say the future looks very, very bright from that point of view. As the demands on the uh, participant increase, um, so do the capabilities of, of simulating things and presenting them in a very realistic fashion. <coughs> and Mr. Malejo, so we've heard from, from Mr. Berger um, from a research perspective in exactly where things are on virtual learning and um, certainly the acceleration towards virtual learning. But back to the presentation which um, you presented a short while ago where you largely spoke about automation of air traffic and flight management and uh, and also the UTM and a lot about RPAs. In South Africa with RPAs being such a rapidly growing industry, are there opportunities for industry members uh, with regard to virtual learning? So are there virtual learning opportunities that, that do exist? with regard to RPAs as well as UTM 
and all of those aspects which you've discussed within your presentation. Uh, thank you, Subash. Um, in South Africa, as far as I know, there, there, there isn't anything like that. Um, but like I always say, where there's a will, there's always a way. Um, it can certainly be achieved um, if, if enough will is there and efforts are put into place. And yeah, that's, that's how, how far I can cap it. Thank you, Mr. Malia. Uh, wise words. Where there is a will, there is a way. Um, certainly, uh, words spoken time and time again. So we do have some comments uh, from Mr. Bradshaw. He agrees with you, uh, Mr. Berger, wholeheartedly. This is in regard to the sense and avoid question. And then a comment from Mr. Silandela, uh, which is the RPAS space is a key area in enhancing aviation activity. So um, maybe we'd like to touch on that a little bit. Uh, enhancing aviation activity. We've seen these rapid declines in aviation activity. There's perhaps a lot of joblessness. Uh, there's also a lot of businesses that seem to have been struggling. Uh, and then Mr. Silandela says, the RPA space is a key area in enhancing aviation activity. Yeah. Would you would you two gentlemen agree that for an existing uh, entity involved in manned aviation, that there does exist some opportunities to branching out into the RPS space? I'll start with you, Mr. Malejo. Um, most certainly. Um, so, so each and every business has a saturation point, and so will it be with any aviation entity uh, there will come a time where it gets saturated and we then need to start being innovative but we don't have to wait for that time um, i mean there, there's definitely business opportunities uh, within the rps uh, space uh, but an example that i can give you uh, is an ansp which is traditionally responsible for controlling meant or conventional um, aviation can then start to look at solutions that that they can actually apply into uh, managing uh, your RPS and so forth. So what I'm trying to say is that an, an ANSP can certainly go into looking at uh, UTMs and so forth, right? Um, uh, companies that actually do uh, your flight collaborations and, and so forth, um, the CAA itself uh, with our, our former uh, aircraft, uh, Charlie Alfa Romeo for collaboration and so forth, that can be achieved uh, with, with with drones, uh, certain those functions can actually be achieved with drones, and the the economic benefit to it uh, is is great. So anything a helicopter can do, a drone can do. Uh, we just have to be wise about it, and obviously we have to put certain controls in it before we then start implementing these things. So there is certainly um, uh, myriads of opportunities in the drone um, sector. Thanks. Oh, that's very. Uh enlightening to know uh, Mr. Ma uh, Malejo. Malejo and Mr. Berger tell us would you agree with that um, opportunities that exist for existing manned aviation operators branching into the ARPA space? I can answer that question in two ways the one is as a very frustrated helicopter pilot who finds it very difficult to find a seat in which to keep his skills current because a lot of what was done by helicopters in the past has been siphoned off into unmanned aircraft. So, uh, but I also think that unmanned aircraft will generate a huge amount of uh, additional activity which would not have been feasible by uh, manned aircraft. So I think there is going to be a lot more activity in future uh, with perhaps a decreased share belonging to manned aircraft, but on the other hand, uh, with a greatly expanded total scope, it may not really be that debilitating to manned aircraft. Uh, I can answer it in a completely different way, and that is that my research interest in aviation has been very much focused on unmanned aircraft that are not remotely piloted. For the moment, that option is not really uh, catered for in ICAO policy, but it's inevitable that it will be eventually uh, where uh, remote or, or rather unmanned aircraft will operate without human supervision. And something like an Airbus 380 already comes with the capability of doing a completely automated flight. 
So the time will come where you will step on board and, you know, maybe the robotic voice will say, ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. But uh, I don't know if consumers are quite ready for that yeah. yet. Well, along with that, we have a comment from Mr. Bradshaw, Mr. Berger. And he says, get the sense and avoid sorted out. Make sure we are known to the system and I'm happy to be the first to catch an unpiloted Uber <laughs> taxi. We also then, uh, moving forward, some comments from Facebook, uh, from Mr. Tony Tabang Sebopela. And Mr. Berg, I'd like to pose this to you. And that is, will there be opportunities for aircraft maintenance apprentices to do OJT as time goes on? We've heard from the minister this morning speaking about transformation efforts, the need for employment and uh, in, in the country. So Mr. Sebopela asks us, will there be opportunities for aircraft maintenance apprentices to do OJT as time goes on? We've spoken about virtual learning. Um, can you talk to us about that? I'm notoriously bad with buzzwords and I have no idea what OJT might be. On the job so training. I, hmm? On the job training. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, I don't anticipate that that will change. As I said in my presentation, the training model used in aviation is traditionally very vocational. So instead of providing a sound theoretical background and then relying on self-learning, the trend has always been to provide guided mentorship and on-the-job training is obviously a mechanism for that. And I think in South Africa there's been a strong trend towards on-the-job training even for graduates. Yeah. So I don't anticipate that uh, pattern changing. And if my theory is right that there will be significant more to uh, significantly more total activity in future than there is currently because of the new opportunities opened by unmanned aircraft, then presumably there will also be more maintenance activity and therefore also more opportunities for people to enter that arena. So I don't see it as a threat to someone who's sufficiently adaptable. I would say that someone who's going to adhere to, to the old ways that he was taught in 30 years ago is probably in real trouble. Mr. Malevo, would you like to add on? Yeah, certainly. Um, adding to what Mr. Berger said, I think um, like he's saying, there won't be any changes, but I feel like the changes will come in, in the functions of, of, a, of, a, of the trainer, uh, where they'll be providing more of a supervisory role or management role, uh, but the OJT will be there, but the, the, the functioning of it will be slightly different. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Malejo. And another comment from Mr. Katlejo Axian Sebate. The application of drones is actually across more industries than I thought. Very insightful. Absolutely, Mr. Sebate. Um, I'm sure the, the presenters would agree with you. Certainly. And another one. Back to AAM and UAM. <coughs> yeah. Uh, certainly a very uh, topical uh, technical area at this point. And this comes from Mr. Mitzi Andrew Morakile. The comment reads, AAM also makes more sense to me than UAM because I was first made aware of the professional application of RPES in RSA within the agricultural sector. So uh, Mr. Morakile saying AAM makes more sense than UAM. Would you agree? Certainly. And, and and I guess Mr. Morakile is just going on forward to actually echo my sentiment in my, in my presentation where I said uh, uh, AAM is more, is more valid because it cuts across a varied, uh, the, a varied spectrum. Uh, whereas I personally, I feel that urban air mobility is limited to the urban areas only, right? And we don't want that. We, we want uh, Ugogo who's sitting somewhere in, in Umbu to, to actually have access to, to this. So, so it, it's only right that we actually just say uh, advanced air mobility. Perfect. Well, gentlemen, we have time just for another two questions. Uh, I'll pose a question to each of you. And it's one just uh, in relation back to our title of this specific presentation. 
uh, both of your presentations, which is leveraging technology to remain relevant post-COVID-19. From your perspective, Mr. Malejo, what can South Africans do more of? South African aviators, what can they do more of at this time uh, to take advantage over this specific COVID pandemic so that when the pandemic ends, that they find themselves in a better position to sustain a business? What would you like to see happening? Sure. Uh, what a question. Uh, so, so what what are then advice that South Africans do um, to see us beyond the pandemic is is to 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 prepare themselves uh, and and we prepare ourselves in different ways. Uh, so so I'd say read up whatever topic interests you. Get ready. Um, be well prepared in it. Gain some insights um, and and be confident around that topic. Uh, it's something that I've been doing, that I've been practicing. Uh, I've actually taken a liking into gardening, and I can tell you different kinds of grasses. And that is what I've been doing uh, during this thing. So now I, I can have a, a conversation beyond uh, uh, my my own working space about about grass. So so um, initially. Uh, uh, well, going back to, to the question, uh, we, we have to uh, self-empower, uh, um, go for, for empowering of ourselves, and yeah, that's it. Self-empowerment. Thank yeah. you, Mr. Thanks. Malifo. And Mr. Berger, what, you've done significant research uh, over decades. What would you like to see South Africans doing more of uh, in, in leveraging technology to remain relevant. So as it relates to technology and South Africans wanting to survive, wanting to thrive, heading into the future, what, what, what can they do more of? I think adaptability is a key ingredient to surviving in such variable conditions. And for example, fairly recently I was involved in training towards a remote pilot license and I was intrigued to see several pilots, uh, some helicopter and some aeroplane pilots uh, sitting there trying to qualify themselves to extend their capabilities because they realized that some of the flying they've been doing is not financially sustainable in competition with unmanned aircraft and if you can't beat them, join them. So they have been learning unmanned aircraft capabilities. Now it's not necessarily a pleasant process because there are those of us who are saddled with a genetic predisposition to fly. I don't know if it's bird genes or something, but um, I get withdrawal symptoms if I don't fly fairly regularly, and I'm not sure that unmanned aircraft will fulfill that craving. <laughs> but nevertheless, from an economic point of view, I think that sort of adaptability is what's going to make the difference between uh, being left behind and flourishing. Perfect. Well, gentlemen, um, I think on behalf of everyone watching today's uh, conference, we'd like to thank you for your very insightful presentations and also your, your answers uh, to our audience today. With that being said, um, that brings us to the end of this particular session. I'll now hand over to our esteemed program director, Mr. Luvuyo Keke, and I thank you for participating. Thank you, Subash, and your panel. That was quite informative and insightful. We thank you for taking us into your world and understand where you are taking us to into the future. We're looking forward to the future you're painting. It looks bright indeed. I thank you for all of that, and thank you for addressing the bulk of the questions. Now, we are going to the next session. We're going to look at a case study by Mr. Kepi Gordon. Mr. Gordon is the Executive Manager and Chief Marketing Officer at Fly Air. The topic of his discussion is how to remain relevant in the face of change. I think that's something we all would like to listen to, how do we remain relevant. Mr. Gordon, over to you, sir. Thank you kindly. Um, yes, I, I, just before I start, I'd just like to say uh, to the Honourable Minister and Deputy Minister, uh, Chairperson and Director of the SACAA and all of my revered colleagues, um, all protocols observed and, and thank you very much for your opportunity today. Uh, I am going to take the opportunity here just to attempt at any rate to share a, um, a presentation that I have prepared. Um, so hopefully that is all going through. 
All right, so the, the case study that we have at hand was to chat about um, uh, the, the, the ability to remain relevant in the face of change. And I think one would be remiss at the moment to talk about change in any context without actually referencing the COVID-19 pandemic. And COVID-19 obviously brought the world a number of challenges, and we absolutely respect that um, you know many industries have been impacted so severely by this pandemic. Um, but And many of us will bear the scars of this for a very long time yet. Um, but that said, there are a few industries like ours who will bear very specific scars. Um, and there's a uniqueness there that we need to understand and appreciate. You know, unfortunately, aviation has been inextricably conflated with the spread of COVID-19. Um, and now there is some truth in this, but there's also a lot of sort of fuzzy misconceptions. So, I mean, let's think about the news that surrounded the first reported cases here in South Africa. We'll all remember that there was a, a gentleman from KwaZulu Natal who had returned from a trip to Italy. Um, that was referenced in the media anyway. And um, immediately many people made deep sort of subconscious links between this idea of danger and travel and COVID-19 and travel. Um, and so from there, this massive misconception, well, certainly in South Africa, but certainly, but very much on a global level, came that, you know, people can catch COVID on an aircraft and spread it on an aircraft and that aircraft are dangerous places to be um, and that they are ultimately responsible for the spread of 19. And while the truth is actually, I believe, a little bit different to that. And, and I've been pretty ardent about making this point wherever I can in talking to the media, etc. that um, there's something very key that we need to remember. And that's that, you know, in this particular instance, there's actually people that spread COVID-19, not aircraft. Uh, and yes, people can travel over long distances and can spread COVID or any other disease, um, bringing it from one place to another. And that's a very real risk in our world. Uh, but it is false to believe that people who board an aircraft will automatically get sick. You know, realistically, the man who caught COVID-19 in Italy probably did so on the streets of Rome or Florence or Naples. Um, and he may well have infected some people on his flight home because back then we didn't really know how to protect ourselves as we do now. But equally, he might not have infected anyone on that aircraft. Um, but perhaps rather he did people on the streets of Durban or Howick or Peter Maritzburg. Um, so key to remaining relevant during a time like this is to submit yourself to, uh, to trying to understand the dynamics at play within your market, to try and understand what consumers um, and colleagues are thinking. Um, and what's often tricky about these is that the perceptions that are out there can sometimes feel like an injustice. Um, and we seek to fight them with sort of too much emotion. But realistically, what we as business people need to do is, um, is to stop and to listen and to think and act with you know, appropriate strategy given these circumstances. And, and I just, I really love this, this, this quote around this idea of listening. It's, it's, you know, it was by Henry, Henry Winkler who said, assumptions are, are the termites of relationships. And I think, you know, what is, what is such a common failing amongst us as marketers, as, as business people, as, as parents or partners or friends is this idea of operating off of assumptions. Um, and of course, you know, the idea is that uh, assumptions can, can erode those relationships, but I also like to kind of believe that, you know, they, they have a valuable role in an ecosystem as well. So they're not sort of totally bad elements that we should, you know, fear on every level. We do obviously need to lean on assumptions when, um, when making certain business decisions, but I think the idea is not to let them, you know, rule us in that regard. Um, and the idea is that, you know, when facing the, the kind of turbulence we have over the last year, the act of listening and of watching and observing has been absolutely key in this process. Um, and so often we're so close to what's going on in our world that it's sometimes hard to see the wood for the trees. Uh, we might be quick to think that we understand what's concerning people um, and what they worry about, but we're maybe not always hitting the nail directly on the head. Um, and similarly, this is quite real as we were learning about COVID-19 because people were not always necessarily most worried about the things that they perhaps should have been worried about. Um, and it was always important for us to understand the difference. So, so in that kind of, you know, vein of strategy and communication, I think there's that famous saying that there are always three sides to a story. There's, there, there's your side to the story, there's my side to the story, and then there's the truth. Um, and that's actually probably quite appropriate here. Yeah. Because the reality is that we live in a world of fast paced news and we talk about it all the time, but information really does fly at us constantly and from all directions. And unfortunately, the old days where there were perhaps a handful of authoritative news sources are behind us. And now anyone with a cell phone is a news source. And while we should know better, too many of us too often trust information from completely random sources. And, you know, mis misinformation is arguably one of the biggest threats to our generation. But, you know, before I go down a, a rabbit hole on that, on that point, I think the key point that I want to make here about consumers comes back to that idea of, you know, your side of the story, my side of the story, and the truth. Um, and sometimes those are completely different stories, but sometimes they, they can tend to overlap a little bit. Um, but very seldom are they exactly the same thing. 
And the idea is that, you know, when we looked at how things unfolded under the COVID-19 uh, kind of pandemic, we, we probably need to give these things different names. So instead of your story, perhaps we can talk about, um, you know, your concerns or consumer concerns. And these are things that the consumers were obviously most worried about. And in terms of communication strategy to drive consumer confidence, these are probably the most important points to hit. And a key factor about these concerns, which we'll look at quickly as, as shortly, is, is how quickly they can change, um, and even sometimes quite radically. Um, and then perhaps instead of my story, let's talk about our concerns, which which really has two parts to it. I mean, the first element here is our concerns for our own people, you know, speaking specifically in the context of an airline operating in that environment. Um, it's the people who work for the company. Um, and often we tend to also take on our own personal concerns on board that we make assumptions again around what consumers are worrying about um, and, and without really knowing the sort of true order of things. And that can obviously be quite a big mistake. Um, so, so that's perhaps one of the little areas that can be a bit dangerous that we need to to look out for. And then, and then lastly, of course, I'm going to keep the truth the truth, which I think is is valid. And I think uh, here what we need to talk about are the actual real concerns that people should have. And I mean, hindsight's always twenty twenty. Um, so perhaps through the journey, we weren't always aware of what those real concerns should have been. Um, but the idea is that they do emerge over time. The sort of real elements, as more research is done, as better understanding is achieved around. Um, around things like this pandemic. And, and ultimately, they can be the best indication of, of where things are going. And so the idea is that that becomes a, a view toward the history so that we get to a closer point. And, and I mean, it's fine and good and well to talk about all of these things in theory, but I actually wanted to share something quite practical when it came to addressing communication and keeping these things um, quite relevant. Um, and the idea was that we that we, you know, constantly did small little bits of research into our market to try and understand what was actually happening. Um, now, this, this this sort of research was actually provided to us very kindly by our colleagues over at IATA. Um, and it was wonderful because it allowed us as Africa to get some foresight into what was happening in foreign markets and what foreign markets had been worried about as they embarked upon their pandemic journey. And they use the term journey quite specifically because it was a journey in many ways, a sort of journey of discovery as we walked through the realities of science and of our government's policy responses and of the impact of applying the sort of required measurements into our actual environments. Um, and while we find the, uh, the IATA research to be hugely valuable in, in our communication strategy, what we also respected is that it was a global view rather than necessarily a South African one. And so we wanted to ensure that we had the right answers here in South Africa. And so using those IATA concerns that they had put forward um, and a few of our own, we actually went into the market on several different occasions to ask our consumers what their biggest concerns were regarding traveling by aircraft during the pandemic. And the chart here shows the results from those snapshots. So the first uh, bit of research was done in the beginning of April 2020 during the lockdown. Um, and that's represented on these bars as the lightest shade of pink toward the bottom of each area. Um, and then midway through April, we did another one, which is the middle pink. And finally, midway through May, a month later, was the darkest pink. And by that point, we, we'd moved into phase four, into, into level four. So what we can see here is how these concerns changed and shifted over time. Um, and, you know, what, what, what some of this can be due to the work that we had done to obviously educate our consumers, but much of it was also just due to changes um, in concerns as time shifted and as we learned new things along the way. So, so for, interesting, for, for example, one of the things that's so interesting is when one looks at mask wearing um, as one of those points. You know, there was a stage in the beginning where we were advised by the WHO that masks weren't necessary and that all of those, de that only really those who were dealing with the ill should wear them. Um, and we were advised to avoid a run on medical masks to ensure that there were enough for all of the frontline work is out there. But as time kind of progressed, the importance of masks changed. And while people in Asian countries had been wearing them for years, a new wave of awareness sparked when people started to make cloth masks. And several viral videos and posts preempted what would ultimately then become the law. Um, and goodness knows, if we look at the at the biggest headlines surrounding COVID-19 in the press at the moment, and certainly COVID-19 and airlines, um, the idea of mask non-compliance is one of the biggest themes, which is an indication that it is also one of the biggest consumer concerns. Um, but that wasn't always the case. You know, if you look at, at the mask question, you can see that masks were initially one of the lowest concerns that people had in the beginning, um, and that they were most worried about temperature screening or more worried about temperature screening. Um, but what's also interesting is how perhaps the social distancing as a concern was expressed um, in, in, in this space. And, and here we express that in terms of keeping middle seats empty. And at first, this was not as big as an issue as, say, how, you know, aircraft were disinfected. But as time went on, it became a bigger worry um, and one that we had to counter with, with messaging around that air quality control. Again, an area where we found, you know, IATA to be incredibly helpful in terms of explaining that along with our colleagues at the various 
um, you know, aircraft manufacturing plants. I know, you know, we operate for Boeing and Kraft, and they were they were particularly useful on that point as well. And um, and and air quality in and of itself was also something quite interesting to to view because um, I think it. it it's the only one that actually uh, started out as a concern and then dropped and then, you know, it kind of became more into focus a little bit later and, 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 and went up again. Um, and I think that's because it was always an old worry that had been there, perhaps a lot of sort of urban legend around um, around the idea of air, air quality within an aircraft. Um, but then, you know, we did a lot of work on that. And so it was interesting to see how um, how that then changed and became a point of interest and, and consumers started to ask different questions about it. And you know, just to kind of really go back into that idea about how those perceptions can be so different, you know, even the story of HEPA filters, and here's the minister, um, you know, when he was doing an introduction around and showing the press and the media a HEPA filter outside of an aircraft at OR Tambo, um, you know, to follow that story is an interesting one, because in our industry, you know, we know that many modern aircraft have been fitted with these filters for years now, and that effectively very little needed to change insofar as they were concerned. Um, and I've not actually done any specific research on this, but it would be interesting to know what the public perception is around the fitment of these filters. You know, do consumers believe that they are a new measure that was installed to combat COVID-19, something that may have been before the pandemic? Or do consumers understand that most aircraft have these filters and that they're still wondering whether or not the airline that they choose is actually equipped with them? You know, do, do you have HEPA filters, as a question, was something that wasn't uncommon in our call center at one stage. Um, and it's just understanding these little nuances that can make such a big difference in terms of hitting the right notes in your messaging. And, and while, of course, you know, getting all of that right in terms of your messaging is absolutely key, uh, the reality is that there's very little value to that unless you're prepared to make the investment and actually spread your message. And, and that's a really tough thing to do because the reality is that COVID-19, especially during the lockdown phase, was possibly the toughest time to motivate for any kind of marketing or communications budget. Um, but the importance of owning messaging during this time, not just as a specific brand, but as an industry, um, was something that you know, could never have been underestimated. Um, you know, certainly from an airline perspective, usually we we tend to place our focus on getting those bums into seats. So, you know, changing tack like this could be quite intimidating, but the investment into the future is obviously so important. Um, and one major thing to consider was uh, was naturally the types of media to use, because, again, this is another idea of maintaining relevance and adapting as time goes on. Um, and we saw that media consumption habits changed quite extensively during lockdown. Um, and so things like billboards, which we have pictured here, you know, those were only really useful once people actually started to to be able to move around again. Um, you know, which are in times of lockdown, there was obviously very little vehicle traffic on roads. And so that wasn't such a major uh, platform with which to communicate with people. But fortunately, um, what we did see is platforms like social media explode more than before. And what was great about that is that they actually offer a relatively inexpensive way to put your message far and wide. So there was a lot of work that had to be done in understanding those nuances and maintaining relevance in those spaces. But I think above and beyond all of that, what's so absolutely key was this notion of, of just doing the right thing. Um, because outward messaging is important, but but more than this, you know, one stays relevant by by ensuring that you do the right thing. And when I say do the right thing, I mean that on a number of levels. You know, firstly, it's obviously very imper it's imperative to to take actual safety measures very seriously. Um, naturally, there are mandated procedures in place, which are more than adequate. But rather than just approaching this as a, as a box ticking exercise, it was important to approach the requirements, bearing in mind the spirit of the intention and not just the letter of the law. Um, there were loads of opportunities to consider processes and implement measures that were cost effective and that went above and beyond the requirements. Um, and these measures that we're talking about, uh, you know, are illustrated to consumers and are illustrated to staff and they show that the company's approach is a sincere one um, and one where they really do care about the welfare of all involved. Um, and it's also important, of course, to do the right thing by customers from a commercial perspective. And, uh, and this is an incredibly touchy subject. I think anyone that's um, you know worked in any kind of commercial element of aviation, which we all have really, um, during this period, we've all, we've all had these kinds of tough commercial discussions. Um, and it's, and it's hard to talk about, but it's it's one of those things that comes down a little bit to, you know, my version, your version, and the truth again. And, and I mean, perhaps one that was most relevant to us is I can talk about the idea of refunds and, and how that was such a major topic in the in the airline space, especially during lockdown. You know, the, the idea is that many consumers felt that they were due full cash refunds, which is a completely understandable perspective. Um, while others were content with receiving vouchers. Um, and realistically, there were as many ways to find the middle ground on that topic as there were airlines facing that decision. 
but what was important here, though, was to choose a policy that was a fair balance between protecting the interests of the consumer and the business at hand in fair measure. And to explain what that decision was honestly and openly to consumers. And, and that explaining is really key because communication was and remains a huge challenge. And specifically in times like this and under circumstances like this, you have an anxious, frenzied consumer who's not always willing and receptive to a message. Um, and a swarm of such consumers hitting a call center or some social media platforms can quickly boil over into a disaster. So the key here is to be comprehensive and calm and responding and communicate, even if the actual answer was not yet clear. You know, honesty was absolutely key. So there might have been a time where we would have a consumer that would have phoned and say, I want my money back. And perhaps we hadn't even actually decided on a particular policy at that stage um, because this is 2021 and responses are so fast and social media is what it is. Um, and so the ability to have something to say, like, you know, or, or to have the confidence to say, well, I'm not sure yet what will happen, sir, but, you know, please understand that we will implement a fair policy and that that policy will be communicated to you. Um, you know, through XYZ channels at XYZ time um, is far more meaningful and important and is far more doing the right thing than just not saying anything to a consumer at all. Um, and we are judged by, you know, our actions in the past. So that that is key too. And perhaps lastly, you, you know, while sort of discussing relevance, I think we spend tend to put so much focus on the idea of managing customers and customer messaging. Um, and trying to get them to come back to flying and to come back to flying with obviously you know your particular brand but there's another thing that we really need to consider in maintaining relevance and that is obviously maintaining and managing your team you know and here again the reality of listening to their concerns and really understanding their thinking is key um, so often sitting in head offices or sitting around these virtual boardroom tables uh, you know, we can sometimes remove us from the actual concerns of our own staff and our own teams. Um, and again, there are assumptions that we can make that um, about, you know, what they do and don't understand or what they do, what they are or are not concerned about. And again, you know, those assumptions can can be quite dangerous. Um, so, for example, you know, a question we might ask is, are our crew up to speed on the realities of cabin air circulation and how it protects them and passengers? It's, it's a technical topic. It might not be something that they're necessarily all that aware of. So, so having your teams, um, and especially your customer-facing teams, obviously, up to speed on all the knowledge is definitely key uh, to remaining, you know, as relevant as you possibly can and making sure that they have comfort in their own work environment and, of course, can then ultimately share that, um, you know, with your customers as, as time goes on. So there's a really, really quick uh, brief over, you know, snapshot of, of, of that particular challenge in that particular circumstance. Um, I think I've probably pretty much exhausted my time at this stage, and I know it's the end of the day, so I'm sure that things are, are people are, are, are quite anxious to get on with their lives, but I, I do thank the organizers for a fantastic lineup. Um, and I hope that I've offered you a quick overview on this approach. It's, it's a huge topic, and there's so much that we can talk about. There's loads that we can go on in terms of IT previous speakers were talking about various different innovations um, in the face of these challenges and and hopefully though that the principles that i've discussed from a, a slightly different perspective um, can give you a sense of, of what our approach was to this challenge um, and and you know how we one might engage similar similar challenges going forward um, so i thank you very much for your time and for your attention um, and i wish all of our colleagues here the best as we work together to rebuild this wonderful industry of ours Thank you, Mr. Gordon. That was very interesting indeed. In these times of change, I think we need to remember the ideas and concepts you put through. I think I've got one question for you. It says people resist change, fear change, avoid change, and but solid efforts by SAF Air. However, 100% effort by one and 10% by another does not help. Is that a common problem we face every day? How do you make it last ultimately? Is that really talks to to the key element of of you know managing under these circumstances? Is that it really is about people and it's about human human relations? And you know if you can find that ten percent within the organization you know you know and i'm speaking here specifically around individuals i mean those are such key individuals to you to help to understand what it is that's making people tick 
Um, and it's hard. I think, you know, understanding the bigger context and, and constantly talking, constantly keeping communications opening um, and facing very new and very different managerial challenges, not just communications challenges. I think looking after teams and looking after staff, you know, we've, we've, we've as leaders have, have expressed a whole lot of new challenges and have undergone a whole lot of new challenges that we probably haven't faced before. Um, and it's about casting the net wider and, and perhaps even having conversations about things that we've not spoken about before. But, you know, at the end of the day, I think one of the big reassurances that we've had is that this is not happening to one individual, which is where we can very quickly go. It's not happening to just one company. It's not happening to just one industry. It's not happening to just one country. This is a global phenomenon that has been happening across the board. And so the only real way for us to survive this and to move forward and to and to grow from it and to learn from it is to act collectively. Um, and sometimes that means leaning on the one in nine. Um, and sometimes that one in nine changes depending on the circumstances. Um, so that's that's definitely a very insightful uh, comment and question as to I think the realities that we faced. Thank you, sir. Last the one question. Last... I think it's more of a comment, but you would like to comment to that. Uh, it says the average mental well-being of not only crew but the industry as a whole. Not is it not relevant? Follow in following change as well, even from a marketing angle as well. So should we only restrict it to crew or to the industry as a whole? No, I think we need to look at the industry as a whole. I mean, obviously, there, it's fair to speak about crew. I think that's important, um, especially because of the incredibly pivotal role that they play in safety. Um, but as as our colleagues at the SACAA will, will quickly point out, you know, safety is not just something that we can push into one particular department, specifically in our industry. It is something that is pervasive, that is across every discipline and every element of, of what's going on. So it's important that we're all on board. And yes, I think mental health and mental well-being are absolutely key and are things to address um, both through marketing communications and I think showing support in that in that regard for our teams and for our staff can make a big difference um, as to is it important to do that from a sort of leadership and managerial perspective you know I think um, and I speak about this, this this often I was sitting on one of our aircraft the other day and and um, there was a gentleman who was who was sitting behind me and he was I mean, to be honest, I think he was trying to impress the two ladies that he was sitting next to. So he was he was making the odd joke and kind of going on as, as we do from time to time. Um, and, and he was sort of, you know, responding to to comments that our that our cabin attendants w were making in their announcements, you know. And so they would say something about enjoy our hospitality and he would breath or you know what hospitality you're not even going to give me a drink or whatever the case is and you know ultimately what 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 i sort of realized from that moment was uh, you know there was an opportunity to engage him and to say you know let's let's walk a mile in someone else's moccasins here and understand that you know the we, we we're here representing those cabin attendants and like so many people they're going home today with very real concerns around their own economic state um, you know, they might be on reduced salaries. They might have spouses or family members that are also on reduced you know, salaries. They might be worrying under very normal things about how to pay the bills at the end of the day. Um, and I can assure you that they would like nothing more than to hand you a beer and to smile and to and to for things to be going on as as normal. Um, and and I can also assure you that they didn't wake up this morning with you know the excitement to go and chat to folks about you know please keep your mask over your nose and mouth all day i mean there were certainly many other things that they want to do and so you know encouraging consumers to 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 sort of see things from many angles and i think encouraging colleagues and and um and all of those around us to just bear some level of empathy to to what is happening is absolutely key. And I think standing up as an organization and, and making comments like that and drawing light and drawing um, emphasis, if we can do that from a communications and from a marketing perspective, on the realities that your teams are facing goes a long way on behalf of the organization to show that you actually care and that these things are important. And so, so that would be my, my advice on, on that matter. I, I think it is key. Thank you, sir. We so much thank you for sharing those insights as well as wisdom with us this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got just one more speech to do, so if you bear with us a little. little. When we started this morning, I expected to be schooled, I expected to be informed, I expected to be motivated. And for me, that has happened. I hope it has happened for you too. 
I hope you've enjoyed the day with us and we look forward to meeting you again, probably on an aeroplane or at an airport. But now for the closing remarks, as well as the vote of thanks, I'm going to invite the South African Civil Aviation Chairperson of the Board to do the concluding, concluding remarks. Over to you, Mr. <coughs> Kosase. To our very able program director, Luvuyo, the Honor Honorable Minister of Transport, Mr. Fikile Mbalula, and all protocols observed. Since we started a conference program this morning, we reflected on the destruction that the COVID-19 pandemic left in its wake and the battle to overcome the epidemic and to reignite the aviation industry. However, today's proceedings soon confirm that the global and local air travel has not and will not come to an end. Air travel will continue and although we have to make room for the effects of the pandemic and to get even more innovative in growing the aviation industry, aviation will take off again. Aviation safety and security remain an important, as important as ever and for the sake of the future growth of the industry, we cannot afford to become complacent. The deliberations today have proven yet again that there is a collective effort required in moving the aviation industry forward. Collaboration has been heralded as one of the key ingredients that contributed to the industry being at the level it is today. It has been very encouraging to note the passion and commitment displayed by the esteemed panelists and speakers as well as the determination to succeed at all costs. As our proceedings draw to a close, allow me to thank every distinguished speaker, including the Honorable Minister, and all the specialist speakers for availing themselves and sharing their expertise with us. The reigniting of the aviation industry is too important to be left to chance. Indeed, we need to share all our insights and experiences to assist one another in the recovery of the civil aviation industry. Some key takeaways from today include the following. A need to embrace technology as an important lever in moving aviation into the future. A focus on customer service that ensures value in the products and services offered throughout the aviation value chain. A need to di diversify our offerings to ensure sustainability. A need to build public confidence in aviation as a whole. A focus was given to matters of aviation security and entrenching this culture with all airport and airline users. We received good news from the health expert as we got confirmation of the admirable way in which South Africa is managing COVID-19. This message was accompanied by a warning for us to ensure that we continue to manage the spread of this virus, especially if our intention is to make aviation thrive. We are reminded of the importance of aviation safety and security, even during an event of international concern. A civil aviation that is unsafe and insecure is even more deadly in the face of COVID-19. A look at the accident statistics were perfectly balanced with the interventions that the regulator and the industry are undertaking to curb these accidents. What is exciting about the interventions is that they are multidisciplinary and take a collaborative approach. This gives us confidence that the directive from the Ministry of reducing aircraft accidents by 50% in the next five years is indeed achievable. The panel on leveraging technology opened our eyes to the many benefits brought about by this innovation in the aviation space, as well as its spillover uh, effect on other industries. Advancements in technology implies that a new skill set to match the fourth industrial revolution workplace ecosystem is indeed imperative. The aviation industry is therefore called upon to heed this call. 
In conclusion, I would like to thank every delegate and every aviation stakeholder represented for attending the conference. Your involvement is reason for the conference. Allow me to thank the conveners and administrators of this conference. As always, your hard work has paid off. That being said, until we meet again to deliberate and confer, please keep safe and keep up the good work towards restarting the air transport sector. I thank you. Thank you so much.